Okay, good morning everyone. It's 9.30 and time for me to open um, this session of the Places for Everyone Joint Development Plan Document Examination Hearing. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Good, thank you. Um, I'm sure by now you all know me, but I'm Stephen Lee, one of the inspectors appointed by the Secretary of State to examine the plan, along with Louise Gibbons and William Fieldhouse. Um, just a few basic housekeeping matters. A uh, reminder, please, for everyone to switch mobile phones off, laptops and other devices to silent mode or to, or to silent mode. Uh, water is provided and will be replenished during adjournments. Um, we've asked that um, please don't bring in hot food or drink into the, into the session. There's plenty of uh, scope for that outside uh, during adjournments. Um, I've not been informed of any fire alarms today, so if the fire alarm does sound, then please leave um, or vacate the building in orderly fashion following the green emergency exit signs, which are to the rear of this room and to my right. Uh, Helen, our program officer, one of our program officers is here today and if you have any queries or questions or issues you wish to raise about procedures then uh, Helen should be the first port of call. Um, today uh, just a reminder uh, that the purpose of the examination is to help us decide if the plan is submitted in February 2022 is legally compliant and sound and if not how it could be modified to ensure that it is. Uh, this session like the others will take the form of a structured discussion of the matters set out on the agenda that was published last week. And today we're dealing with um, allocation JPA 28, which is north of Earlham Station, and JPA 29, Port Salford Extension. Has everybody been before? There's some people have not been before. Okay, I'll just run through how it how it'll work then. Um, so I will start each agenda item with some questions to the GMCA team. And when we've heard the responses to those, I invite contributions from others. Uh, when you wish to speak, turn your nameplate on its end and I'll bring you in at an appropriate time. And when I invite you to speak, please say you are and if appropriate, who you represent. Uh, please focus your comments on our questions or specific points made by others. And I'd, I'd like to ask if each contribution should normally be no longer than a minute or two to ensure they're focused and to allow everyone a chance to speak if they wish to on a particular issue. Um, my reminder that often falls on deaf ears, but my reminder is that there's no need to simply uh, repeat or summarize what you wrote in your representations or your written statements, they, they're before us and we've, we've considered those. Um, there's also no need to repeat or reiterate the contributions of others around the table or tell me if you agree with them or anything else. Obviously a point made once is a good point, it doesn't get any better by uh, repetition. Normally, we'll give the GMCA um, the opportunity to sum up their position at the end of each item on the agenda before moving on. Um, but my approach is generally to make, obviously, I want to make sure everybody in the room has a chance to say what they want to say um, before we close. Just uh, again, another reminder, we're discussing, while we're discussing the details of the sites today, this doesn't mean that we've made up our minds about the allocations set out in our guidance action point notes that, they, um, that come out periodically after sessions. Our ultimate conclusions on whether each of the allocations and plans justified will depend on our consideration of a range of matters, including those related to the amount of development needed, uh, the spatial strategy, impact implications of Greenbelt, as well as some site-specific issues. Therefore, even if we, uh, we, where we act, issue action points about the sites after sessions, we may de decide in due course that other or different main modifications are required to those that we set out. So Mr. Zay, um, adjournments, um, I think today could be quite a busy day. Um, so I do want to keep things moving at a pace and we'll probably have an adjournment um, for comfort break at around 11 o'clock, uh, try and break for lunch at around one, and then uh, adjournment, uh, comfort break around 3.30 um, with the hope of finishing around five um, if we can. Uh, before I go around the room asking for introductions, there's a couple of matters arising, housekeeping points from me. Um, for those who were not here yesterday, uh, through the programme officer, we asked GMCA to provide us with maps, or a map, illustrating the location of the sites we'll be discussing yesterday and today, um, illustrating where they are in relation to peat deposits. Um, this is this map. Um, hopefully, it's GMCA uh, 59. 59. Um, Hopefully everyone's had a chance to see those, but if not, Helen will be able to provide copies. Um, but I think in essence, it only, it only shows what we probably knew from the evidence anyway. So I don't think it necessarily changes any, any discussion, but it's useful to, useful to see it in context. 
Um, secondly, um, today again we have Barbara Keeley MP who can join us uh, just for the, for the morning here and um, or just for the sort of first part of the day. Um, it wishes to make a statement to the examination about the sites we're discussing today. Um, I'll, I'll uh, invite uh, that statement once I've done introductions. Um, thirdly, yesterday we received a statement of common ground between I think uh, Salford Council GMCA and the site promoter for Port Salford Extension. Um, this relates to the issue of viability um, and that's been published on the web examination website um, either yesterday or, or today. Um, again, if, if, uh, that, if people haven't seen that, it's not particularly long and it's on the website, well, Helen can provide a copy and obviously you can look at that uh, adjournment. And so in, in essence, I think I'm right in saying it doesn't say anything particularly different to what is in um, representations made by Peel. Um, to the to the examination, so it's it's, it's confirming confirming that I suppose really. It's GMCA sixty, by the way. GMCA sixty, thank you. And yeah. Wonder what we'll get to by the end. <laughs> I don't know. Do we get a prize if we get to a hundred? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, and then fourthly, from me, um, people may be aware um, from the letter we published as OED twenty three. Um, that we invited Natural England to this to attend this session uh, and the session in a couple of weeks' time, and they have uh, declined that invitation. And we uh, sent us a letter explaining why, and we published that um, on Monday, and that uh, explains why they don't much wish to attend. But also, I think, effectively reiterates um, some of the comments they've made elsewhere um, broadly. So um, they're not the only people, obviously, to talk about Pete, and we'll be talking about Pete today. Um, I think I mentioned this yesterday, but just for, again, for completeness, what I intend to do, I think, is pick it up as a general point under North of Earlham, on the site selection matters, if you like, because it's a general thing. But as we'll be talking about generalities, I might invite comments from people who are only interested in Port Salford, so we don't have to have the same discussion um, again. So if we're talking about national policy, for example, that kind of thing. No, fair enough. So I wanted to seek some guidance on, on the point in any event. I mean, I, I understand that. That's, that's perfectly sensible, if I may say, to make the overarching points once rather than twice, if you like, today. Yeah. Obviously, there are differences in terms of detail between the two sides, yeah. which we'll have to pick up. If, if I ask you a question about or ask a question about national policy, there's yes. no point saying that twice, but if we obviously there's site-specific issues, then we'll, we'll drill down to that. And of course, in subsequent sessions, we may have the same discussion about national policy, because there'll be different people in the room. Of course. No, that's fine. Um, the, the point of guidance, I just want, while, while we're on the subject, if, if you don't mind, um, I just, obviously we've built up a sort of fairly standard way of dealing with the various sites, the various allocations. Um, this is the first site where we've had to specifically, where well, JPA 28, forgive me, is the first site where we specifically need to grapple with the issue of peat. Um, and I wondered, it seemed to me, to be, to be frank, to be frank, to be sort of sensible, to either go through all the points in the normal way and then have a bespoke discussion about Pete, or do it the other way around and have a bespoke discussion about Pete and then go through everything in the normal way. But what I think what would be very confusing if we, is if we just lump Pete in as one of the things on, you know, in the midst of talking about all sorts of other stuff. Um, I think we'd actually really will spoil the discussion if we do it that way. So I think we need to have a separate sort of item for Pete, either at the beginning or at the <coughs> end or somewhere where it doesn't get muddled up with, you know, yeah. we're in the midst of talking about, I don't know, um, traffic or... Yes, I don't want to do it. I don't want to necessarily... I mean, obviously, there are development requirements relating to Pete. Yes. Um, which are specific to the yes. site. It's, it is, I mean, you know, where you do this could be under many headings. Um, I also, I, I did contemplate mm. starting the day by just talking about by talking about Pete as a separate entity, sure, sure. and then thought, well, actually, the danger there is we start getting site specifics, and then that muddies the discussion later yes. on. So um, I think my preference mm. is to pick. It, you know, we'll go through start North of Earlham as normal, yes, and then when we, and do site and then yes. albeit and then because Pete is a site selection issue, yeah. potentially pick it up there, but reflect on the fact that there might be some generalities. Okay. All yeah. right. We'll say, as long as there's a specific place I'm not, I don't want to go through, I'm not going to go sort of hmm. through the, you know, 20 odd criteria and say, all right, we've reached the peach criteria, let's talk about the whole issue. It, exactly. Um, yeah. I want to put it in the context of site selection. All right. Um, 
That's fine, sir. But I, I, all I'm, my only plea is that we, everyone says, including us, obviously, whatever we want to say about Pete, in a, in a particular place. Yes, I think that's why, that's why I, 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 will, I will ask. You know. As I say, well, I think as far as we can, we'll deal with mm. a little bit like yesterday. Obviously, we, we talked about mm. certain things in the morning session about one site, which clearly then applied. Yes, to the, oh, no, to that's the, fine. Um, we'll yes. do it that way. And if it, if it works, it works. And All right, well, let's, let's, let's see how it goes. Give I mean, it a there's, there's, give there's it a many, many ways to skin this cat. <laughs> well, that's a pun which I'm not very keen on myself, sir. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right, any other uh, housekeeping matters or anything for that, that from your side? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on then to um, asking for introductions in the normal way. I'll start with GMCA and move around. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I'm Chris Katkowski, KC for the GMCA. Uh, morning, everyone. James Shuttleworth, Salford City Council and GMCA. Good morning. Uh, Matt Doherty, Salford City Council on behalf of the GMCA. Good morning. Fiona Fryer, Salford City Council on behalf of GMCA. Jackie Copley, CPRE. Pete Abel, Manchester Friends of the Earth. James Ness on behalf of Action Against Rural Development. Francis Henry, Action Against Rural Development. David Dunlop, Senior Conservation Officer for Policy and Advocacy at the Wildlife Trust for Lancashire, Manchester and North Merseyside. Good morning, um, Martin Walker, also Lancashire Wildlife Trust. Uh, Gareth Salthouse, Wayne Holmes and Persimmon Holmes. Good morning, Andrew Bickerdyke from Turley, representing Peel Investments North in respect of uh, site JPA 29. Good morning, Christopher Young, King's Council, representing Peel. Thank you. And so Barbara Keeley is <coughs> joining us um, online. Um, obviously, for those who are here, particularly um, for, for JPA, uh, 29 Port Salford Extension. You content with what I've just said about Pete and joining into that discussion as and when necessary? Yes, I, I, I'd be honest, I wasn't entirely clear what the conclusion was. Uh, Sorry, about right. what we're doing. the conclusion is <coughs> we've got to pick it up anyway. Yes. I'm going to pick it up in the context of Port, uh, North of Earlham and then obviously, but if we're talking about generalities of national policy in relation to that, then clearly you. you Invite you, you know, you're, you're entitled, you know, you're, I'll allow you to, uh, to come okay. in on that discussion. So, so we don't have it twice, basically. Okay, we're going to have a, a discussion on Pete during Earlham and then a discussion on Pete during Port Salford. We'll, we'll have a discussion on Pete during North Earlham, which will cover hopefully everything, both gen general and you. site specific. And then in, 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 the hope would be that we wouldn't need the general. Yeah, I, 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 I completely agree. I mean, I think if I can pick up the you know, um, the mantle of my learned friend. If you, if you deal with everything but Pete uh, in terms of Earlham, and then we deal with Pete, we'll know that we're not intruding on other people's territory when you talk about Pete perhaps before lunch. And then I agree entirely, we won't have to repeat the exercise yeah. afterwards. That's, that's what I'm trying to do, is just, just ensure we don't have the same exercise twice. Yeah. Well, so, so we'll have to see how it goes. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, with that, I will um, invite Barbara Keeley MP to um, make your statement. Obviously, yesterday you made quite a lot of uh, general comments um, about um, issues relating to Salford and Greenbelt and so on. Um, obviously, you don't need to make those again. Um, obviously, if you, if you can focus on the issues related to the two sites we're discussing today, that would be helpful. Um, so, but with that, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm Barbara Keeley MP for Worsley Neckles South, and I have represented this part of the constituency since 2010. Today, we're focusing on the land north of Earlham Station and the Port Salford Extension, which are JPA 28 and 29. My objections to the proposed developments in part correspond with concerns I raised yesterday, for example, on increased traffic and air pollution and the additional strain that will be placed on schools, GP practices and other public services. And I will set out those concerns again, but as they relate to Earlham and Caddishead. But I would like to begin with environmental risks that are particularly acute in these two sites. 
JPA 28 allows the removal of 66.5 hectares of existing greenbelt, which is moss land and peatland. The site is located on the edge of Chat Moss. It is located within the Great Manchester Wetlands Nature Improvement Area, which aims to instore, restore a nature recovery network of wildlife sites and corridors, which will allow wetland species to survive and thrive in the face of increasing environmental pressures, such as climate change. It's also located within the Carbon Landscape HLF Landscape Partnership area. JPA 29 would allow the removal of 124.2 hectares of existing greenbelt comprising mosslands and farmland. Port Salford's expansion would increase the existing industrial areas down Barton Moss to the east of the M62 and onto the moss land. The entire site is within the Great Manchester Wetlands Nature Improvement Area, and apart from a small strip alongside the A57, the site is also within the Carbon Landscape HLF Landscape Partnership Area. Both sites are areas which are recognised as supporting a range of biodiversity, both in their own right and as part of a wider wetland area. There have been recent modifications to the plans for JPA 28 and 29 relating to environmental impacts. The changes suggest a provision for compensatory improvements to the environmental quality and accessibility of remaining greenbelt within and or in the vicinity of the site. I feel it's impossible to see what improvements could compensate for irreparable damage to the peat and moss land if these allocations are allowed. Additionally, a provision which would have required a pro project specific habitats regulation assessment for the area has been removed. I would like to hear the justification for the removal of this provision, given the importance of understanding the impact of any increases in pollution on the local environment, which is so precious in the area north of Earlham Station and in Caddishead. This land holds significant depths of peat. Natural England has stated that development on JPA 28 is proposed on 30 hectares of deep peat, while JPA 29 is proposed on 102 hectares of deep peat. Peatlands are vital to global efforts to combat climate change as well as wider sustainable development goals. In 2019, the GMCA declared a climate emergency and identified that urgent action is needed to put Greater Manchester on a path to carbon neutrality by 2038. Developing on peatland is directly counter to this goal. The UN Environment Programme says, peatlands are one of the greatest allies and potentially one of the quickest wins in the fight against climate change. By conserving and restoring peatlands globally, we can reduce emissions and revive an essential ecosystem that provides many services, including their role as a natural carbon sink. Peatlands also provide a range of other valuable benefits, including biodiversity rich ecosystems, improved water quality and natural flood management. This peatland must be protected, not developed, so that the wetlands can continue to soak up carbon, helping our fight against climate change, we should not be allowing pockets of this land to be lost for development. I was concerned to read that the hydrological assessment which had been proposed to avoid any adverse impacts on the hydrology of Chatmos has been removed from the latest plan for JPA 28. The plans for JPA 28 and 29 both state that development will be required to minimise the loss of the carbon storage function of the peat and avoid any adverse impacts on the hydrology of the surrounding areas of peat and moss land, whilst ensuring that there is no potential for future problems of land stability or subsidence. This sounds to me like nonsense. Peatlands are unique. Once they are lost, they cannot be recovered. The way to minimise the loss of the carbon storage function of the peat is to leave it as it is in the green belt. Peat acts as a carbon sink and I believe its value has been ignored in the production of this plan. This allocation from the green belt is a triple whammy. Carbon stored in the peat will be released and carbon will be produced both during the development and in future from the area and there are real concerns that this will have a very detrimental effect on Greater Manchester's carbon neutral targets. Developing on peat will not only prevent future restoration of peatlands, but will cause irreversible damage to the body of peat directly under the developed land and the wider peat mass, which depends on the continuity of the flow of water. Natural England has said that the degradation of the peat mass will result in significant greenhouse gas emissions. I understand that habitats which lie on deep peat can fall within the definition of the Habitats Directive Annex 1 Priority Habitat, degraded raised bogs still capable of natural regeneration. 
Now, planning authorities have a duty to have regard to conserving such areas under Section 40 of the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act 2006. Destruction of peatland does not align with priorities set out in local, regional and national plans. It does not align with the strategic priorities within the Places for Everyone document, including policies on a net enhancement of biodiversity and geodiversity, policy JPJ9, lowland wetlands and mosslands, policy JPG4, carbon and energy, policy JPS2. Further, developing on JPA 28 and 29 does not align with local planning policies set out in the adopted local plan. The Salford Local Plan Development Managed Policies and Designations sets out that any development on mosslands must lead to another equivalent area of lowland raised bog habitat being restored elsewhere in the mosslands. If that is not feasible, then there must be efforts to secure major conservation benefits for the mosslands. The plan also says that any development within or near to Chap Moss shall ensure that the capacity of the hydrology of the area to support bog restoration is not adversely affected. The Salford Local Plan also recognises the importance of protecting, managing, where appropriate, supporting the provision of restoration of habitats that provide a carbon storage function, such as the lowland raised bog in Chat Moss. Nationally, the England Peat Action Plan 2021 sets out ambitions of managing, restoring and maintaining the hydrological condition of all peatlands responsibly. With no adequate plan for protecting vital peat and mosslands, removing these sites from the green belt runs counter to many of the strategic objectives of the Places for Everyone plan. For example, Strategic Objective 7 sets out the aim that districts are carbon neutral, while Strategic Objective 8 sets out the aim to improve the quality of our natural environment. I believe that this land should instead be used in a sustainable way. I believe that it would be more productive and efficient to use this land as agricultural land, given the need for locally sourced food. The Greenbelt land in Earlham and Caddishead is Grade 1 agricultural land, the best and most vert versatile land, and is the land which is the most flexible, productive and efficient in response to inputs and which can best deliver food and non-food crops for future generations. So this is excellent quality land on which a range of agricultural and horticultural crops can be grown with high yields and less variability than on land of lower quality. In addition to its agricultural importance, Chat Moss is a valuable area of open countryside for many people living in surrounding urban towns. The moss land has great potential for informal recreation for people living in Salford. Chat Moss is also a unique habitat for many species of wildlife and is important for nature conservation, in particular for bird life. The loss of this land would also set a worrying precedent. Although the Places for Everyone document states that remaining areas of moss land would be protected and preserved, local people are sceptical of that claim. We cannot risk these ecosystems being lost forever. There are also concerns, strong concerns in Worsley Nickel South that further development on JPA 28 and JPA 29 will make current levels of traffic congestion much worse and this will have an impact on air quality and health. 800 houses in the land north of Earlham Station would mean 1,600 or more cars on the roads in Earlham and Caddishead. I do not believe that the access points to and from the proposed development are suitable for the number of vehicles that would be added to the roads. The road infrastructure in Earlham and Caddishead relies on one road, the A57, which is overstretched and already congested at peak hours. Congestion is particularly bad on match days at the AJ Bell Stadium when traffic can stretch all the way back to the M60 motorway, which has its own congestion problems, which I detailed yesterday. I have specific concerns about the building work for development of JPA 28 because this would surround St Teresa's RC Primary School and Earlham and Caddishead College, causing more air and noise pollution for children and young people at school. The minor roads used by the construction lorries may not be able to withstand the HGVs and diggers for such a large scale building project, which clearly will take years to complete. Astley Road, Cromwell Road and McDonnell Road will all be used by construction vehicles and this could cause further congestion and disruption to local residents and cause damage to the surface of the roads. Now this must be seen too in the context of the expansion at JPA 29 in Port Salford, which is one mile away on the same single road that leads in and out of Earlham and Caddishead, the A57. The HGVs and construction vehicles and then of course later transit vehicles would add a great strain to the local road network there. 
I did highlight yesterday that even before these proposed developments, Salford ranks dangerously high on levels of air pollution, according to the World Health Organization. Salford has higher levels of mortality attributable to air pollution than the average for England, along with much higher levels of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which can be caused and exacerbated by pollution. There are few solutions which have been put forward to try to tackle even the current congestion and poor air quality, and none that have been tried have been effective. So I do not hold out any hope of the fulfilment of the vague aspiration in the plan to mitigate the environmental impacts of development, including noise. <coughs> Given the severity of the problems we currently face with air pollution exceedances and the potential impact this could have on the health of local residents, it does not seem sensible to bring forward proposals to add to the volume of traffic congestion and to threaten the future of our green spaces. In their current form, these proposals would clearly run counter the, to the strategic objectives I've quoted, and they would be detrimental to the health of my constituents. The current proposals for JPA 29 also include unacceptably weak assurances that works to this site would not be commenced until the rail link and other highway improvements have been completed and are operational. The updated plans include proposals to make provision for new and improved sustainable transport and highways infrastructure. Now that's a much watered down version of the detailed specification set out in the 2016 draft GSMF, which said the JPA 29 site will still generate significant traffic, it will be necessary to provide a new motorway junction and link road for this to, accom to be accommodated. This went on to specify that the development of this site was not to be commenced until at least 75% of the proposed floor space on the existing Port Salford site had been completed. The following infrastructure has been completed and is operational. One, the rail link from Manchester Liverpool line into the existing Port Salford site. Two, the new wharves on the Manchester Ship Canal within the existing Port Salford site. Three, a new junction on the M62 to the northeast of Earlham. And four, a link road between the new M62 junction and the A57. But the revised Places for Everyone document does not include this specification. Instead, it says that this site should not be commenced until the rail link, highway improvements, canal berths and container terminal associated with the permitted Port Salford scheme uh, south of the A57 have been completed and are operational and there is a clear commitment to the ongoing maintenance and full operation of this transport infrastructure. Now local residents are sceptical about these assurances and I share that scepticism in terms of my own checking with Salford City Council officers and I, I haven't seen the modifications which uh, uh, you mentioned uh, so, uh, as being released overnight. I understand there is no committed funding for the rail link and no operator identified to run it. It would be the responsibility of Peel Holdings to identify the funding, and I've heard a timescale of five years or more for that. And there are similar concerns relating to the canal berths and the container terminal. And there is no funding committed or firm plan for the highway improvements needed. Whenever, as a Member of Parliament, I get a chance to discuss highway matters, um, this is an issue that crops up. It's over a decade since the modelling was originally done for the new slip roads onto the M60 to make sure that heavy goods traffic from Port Salford does not swamp local roads. This out-of-date modelling put the cost of these highway improvements at £150 million. I understand that no such sum of money is being committed by the government, and I understand it would also require a 20% contribution from the local authority or the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. I understand there is no commitment to fund this 20% sum, which amounts to, amount, uh, amounts to around £30 million. I have heard these improvements described as being a monster you cannot fund. The lack of detailed plans or committed funding for any part of this transport infrastructure to serve developments at Port Salford is a major flaw in the plans for JPA 29 and a major reason for my objecting to this proposal. Across both sites, there are suggestions being, read, being made around maximising links to existing public transport services, supporting new routes and enhanced services as appropriate. But these are poorly considered suggestions given the current public transport service level being provided to residents of Caddishead and Earlham. The proposals for the development of JPA 28 rely too much on the service levels of local trains. And I want to focus in on that because it's, it's actually slightly different to what I discussed yesterday in terms of Walkden. I received many complaints about the train services at Earlham Station. 
Constituents describe the service as appalling and a daily nightmare. Train services at Earlham are overcrowded and services are frequently cancelled. For example, on one day, five consecutive services from Manchester to Earlham were cancelled during peak hours, which left only one service running. On another day, a third of all services from Earlham to Manchester were cancelled. My constituents have told me that services do not have enough carriages, which leads to unsafe travel conditions as the trains are dangerously overcrowded. My constituents describe days when hundreds of people who couldn't fit onto the train then wait hours for the next running train. In December 2022, the train service from Earlham was halved by Transpanning Express. Just one cancellation now means a two hour wait rather than one hour. While before there were three trains leaving between 7.30 and 8.30, now there is just one. I do not believe that this is an acceptable service for people uh, in Earlham Caddishead now, and it's certainly not reasonable to claim, as the places for everyone uh, plan does, that Earlham train station provides easy access to a huge range of employment and leisure opportunities. It emphatically does not. The service is a slow stopping service and has an awful reputation for being erratic and overcrowded. And it's hardly a viable option for over a thousand new residents to use this train service to commute to work. Without viable public transport, these developments will lead to a significant increase in both congestion and the number of cars on the roads. I want to turn very briefly to the issue of demand for local services and amenities. There are currently no adequate proposals to mitigate the impact of this influx of new residents into Earlham and Caddishead when it comes to needing schools, health services and other local facilities. And this runs counter to Strategic Objective 7, which sets out the aim that districts become more resilient. Building on JPA 28 and 29 would not make Worsley and Eccles South more resilient. It would place strain on public services which are already struggling. Constituents tell me they're finding it difficult to get their children into schools and registered with doctors. When it comes to getting a GP appointment, people are waiting for as long as six weeks. The wait for a dentist appointment is far longer. As it stands, Places for Everyone fails to consider the impact that such sizeable developments could have on local health services and other local public services. It appears that little or no analysis has been done on the impact of these developments on local health services and infrastructure. I want to return finally to the environmental impact of these developments. I said yesterday that Greenbelt land is precious in Salford as it provides the green lungs for our urban city. It's vital that our green spaces are preserved in a city that has high levels of air pollution, low levels of physical activity and poor health outcomes. Green spaces do have many benefits, including for health, well-being, recreation and the environment. And I do want to emphasize the point about um, physical inactivity. This accounts for an increasing proportion of deaths and disability across Salford, and green spaces are crucial for countering that. Nowhere is the issue of not building on Greenbelt land more critical than the peatlands of JPA 28 and 29. This is grade one agricultural land which should be used as such, not built on. Natural England and DEFRA state that peatlands are unique and need to be protected. Once lost, they cannot be recovered. And as I said earlier, releasing the carbon stored in the peat will be very detrimental to Greater Manchester's carbon neutral targets. We should not be contemplating the loss of a large slice of the Greenbelt land, which acts as the lungs of the city of Salford, when we have in Salford some of the worst air quality in the northwest and high death rates from respiratory illnesses like COPD. And we should not be contemplating building on our precious peat land and moss lands, when doing so would release carbon and damage the fight against climate change. We should instead be protecting our moss lands as an asset for future generations with their vital grade one agricultural land. So I urge the inspectors to reject the proposals which would see us lose these precious areas of Greenbelt land in Worsley and Eccles South. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, obviously, um, appreciate the, the comments and that was quite a detailed run through of the concerns that you have and I think echo a lot of the concerns that people have in the room. Um, I'll perhaps ask people when, when they're contemplating what they need to say later if, if some of these things have already been raised or if we can add, you know, expand on what's been said rather than sort of just reiterate what's been said. So thank you for that uh, very useful start to the, to the day. Um, I think uh, as yesterday, you're content presumably to pick up these issues as we go through them. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. So we'll, then we'll start then, we'll move on to JPA 28, um, north of Earlham. 
And I'll say, I think we'll attempt to, to deal with it in the normal way until we get to site selection. So uh, we start with the um, green belt um, harm, as the GMC have assessed it. Um, I think the assessment concludes that parts of Earlham and Caddy's Head have already merged to an extent. So um, forgive me. Oh, for sorry, if you want you. to. Sorry, if you want to. You does want that, to start. Does that mean that I'm not doing my overview? No, sir? I'm. <laughs> I'm write these notes with a view to doing my own, and then I forget that. Uh, That's it's, all right. It's your stage. Go, go ahead. Oh, well, I wish it was. Sir. <laughs> Plan would have been adopted a year ago. Um, right. Let's let's crack on with uh, JPA 28 North of Erdham. Um So, so just by way of an overview, and I'm going to put Pete to one side, not because I want to ignore it, but because we're going to have that separate discussion somewhere on the line in relation to it. So um, this is a site that meets our site selection criteria number one, uh, because it is I mean, next door to Earlham Station, um, three trains an hour to Manchester, uh, just over 20 minutes, some of them are 16 minutes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also uh, it's near to a local centre, and near to um, bus services, there are various bus stops, as you can see on your site uh, visit plan. Um, so it's a very sustainably located site and certainly meets our first criteria and criteria number one for site selection. Um, it provides an opportunity to deliver houses. Uh, this is a Salford case, as you know, and uh, we, as we explained yesterday, there's a particular uh, need uh, for houses as opposed to um, superabundance of apartments. Uh, this is a point we touched on yesterday. Uh, it's also in a part of the city, Salford is a city, it's in a part of the city where new housing provision is has been uh, historically low. So in the Earlham and Caddishead area over the last 10 years there's been a net addition of 338 dwellings, 338 dwellings. As you know the allocation is for 800. We see the site as uh, sitting well with our um, principle in our spatial strategy, Strat 6, of boosting the competitiveness of the northern areas, a uh, significant contribution to affordable housing as well. Now, on the negative side of the equation, in terms of the harm to the green belt, our own study work has um, cat categorised the degree of harm here as moderate as has already been mentioned, and obviously something which can't be mitigated, loss of agricultural land, the site is grade one agricultural land, um, so that obviously needs to go into the weighing scales on the negative side of the equation. Uh, I'm going to leave aside peat, but I will just enter it here as a, as a heading, as a negative. We will have a bespoke discussion about peat in due course. Um, otherwise, impacts such as traffic, um, biodiversity and so on, we consider can be satisfactorily mitigated. Um, so in overall terms, in the planning balance, we consider there to be exceptional circumstances here in the greater public interest for the allocation of the site for the reasons I've very briefly outlined. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, sorry for jumping the gun. Um, okay, so we'll now move on to going through the agenda and GB, uh, Greenbelt, of course. harm and purposes. Um, I say the you've, over conclusion was it would cause moderate level of harm. Um, I think that's, <laughs> I understand why and understand the, uh, what you said. I mean, is there, I've got no particular additional point on that. I think we'll come back to that if anybody raises it. Um, do you want to talk about the boundary? Um, so I'll move on to that. I'll move. On, I'll do all the green belt and then come uh, let open it. So on to the boundaries. Um, the boundary to the south is obviously the railway line. It would seem. I think is that right. Um, That's right. So sort of the eastern, as it as it hooks round, um, is that playing fields uh, to the sort of east. eastern boundary. Yeah, so and the then the housing, school and housing. There's a school, residentials, and school. So it follows the boundary of of, of that. Uh, and the then the western boundary is the urban area, basically. Yeah, and then the western boundary is the um, Moss Road. Yes. and the existing in the housing and farmstead and activities that Indeed. are there. Uh, the northern boundary is the one that I think has drawn a little bit of concern um, 
from from respondents about mm. you know, the, the, the part of it, I've, I've been obviously part of the boundary because it goes through a sort of field where there's no field boundary. Then some of it follows the line of the nursery, and mm. then I think it follows a, a, a sort of a, a field boundary to, as it goes along that's right. eastwards. Yeah, it yeah. Does, so yes. the concern being right, obviously, sure. whether that is sufficiently defensible with a view to encroachment further north and. Yeah. Yes, I mean it would need to be made, it would need to be, the boundary would need to be strengthened there to ensure that it was a defensible boundary. I mean this is one, this is an allocation which uh, has reduced in, considerably reduced in size over the progress of, well what was the GMSF now places for everyone, um, and so in reducing the amount of land take from the green belt, um, although we've ended up with three strong enough boundaries, so to speak, to the east, south and west, um, to the north in part, and some might say more than in part, um, there's certainly been a need to strengthen the boundary, but that's, this is one of those cases where otherwise, you know, one would keep going and keep going and keep going and one would be, as far as we're concerned, needlessly taking green belt until you reach the next strong boundary existing strong boundary so you know we've had this conversation before but just for the sake of the, for the benefit of those I use benefit I suppose advisably of those who haven't heard this conversation before um, although the framework is clear that one should find strong defensible boundaries when one's revising green belt boundaries um, we consider that some pragmatism should be uh, introduced in certain cases and this is one of them where um, the consequence of following the logic of that approach would be that one would take swathes of green belt land out for no purpose other than to get to the nearest road or whatever it might be. Um, so this is one of those. Thank you. Um, and does the policy actually require that? Or is that, is that I was just going to check gonna, that. Not at the moment. Not at the moment. I, did want, I, I couldn't couldn't recall whether it was yes. one of your suggested additions. Yes. So it may well, when we get on to the I think when we do. I mean, I, as I understand it, the council considers the boundaries is, is is good enough, if you like. But to be frank, it would be it would be sensible to have to have the what's now become a pretty standard criterion in in a number of these allocations where you know one should have an eye to strengthening a boundary. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, um, was all I've got to say at the moment on boundaries, um, I'm sure others will have something they want to say. Um, compensatory improvements point, I think again we've generally been picking it up now under the development requirements, there's the new uh, clause that's been added to most, or suggested to be, I keep having to be clear, these are suggestions um, to be added to the, to the policy, so we'll pick that up then. Um, and then Thank in this you. case there's, again, we've got an area um, of land outside the allocation, which would be uh, released from the green belt as well, um, and that's generally to the. I think that's again probably related to the sort of east and southeast of the site. Yes. Um, is this the normal sort of argument that it would leave the an island, island of green yep. belt? That's right. It's it's the the land in question, which is to the south and to the east. Well, southeast and to the east of the area that would be allocated for development. Um, would be stranded pockets of green belt that, as far as we're concerned, wouldn't perform any any green belt function, if you like. Um, so that's you know that's the logic. Is is much of that the, the, the inset part, if you like, to the east where the school is? That mostly the school and playing fields. Is that at all? Yeah, to the yeah. Um, to the, sort of, the large area to the east is the school. And there's a, a smaller area. And the smaller area to the east is that um, that looks to be some residential development it's, it's there. A, it, yeah. So there's a little residential, so it, it neither would perform. A, it was that purpose. washed over? Is that just some land behind those houses? It's hard to tell from the side, is it not? Um, I think it, it's linked to it, isn't it? Land behind, but it's okay. all part of the same. Thank you. Just to understand the context. Okay, thank you. Uh, in a moment. Uh, yeah, um, you can get you. you uh, Yes, I understand. Yes, I understood that. Yes, I, I, I asked whether it was school playing field and school. Yes. Um, so the landing, it's 
overall at some 7.7 .7 hectares, this, this additional non-allocated for development land to be removed from the green belt. That's, that's the logic of it anyway. It's the island's yes, point. So. Okay. And, there's a, and there's a yet further bit? Go on. Just the, 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 the final section to the west is just a row of, a row of houses. Oh, sorry, there is. On, yes, on, yes, on, yes. On, yeah. Yeah. So there are three, right. three areas in question. One, one to the east, one to the southeast, and one to the, to the west along Moss Road. Okay. As I think the GMCA position on Greenbelt is fairly clear, so as you've obviously done your assessments, you've set out what you're, you consider the harm to be, you've set out where you consider the benefits to be, and we understand that we'll take all that away. Indeed. Um, Indeed. I will then open it up on, um, on Greenbelt Matters, um, starting with CPRE. Thank you, yes. <clears throat> Greenbelt um, designation has served a very useful purpose up until this point. Um, it stopped a number of speculative applications in the area. Um, in the Greenbelt assessment, it talks about a strong um, role in checking unrestricted sprawl, which we agree with. It talks about a moderate role in preventing merging with neighbouring towns. Uh, Glazebrook is in the Warrington area, so we agree with that. But in terms of safeguarding the countryside from encroachment, I think we disagree with the mod moderate assessment because actually th we think it uh, performs more strongly than that. So overall, we would say there's a, a high level of harm, not moderate. And we do think because of the boundary not being defensible to the northern part of the site, if allowed for allocation, it would have impacts on the parcel to the north um, with developers likely to having aspirations and uh, a weakening of the green belt purpose so we think it could lead to future problems if there was an allocation thank you and obviously the discussion we've just had about you know potentially whether there's any change to the policy that would say you know and as you're aware you've been here you've, you've heard that discussion about you know, a clause about provide creating defensible boundaries and stuff would, would that give any comfort at all on that yeah, it would give comfort if there was a decision to develop, but um, obviously, in addition to Greenbelt harms, um, there's a whole lot of other harms that oh, are quite. captured. Yeah. Um, in fact, I would like to ask, if we, it, would it be possible to have a copy of Barbara Keeley's statement? Because she's obviously picked up quite a lot of uh, issues, so if at a later time we could, if that could be an inquiry document, or I don't know how. Because um, there's obviously, it was quite lengthy, and... Indeed. We don't want to uh, duplicate issues she raised. Right. In terms well, of green belt purpose... Well, put it like, um, for, at least for today, we can probably possibly ask if we decide it's necessary. For today, don't worry, I'll know if... if I'll, I'll, I'll know if something's been raised. Um, yeah, in terms of green belt purpose, uh, by, by allocating this site, we think there'd be an undermining of green belt purpose thereafter. And, and obviously, sorry, and, and as you know, all of these comments, you know, if you... They're all... I understand they're all caveated with, yes, if you put that in, we'd be happier, but you're not happy, you know, don't, don't worry, we understand your position. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Um, okay. Um, sorry, um, I'm going to say odd, is that okay? Yeah, so, that's fine. Odd. <laughs> uh, just to echo uh, something that Jackie said, there is no defensible boundary with the proposal. There's no natural boundary at all. The only boundary you could come up to is the M62, which is, uh, would open up hundreds of hectares uh, for potential developers in the future. Once you go beyond the natural boundary you've got at the moment, it really opens up the door for further development. Uh, the, the point that... Um, your honourable gentleman said that uh, there'd only been 338 houses over the last 10 years. There's a good reason for that, is that the land that's been developed in Earlham and Caddizid has been brownfield, and it's been a natural way to actually develop and increase the housing in that area. If you go beyond into Greenbelt, it becomes unsustainable in so many ways. Do you want to? Can I say something? Yeah. 
and introduce myself as well. Um, I'm Dave Steele. I've roamed this Mossland area from Worsley all the way through the, the Mossland chat boss <coughs> since I was eight years old. I have a great love and affection for the place. Uh, when I had an idea that these type of things were going to take place in 2005, I decided to actually start doing an electronic list of how many times I've been in the Moss. I could have asked my wife, she would tell me. But um, just since 2005, January 2005 to uh, the end of December, I've done over 3,600 visits to this Mossland. I love this place, this is special. I am very disappointed to see that Salford wished to actually take away some of this wonderful land that they've got. I sent in my wildlife records. So my wildlife records up to that time was 173,377. Sorry, sorry we, we, we will come on to what I mean. Yeah, I'm yeah. focusing on but yeah. the, the Greenbelt issue particularly yeah, now. Yeah, but the Greenbelt issue, the, one, the point I wanted to make really to do with the biodiversity, the comment that was made is that, that it will be of little value. It, uh, there won't be much happening, it'll be a low harm. Well, you try and tell that. I, I think, sorry, I think that was in relation to greenbelt harm, not yeah. wildlife harm. We'll, right. we'll come well, on to biodiversity. Yeah, right. okay. so We're purely talking life. about the designation yeah. of greenbelt yeah. at the moment. It's it was because biodiversity was mentioned as there's been not much harm to the biodiversity. Uh, uh, and I feel as though it'd be a great deal of harm to uh, the biodiversity. I'm not wanting to speak for a GMC, nope. but I don't think that's what they were saying. I think right. they were talking about low harm in relation to greenbelt purposes, which is um, keeping land open. Um, preventing encroachment, um, urban sprawl, etc., etc. So that, that, but don't worry, we'll, we'll come on to biodiversity matters um, yeah. and your concerns were raised. Yeah. Sorry, are we, are we another, another hard representative. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, so that's right. My, my name's Lewis Nelson. I'm a councillor for Caddyshead and Lower Rurlum and a member of Action Against Rural Development, long before I was a councillor too. Um, I, I just wanted to make the point very specifically um, that was made around the the, the pathway of growth um, for the community that I represent and what that represents in terms of the, the future of the district. It, it was suggested that um, because of um, what could be considered low growth around this table in terms of new houses that have been built over the last, last decade, that somehow um, creates a justification um, to substantially increase that rate of growth. And I, I would argue that we've been following a pathway of sustainable growth for the community, um, realising the infrastructure that we have here. Uh, I echo sentiments been made about the, the indefensible northern boundary to this site, um, and I, uh, okay. I share resident uh, well, concerns. To be fair, and also your organ, oh, oh, I don't know, except we've, we've said about hot desking, I appreciate you, you want hot desk, but your organisation has already made that point. So we can just sort of, for future, you don't need to sort of hot desk to tell me this thing you've already told me. That makes sense. Um, Wayne Holmes, Persimmon. Thank you. Um, we've set out concerns about the way in which the Greenbelt assessment has been carried out. Uh, the Greenbelt assessment 2016 shows two parcels for land north of Earlham Station and up to the motorway. SA33, which is a large tract of land from the urban edge of Earlham to the open and more remote areas of the far west and Moss Road and SA34, which is a small area of land around Earlham Station. So firstly, such a large tract of land as SA33 doesn't allow for a meaningful assessment of Greenbelt purposes. When you're looking at the open and remote areas of the West, and it misses out the strongly urbanising influences along the northeastern edge of SA33. It also seems to conflict with Luck's own methodology through the Greenbelt assessment, which suggests edge of settlement areas will be disaggregated into smaller parcels. And thirdly, it's not clear why SA34 alone has been disaggregated into a small area of land. Um, I mean, the northern boundary has been referenced and we've made that point through our representations, but it, it's not necessarily wrong that that's identified as a parcel. But the question that we ask is why that's the only parcel that's been identified as a small area and why other parts of the northeastern boundary of SA33 haven't similarly been disaggregated. Because if they had, then they would have scored similarly weakly in Greenbelt impact terms to SA34. So uh, what does that mean for the soundness of this allocation? Not, well, mind, we're not talking about emission sites or anything like that. So yeah. how, how does that make this allocation sound? I think we need to focus on. Okay, well, going back to the site selection process, um, the 
uh, GM, the area of search has been selected for this area based on 800 metres from the train station. And at this stage, and we're going back to the site selection methodology here in session in a way, but if we think back to that, the stage two sites are put forward to the GMCA for consideration. And at the stage two point of that methodology, sites are excluded that don't fall within an area of search. And at that stage two point, green belt contribution isn't something that's taken into consideration. So you've got sites that are being promoted they're being excluded if they're not in the area of search. And the GMCA are just looking at a small area of search around Earlham Station, that 800 metre buffer. And in, in Greenbelt impact terms, they're comparing the draft site allocation they, largely with the draft site allocation because the area of search has been drawn so tightly. So I think what we're saying is if Greenbelt purposes, and that's the question, was included in the site methodology at stage two, then sites that similarly performed weekly could be assessed by the GMCA. So, so, the, so, so the overall to get thought, because obviously this is all in your written statement, yeah. so you're again telling me what I know yeah. from what you said. Um, you, you're trying to get the number of the point is that in this case you feel there are alternatives which would well, perform to, yeah. as well. To, to complement, we're not saying that the site allocation is wrong, but if you were to take... So into that's an important point. Yeah. Are you saying this allocation is unsound? I think we're saying the process is unsound. The okay. selection so, I mean, but, and, and, and we've had that discussion, as you say, way back in week one. Yeah. Two, so. But I, I, think it's, I think at that session it was suggested that we might be able to talk yeah, about okay. it. I'm again. not saying don't talk about it, I just want to, obviously, the, the we're focusing on session. what's wrong with this, you know, what's yeah. unsound about this yeah. allocation. So. I think our point is if Green Pearl impact was taken into consideration at stage two, then when you get to stage three, on weak parcels, then you could consider other objectives like family-sized housing, lower density, broadening the housing mix, which an extension to JP28 could do. Okay. Okay, thank okay. you. So that, that, okay, I suppose that comes into a boundary issue then, effectively you're thinking the boundary's incorrect and it could have been different. The, so. Yeah, it's all been defined by the area of search rather than considering alternative weak green belt parcels. Yeah. Okay, understood, thank you. Um, GM, say anything you want to come back on? Well, can I just work backwards? Um, so I'm not sure whether it is being said. I think it's, I think the position of Wayne Holmes for Simmon is, is that they are not making a case that the allocation here, number 28, is unsound. They've made a point about the methodology, which we obviously discussed before Christmas. Um, you, sir, have just betrayed the point as... Um, as it being a, a point about the boundary being wrong, that's to say of the allocation, but I don't think that can be quite right because to bring in the omission site that Wayne Homes and Persimmon Homes are promoting, I mean, it's, it's certainly not adjacent to SA, it's certainly not adjacent to this allocation. Uh, but in any event, I mean, if it is a boundary point, well, let's, let's treat it like that. Obviously, we're not discussing omission sites here because as we well know, I hope we all well know, if in due course, if, 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 you consider that the strategy is sound, but that one or other or a number of the allocations are not sound, and, and there's a need to, if you like, make up the numbers by looking for sites to take the place of those that you consider not to be sound, then there's a whole process which will have to be gone through. And you certainly won't be at this stage saying, and you should look at sites A, B, C, D and E. Um, in the normal way, that would be left to the plan making authority main modifications, a whole process that follows from that. So we're, we're way off, and let's hope, as far as we're concerned, we never get there. We're way off that, even as a matter of principle. Um, so then moving back to the other points that have been made, um, just two points. I mean, many of the points raised concern the argument that the northern boundary of this allocation would not be defensible. I've explained our approach there. The gentleman did say uh, for Ard that the only boundary to the north is the M62. That's my very point, um, unless one actually creates a defensible boundary here and is pragmatic about it, one would have to take all the land out of the green belt all the way up to the motorway just for the sake of finding a strong boundary, which would be nonsensical and certainly wouldn't be a sound approach as far as we're concerned. Um, so that's all I wanted to say, so thank you. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me, thank you very much. Um, okay, we'll move then on to um, the site location. 
uh, principle, and we'll, I say I think we'll cover the normal matters first um, before getting on to Pete. Um, a lot of this has been discussed, I think, or raised already in one way or another, but um, this is, and obviously you've already said, this site meets just the one criteria, uh, public transport accessibility and access to uh, Earlham Station. Um, anything to add about that particular point? I mean, there, are, there are good services, as I mentioned just, just now. I mean, three an hour, just over 20 minutes or just over a quarter of an hour to Manchester, for heaven's sake, um, to the city centre. Um, so, um, good public transport services. If you can't prioritise um, where you need sites, where if you can't prioritise a site which is bang slap next to a train station, uh, then there's something very, very wrong with one's uh, approach to planning. Um, we're also close to a local centre here, a uh, designated local centre, and I've made the point about the bus stops and bus services as well, but, you know, it's, it is a sustainably located site for housing development if one is in um, need of finding housing sites in the first place. And we've had all that discussion before Christmas, and you know, as far as we're concerned, we are. So one then needs to find the better place sites, and this is one of those. And this has been suggested through uh, representation statements that, albeit it's close um, in proximity, uh, distance to the railway station, that the actual access would be poor. Um, the, is there a way of... Well, first of two questions is this, is access to the station poor um, for if you were delivering from that site and, and or could it be made, could it be improved to, a, to an acceptable standard? Well, we have criteria in the policy which yes. we'll talk to you about later on about improving access, but we're very, very close to the train station. Did you want to say anything in particular? I'd only to say the allocation includes uh, sort of space to allow for sustainable access, so walking, cycling, access to the station from the allocation. So, yeah. And so just to clarify, I'm sure uh, Mr. Katkowski is familiarity with, tra with timetables is as sharp as anybody. The legend, legendary. Um, as I, as I we were that there were three trains an hour during the peak, but two trains per hour during normal. But the peak time. is two hours because the morning peak is seven o'clock till nine. And there are, there are three trains an hour in each of those peaks. I shall, I shall deliver yeah. Mr. Katkowski's stare back at my transport No, that's colleagues. right. No, that's fine. As someone who's never learned to drive, I do know an awful lot about train timetables. <clears throat> Very stable. I won't mention my driver. <laughs> so yeah, obviously, so yes, you, your 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 position is it's sustainable location, um, and again, in terms of the strategy, you argue that it will boost northern competitiveness and expand the mix of dwellings, um, and again, as with other solvent sites discussed, um, this isn't necessarily. Well, I think yesterday I, I asked whether this is a, a geographic uh, issue uh, pertaining to this site in particular, or is it a, a Salford issue? And, and you said yesterday, well, the, the both. It's all but, of them, but yes. Yeah, yeah. But there is a, there is a the northern part, element. the northern areas, and Salford. And this relates back to what you were saying about the lack of, I mean, I know it's been disputed, but the lack of development in, the air, you know, in this area, you're, you're diversifying that. It's twofold. So in, in relation to that point, it's um, it's the contribution or limited contribution, relatively limited contribution that the area has made to housing land supply over the last decade. Our monitoring figures I've relayed to you, 338 net additions in 10 years, plus it is this need um, to diversify the stock of new homes so there isn't uh, such a focus on apartments as has been the case for quite a long time in Salford. I was going to potentially pick this up under the development requirements under scale, but I think it's sensible to do it now again. Um, 800 dwellings here, um, uh, policy talks about higher densities nearer to the train station, yes. um, lower densities elsewhere. Again, it's been, in terms of that point about diversification, it's been suggested by some that the actual, um, when you look at what will be delivered, particularly uh, you, you are at least in part replicating that um, type of housing that's been delivered elsewhere in Salford and therefore won't necessarily fit into that strategic objective. Um, any response to that? Well, plainly there would be a mix, um, but there's certainly the cap capability on this site, a site of this size, to provide houses rather than flats. Um, I made the point yesterday that there is a Salford local plan policy which would set the detail of the, of the mix in any event. 
uh, this policy, I think, has a criteria and we'll come to, obviously, focusing on houses as well, although with a mix of um, provision for older people as well. So the policy addresses that point. Okay, thank you. Um, I think most of the other could issues... I possibly, uh, could if, I possibly come back in? Where's that? Sorry. Uh, uh, no, if you, could, if you could wait until I invite comments. Um, thank you. I'll just get to the end of my questions first. Um, but I'll come to you first. Um, yes, there are other uh, sort of location issues being picked up about things such as traffic and so on, um, but I think we'll pick those up as we go through. Thank and you. I think I will just pause here before we move on to... to site location and Pete, uh, just to pick up any general points. So I will, so, although well, I wasn't far from opening up, um, I'm here now, so Robert Keeley. Thank you, um, I just want to say that this, uh, I want you to come in on this point because the sustainability of the allocation seems to be based around uh, a train service, which to be honest, it, it's a fantasy to, to talk about the, the train service as has been described, um, I, I made some very strong points and I want to just point back to them because there are very, very many complaints made about the train services from Earlham Station now. If we're talking about introducing a thousand extra uh, passengers potentially onto a service which is already overcrowded, where hundreds of people are waiting for trains and to be perfectly frank, it's, it's, it's a dreadful service. Uh, the train service, as I mentioned in December, Transpanion Express halved the service and there were, th well, there were three trains leaving, now there's just one. So it's an unacceptable service now. I can't see how this contributes to sustainability. Uh, and I've thought this from the start of, of the discussions around this, but we must take into account the actual service that's run, not some sort of fantasy notion of how you know, regular train services might be, because they're just not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will get onto this, but uh, looking at Appendix D, as we, you know, we will at some point, and looking at the improvements that are suggested or, or might be might be part of the mix of uh, things that come forward on this site or is considered on this site, um, where it talks about CLC rail line capacity improvements, is that, and it's a, a supporting rather than necessary, is that a, a name to improve the service that exists? Or? I'd need to. Need to get more Looks trains on the left on that one. So it's a supporting item. Yeah, it's about quite. I mean, item, but yeah. yeah. I mean, I suppose that. Sorry, the and the obviously extension to that point is, if if the service has limitations, does this development provide any scope to improve them? Yes. You just give us one moment, sir. Okay. Mia, why don't you come? Yes. And, is it, do you want Mia? Do you want to yeah. come and address it? Yeah. No, it? no, James, 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 Mia, can you sit there? Sorry, sir, as you've no, raised the point now, <laughs> apparently it's not, as, it's not as simple as the... Yes or no. Yes or no. Um, there, are, there, are, there is an intention in the GM 2040 strategy and the delivery plan to work with national um, the rail providers to improve services on the line. At the moment, the proposals are, that are in discussion are talking about having overlapping services from Liverpool and Manchester, which would change direction around Warrington, which would give you a much more reliable service and the, have um, the potential for an increased, potentially increased number of um, number of trains, but also um, in terms of not having people use that line as the main direct line from Liverpool to Warrington, so um, Liverpool to Manchester, so you might not have the same capacity issues. Um, but I would say that the, the current capacity issues and the current problems are actually very much um, associated with the current um, delivery, sorry, the sort of industrial action and some of the issues we've got with rail franchising in the north generally, so we wouldn't expect those to continue. Okay, thank you. Um, that's, I, I would just say that's all very one of the reasons it's not it's not considered necessary because it's all very early doors and in discussion with plenty of work still to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, just on those issues we talked about, and say so we'll pick up on lots of other issues. Uh, move around to CPRE. Um, <clears throat> yeah. The, the, from a CPRE point of view, the site is very unsustainable. Whilst it looks on the maps in terms of bus 
services and stops and train station. It is a particular geography I struggle with. I've been late to meetings there because you cannot guarantee traffic flow or even the rail services. So um, I, from in a personal capacity, I travel there a lot and I am always uh, sigh when I have to go there because it's just impossible to get to. It is really difficult to get there on public transport. Um, so, yeah, um, I think there's probably going to be more local comments, but... Um, it, of all the places across the whole of Greater Manchester, it's one of the worst places to get to. And I live relatively close in uh, South Manchester, but always the M60 is clogged. Um, so e even going in the car, it's not an easy prospect. Um, it's a one-road location, so everything gets snarled up back at the M60. And uh, how the current... I mean, Annex D shows you how many necessary infrastructure improvements are suggested but even with those I think that you'd struggle to make the site work. Thank you. Um, Ard. Uh, thank you. Just to pick up this issue about um, the, the train um, efficiency at, at Earlham Station, uh, industrial action has undoubtedly had an impact on the last um, several months but respectfully that isn't the reason that Earlham train station is so woefully served. It, we are served by the stopper train um, service that stops at every single station along the route. It's not a priority at Deansgate for signalling, which is the con most congested um, train station um, in the country, to my understanding. That, that is the issue of why we have regularly delayed and cancelled services. So, so respectfully, that, that isn't the case. Um, ju just on the issue particularly of road infrastructure, and I realise that great play is being made about Earlham train station, and I understand the point. Um, but Earlham and Cadizhead is a blue-collar town, a working-class town. Not everybody, shockingly, works in Liverpool or Manchester. Um, and as a result, we're a commuter town um, it, accessing industrial jobs across Greater Manchester. So the primary um, mode of transport is the car. The bus network is insufficient. It's, and if we're going to use the Manchester metric for getting to and from places, it's an hour and 20 minutes without particular congestion into Manchester on the bus. Um, and the other bus service we've got goes to Warrington. We have two bus services. Um, so no, not great choice at all. At the back of this allocation, um, you're looking at about half a mile to access the neighbourhood centre that we're talking about. It's a very long walk away for people to be able to access it. So undoubtedly that would um, create um, additional vehicles moving down Aslett and New Moss Road on, on a regular basis, as we would reasonably expect. Um, however, why this is um, very important to consider is that Astley Road, as um, Barbara Keeley MP had referenced, has got two schools, a doctor's surgery. It's also got sheltered over 55's accommodation. It's a duck and dive road to get, get to with, with a single um, lane of traffic able to flow at a time. Uh, a new Moss Road, which becomes Moss Road um, as the other access point, it is also just totally insufficient. It's serviced at the moment um, to, uh, by a hump bridge going over the motorway, which would need significant um, investment to um, ensure is suitable for development of this kind. Um, but beyond that, as I say, it, it's a very long way for people to, to access. And at the moment, the primary use of New Moss Road and Astley Road um, back in the day was for access for agricultural vehicles only. And at the moment of times of harvest, local farmers and local people work hand in hand together to clear the road for for big agricultural vehicles. Respectfully, I don't think local people are going to have the same goodwill for development of this nature um, on their small um, roads. OK, okay. We, we are... We were talking about sustainability, so traffic and obviously transport does come into that. We'll probably have another opportunity. There are criteria relating to transport. Um, I'm not going to want to, obviously, hear... We've already heard about concerns about congestion from Robert Keeley. We've heard that again. We don't need to hear it again. No. It'll be more about mitigation. So, but I know, I know you're generally talking about the location no. here so, and sustainability terms. So I think, I think there are two different issues with transport in terms of the local access points yes. for this yeah. development and congestion on the A57. Yeah. Those two are different things. And I wasn't referencing that congestion. No, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, just on the local centre 
you just obviously mentioned there's a doctor surgery, there's some um, the schools, the schools nearby, doctor surgery. Um, the local centre is half a mile away. Half a mile is generally a 10, you know, I'd say a 10 minute walk, 10, 15 minute walk. It doesn't sound particularly excessive. Um, or I take your point about the route, that might be uh, add to the, add to the, uh, the journey time or add to the psychological barrier to go in, that's fair enough. But, um, um, so there are, but the point being, there are obviously facilities in the area. So is that not a good thing? Uh, not specifically. In terms of shopping facilities, fine, we've got a Tesco with a nice car park. But very specifically about the issue of schools, um, I'm not making a point about school capacity or anything like that, or the doctor's capacity, which, by the way, had to close its list to new patients last year for a substantial part of the year. But Astley Road and, and McDonald Road, which is the access point for this allocation, um, has got all of these things on the same road. It, it's not necessarily a point about access. It's a point about um, how congested that road is at the moment because of all of these services um, on, that, on that very small um, road, which, to be honest, was a bad place to put all of these things in the first place without okay. considering the addition of 800 cars and the impact that will have at the moment. Because I, I don't want to repeat the point, and I know you don't want to, me to repeat the point, but at the moment, it's a single access at a time, ducking and diving. Um, okay, yeah, right, you've, 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 it, you've it, said that. So be, I think Because of that point. Yeah, you've said that, so we, we, can, we can move on. Um, did you have an extra point? Uh, yeah, hopefully yeah. a different one. Well, I've practically done that uh, journey for 12 years, and it was awful. And okay. now and a half on the bus on the way home was not much fun, but that's the story. That's, how, that's why I choose to live there. Going back to another point that was made, it was about the fact that the point was made that the fact that our community hasn't had enough houses built compared to the rest of Salford. Is that one that could we've, still raise? We've, we've, you've, well, it's already been referred to by your, your, your colleague. And, and as to why, yeah, I find both two of your colleagues have already mentioned yeah. that point. That's fine, yeah. So if you, unless it's a different point, then no, I don't I, need to I, hear I'd just again. like to say that really our community is self-sustaining and we've been the custodians of the Greenbelt area for the rest of Salford and we'd like to remain that way. Fair, okay, understood. Uh, Persimmon, or Wayne Holmes, or both. Thank you. Uh, just an area of, quick area of search point, just in terms, paragraph 142 of the framework talks about Sites being well served by public transport when looking at Greenbelt release, it doesn't suggest that land closest to a train station or bus stop is necessarily preferable in terms of Greenbelt release. It asks for a, a rounded assessment of whether a site is well served by public transport. And much of the land that was previously allocated in the, or draft allocated in the 2016 GMSF is within two kilometres of a train station or 800 metres of a bus stop, which is widely recognised as being well served by public transport. Again, I'm going to have, have trouble stopping you talking about other sites, aren't I? Well... What is what's the... Pro again, are you saying this site's not, not well related to public transport? Or? No, we're saying that um, if the area of search at stage two, if the area of search was expanded to consider not just a focus on 800 metres from the train station, but okay. being well that's, served. That's the site selection criteria then, you, you, and you presume... There is some overlap, yeah. I mean, we couldn't... Well, uh, I think in that, in that yeah. respect, that's very much... I mean, I think there's some site-specific issues you talk about, but in that respect, an objection to the, the criteria that was used is obviously something that was, was considered... It's a pure methodology proposition, that sounds to me, rather than a... You, you prefer a different site selection criteria. Well, we, we talked about that. OK. Yeah. 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 OK. Um, anything you wish to come back on at those points, Mr. Well, obviously Kapowski? we're going to talk about traffic later on, but I'm just going to look to my left to, to say something about the bus services. We've spoken quite a bit about the trains, but on the bus services side, please. I'm just saying, in terms of the bus services along Liverpool Road, um, current time time, I think, is, is six buses an hour. So we've got one, one service running at four, another one at two per hour, and that goes throughout the day. So we'd consider that well served by that form of transport, as well as obviously the train station. OK. Thank you. Right, I'm going to pause there then for a moment, and we're going to move on now, I think, 10 to 11. Do you think we'll get Pete done in 10 minutes? I don't know. Um, we'll give it a go, sir. Contemplating whether to have a little break now and then come back for Pete. Um, It'd be quite nice to do Pete without a break in it, so if we, yes, exactly. so to speak, no pun intended, we, so if we, we have if we, we could, have uh, we could, This now. could be a... It could be, it could be a quick discussion. It could be lengthy. So I think what we'll do, we'll pause now, 
as it's only 10 minutes earlier than normal. Yeah. We'll come back at 10 past 11. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you.
Okay, thank you. It's ten past, so we'll carry on. So, as discussed previously, we're going to move on to issues around uh, development affecting peat. Um, some of this discussion will be, as I said before, uh, quite general, I imagine, and therefore invite comments from, from everyone uh, who, who is here today, and then obviously we may well get into some site-specific matters where we can drill down to, um, you poor use of words, uh, we can um, discuss the site specifics um, as we go through. So I have a series of questions which say I'll put to GMCA first. Um, just in relation to this site in particular, um, I think the, the map you provided, very usefully provided, su su suggests that the entire site is within uh, deep peaty soils. Is that correct? It, it does at that general level of, um, of mapping. Okay. When, you come to the act, when we come to the actual details vis-a-vis -vis the site, there are different depths, but we'll come, we're come okay, to that okay. slightly later okay. on. I mean, I wouldn't... Well, yes, let's see whether, by, by the process of you asking your questions, whether I manage to uh, have an opportunity to actually say a few things in a, in a coherent order, um, if you like, because I think there's some scene setting which I need to set out. I need to deal with Natural England's recent correspondence. I need to make a number of points about national policy, etc. If they're all in your list, then that's fine. I, I'm, well, well, I would hope so. Yes. But if they're not, then you can okay. obviously, uh, it's just, you're, you're, it's just a, as with everybody else, you'll have your opportunity to, to say that's something. That's right. So. But there is a narrative that makes most sense if it's actually taken from one end to the other, if you like. But, okay. But, you know. but I think my, my narrative, as I want to go through it, starts then. So obviously, we've got potential peak deposits. In terms of GMCA's um, position on this, you know, in terms of considering the potential impacts from developing on peat, um, either generally or site specifically in this case. I mean, what, what, how have you, you know, what impacts have you taken into account? Um, 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 I guess the, the logical uh, extension of that is how have you weighed those impacts up in the site selection process? So perhaps two parts to that, you know, what, what are the impacts of developing on peat as far as you're concerned? And then how did they factor in? Right, okay. Um, so I just put my marker down that I think one needs to actually start with understanding the policy position in relation to peat before one, for the context, before one then turns well, to that. But, but answering well, okay, your question well, okay, directly. Because okay. the way I, where I wanted is understanding the, perhaps the other way, slightly the other way around to you. I wanted to understand the impacts exactly. and then, then look at the policy. Um, so that's, that's my order. No, that's your order, sir. And, and you're sitting there and I'm not. So we do it your way, of course. But I'd make the point that it, it, this would only make sense once one understands the context. I think it'll make sense to me anyway, but... Um, Fine. I hope. That's no problem. Um, so, so the answer is, it's, the answer to your question is that we recognise there would be impacts in relation to peat. We don't think they would be as bad as they might have been portrayed by, by others. Um, there are criteria in the policy which seek to mitigate and minimise the impacts on peat, but it is on the negative side of the equation. That's why I said earlier on when we came to the balance of pros and cons, um, I said we're going to have a bespoke discussion about peat. Had we rolled it all into the balance sheet, then it would have been on the negative side. Obviously, um, it would have been a it would have been one of those factors which has been taken into account on on that side of the equation. I mean, the general point, just to spit it out now, is that um, as far as we're concerned, there is the greater public good is in allocating the site despite any impacts on peat. Um, and we'll come to how that fits with national policy uh, in, a, in a little while's time. So, but in, in terms your, in of the actual order. specific impacts, because um, obviously throughout this process and various bits of representation, various impacts have been put to us, uh, potential impacts, obviously, is uh, effect on carbon store, effect on restoration of um, existing peat bog, um, effect on particular um, habitats, um, effect, if you like, on development on, on, say, individual sites and their effect on uh, peat outside the site. I think have all of those things been, you, you, are, you, are you in agreement broadly that those are the kind, you know, those are the correct impacts to be looking at? Is it, is, you know. We're in agreement those are the potential impacts in relation to this. So we're starting, and we're getting very much, understandably perhaps, we're getting very much to site specifics here rather than matters of overarching... Well, I think I just want to understand the, no, the, no, but the fair context. Enough. So this is one of those sites which has the allocations <coughs> reduced very considerably 
in size during the process of progress of the plan through the system. Um, and in defining the smaller, now smaller area of the site which has been allocated, consideration was given to the depths of peat across the site, ranging from 0.2 of a metre to 4.95, so you know, just to 4.95 metres. Um, that, uh, that was the wider site within the PFE 2021 boundary. The peat is generally shallower, maximum depth of 3.4 metres. So by reducing the size of the site, we have got shallower peat than we would have had had we you know, had the previous more extensive allocation that was previously proposed, but which is no longer proposed. Potential to accommodate large areas of open space within the proposed allocation, with this potentially including areas of wetland habitat. Um, densities, development densities at their highest, closest to the station, where we understand the peat to be at its shallowest. Um, there are various, various references in the allocation policy to seeking to minimise the impacts on peat. Uh, the peat on the site is, we understand, degraded from years of drainage and agricultural activity, has and is emitting carbon, which would continue if the site was left undeveloped in agricultural use. Um, and there are various uh, potentials here to contribute to restoration elsewhere in Chat Moss. Um, so that's, that's it in a, that's, those are site specific points about this. So yes, there are the potential impacts, but you know, it is easy to overstate them, I think. But all of this needs, and I'll make the point again, needs to be seen in the wider context, which I know you're gonna to come to, obviously. Okay, well, but yeah. those are the site specific points. So yes, so there are negatives. They are fed into the balance. They're not as bad as some might portray them to be, but we have taken them into account. And even if one took this head on, even if, even if the position was exactly as set out in Natural England's most recent letter, we would say that the greater public benefit is in allocating the site. Okay, that's, that's yeah. useful to, to understand that. Yeah. This is a negative, it's on the negative side of the equation, but the overall balance is the, over, is the same overall balance which, we, which I briefly outlined earlier on. Okay, so then that does usually then take us on to, so I've understood the, the impact that you come, yeah, yeah, so obviously if you'd said that, that these aren't impacts or anything, that'd be a slightly different scope, but you're, you're accepting that the, the points, you're accepting the level of impact. I don't think there's any specific work that's been done on um, either the, any site, particularly that says, you know, there with this, like, this particular impact on carbon emissions or anything. Very, like. very difficult to do, yeah. so. Yeah. I understand it, forgive me. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so yes, okay, and so we'll, we'll, we'll then move on to the, the national policy position, um, starting with, and I think you, you touched on this yesterday, um, that you, you're, you're starting with, there's no uh, national policy preclusion against development on Pete. Um, is that your position? It, it is, and if I might be just allowed a moment or two on this, because obviously it's, an, it's a very important point, so this is the wider point of principle, if you like. And I mean, the most recent correspondence from Natural England, 10th of February 2023, which is document OD23 in the <coughs> examination library. Uh, you'll recall you asked Natural England to attend this and other sessions where peat is being discussed. And this letter is their response, which explains why they have taken the decision not to attend. And it's on the first page of the letter and it speaks volumes, to be quite frank, um, the reasoning as to why they have decided not to attend. Um, and the points in sequence are as follows. As you can see from the second paragraph of their letter, they refer to their Reg 19, their Regulation 19 representations. That's the letter of the 1st of October they refer to of 2021. And as they, as they said then, and they still say now, um, the concerns they have relating to development on peat are not formally matters of soundness. In other words, they're not actually saying that the allocations um, is, as part of the plan are unsound or not sound, to use the language of the legislation and the framework. Um, so they have concerns. I've, I'm not in any way denying their concerns. They're set out in their correspondence, but they're not raising these as points of soundness. And the reason for that, um, and the reason for their non-attendance, is then in the third paragraph of the letter, taking a decision not to attend these hearing sessions, since there has not yet been an official change to the national policy provision for protecting peat from development and therefore no mature change in circumstance. They mean from the date of their Reg 19 representations, obviously. However, based on our ongoing work and discussions with DEFRA, 
National England will be proposing a change to policy as part of our formal consultation response to national planning policy reforms. Um, and we wish to draw that to the inspector's attention, which obviously their letter does. So um, the point, I mean, it's all there, but the point put shortly is that at the moment there is no specific national planning policy that specifically lists peat as a resource which should not be impacted upon or should not be um, damaged um, by development. Um, they, Natural England, and, you know, Fair enough, one can understand where they're coming from, but they are, in effect, lobbying for a change to national policy, and we would await, we would just have to wait and see whether, for example, in the, in the new edition of the framework, which is promised in spring, or the then further revisions of the framework, which are meant to be con being considered later this year, quote unquote, whether in either of those or at any stage the framework changes to the national planning policy framework, changes to introduce a specific protection. Um, against development for peat. If, as and when it does, if, as and when it does, then obviously the transitional provisions in the new framework would be all important to see whether they do or don't apply to places for everyone. Um, the normal way of going about things, as you know, is that tra transitional provisions are set so that if your plan is already being ex examined, um, the new framework generally doesn't come into play for such plans. But we're waiting and see. I mean, that's just speculation on my part. That's what's happened at always to date, but we we'll have to wait and see. So at the moment, that's the position. Now, when you look at the framework, um, when you look at the framework, um, at the moment, no specific mention of peat. Um, I don't know but it may well be that um, Natural England will be lobbying for um, what's currently paragraph 180, um, item C, um, which refers to irreplaceable habitats, and the specific um, habitats mentioned are ancient woodland and ancient or veteran trees. Um, you know there that in relation to irreplaceable habitats, there's a should be refused, this is a development management point, unless there are wholly exceptional reasons in paragraph 63, uh, footnote 63, forgive me, refers to um, instances where the public benefit would clearly outweigh the loss or deterioration of habitat. So even at the moment in the framework, if, if one was dealing with an irreplaceable habitat within the context of the framework, um, one can even so develop um, where the public benefit would clearly outweigh the loss or deterioration and then there's any reference to suitable compensation strategy. So I, I don't know, but whether or not Natural England will be seeking to have peat specifically mentioned in that context, or whether they're seeking an even tougher, um, you know, no public benefit get out um, provision, I, I mean, I simply don't know. But at the moment, that's where one might sort of imagine peat could be introduced into the framework. Even, even in cases of irreplaceable habitat, though, as I've just said, the framework recognises that the greater public interest uh, can outweigh harm to irreplaceable habitats. So um, that's the position in relation to national policy. There is no specific planning policy that explicitly protects peat from development. There may or may not be one in the future that may or may not apply to places for everyone. Even if one takes um, the irreplaceable habitats passage in the framework and applies it to peat, um, even though peat is not specifically mentioned as an irreplaceable habitat in the framework, even were one to do that, um, one can even so propose development where the public benefit would clearly outweigh the loss. And, you know, as I've already said, uh, so far as we're concerned, there are exceptional circumstances to justify taking this land from the green belt. We would rely on those same exceptional circumstances, those same considerations, as being the, well, you get the language exactly right, the public benefit which would clearly outweigh the loss. So that's how, that's how I put it, so in relation to national policy. Okay, thank you. Um, surprising, well, you won't be surprised to learn I was going to talk about 180C. Um, I'm glad I was ahead of you, at least on this occasion. So. Uh, yes, so uh, we'll work backwards from that, if you like, but so I'll start with 180C. Um, you say it's in relation to planned applications, but logic dictates that it would be logical to a planned application come in an allocation. Um, are you... Obviously, it talks about um, irreplaceable habitats, such as ancient woodlands or veteran trees. So, you'd seen that as a closed list, or as, as a it could be it could be anything. It's obviously E.G. rather than I.E. I mean, mm. the word such as you know, yeah. uh, examples rather than a closed list. Of course, 
The point, though, being that nowhere in national policy has it been specifically st stated, recognised or implied that peat is an irreplaceable habitat well, in that context. I suppose that's my question. As far as yeah. your, your, yeah, the, yeah. your position is, 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 and obviously it's been used, that phrase has been used a lot throughout the yes, process, exactly. is that your position that it is an irreplaceable habitat um, in principle, or could be an irreplaceable habitat in, 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 in depending on specific it circumstances? Could be. It could be. It could be. But it's not been carved out as or specifically instance, instance as one. And as I say, I think, to be frank, Natural England's letter, the first page of their most recent letter, does speak volumes about this issue. Yes. Um, Although, obviously but in any event, but in any event, as I've said, I've, and I've taken 180C head on mm. um, because it's development management. I take the point that I take the point that the similar logic one would think would apply to plan making, although that's not the way the framework's written. But let's let's do that by way of an analogy. And in those circumstances, one would be asking oneself through plan making, we have some peat. And I don't mean to be flippant, and this is actually a genuine point, but we have some peat which is in an incredibly sustainable location <laughs> for building houses. Um, what do we do? What do we do? Well, we ask ourselves whether the public benefit would clearly outweigh the loss or, de or deterioration of the habitat. And that is the question which we've asked anyway mm. through the process of making the plan, because the negative of peat is in with, for example, Grade 1 agricultural land. It's in with the green belt, which one normally wouldn't go to, et cetera, et cetera. It's in that list of negatives which have to be weighed in the overall balance. Uh, I think you said, uh, and, and you said using sticking to an ATC for a second, um, if this site was allocated, um, irrespective, if you like, of the allocation, an application comes in, and if it were de de under the current plan, if it were deemed an irreplaceable habitat and therefore was put under that criterion, that, that test would apply. Are you... you Making the point that if if allocated, then it, you know sort of the logic is that the, the council has already determined that there are wholly exceptional circumstances here in like in the same vein as Greenbelt, and therefore that test is passed by by definition. It must be passed because it's allocated. I would say that yes, yes. because I would say if if the site's allocated, if it is, and you know having had this discussion about peat, um, if that's the end result of all of this then um, I would certainly say that if as when a planning application came in uh, on the site um, in relation to the allocation, that that public benefit question has been resolved through the plan making process. And to be quite frank, I would have thought that's, pr I mean, it is at the moment, it is, I have to say it's interesting, and let me say in, in inverted commas, that this is in as a development management point rather than a plan making point, because one would have thought that these overarching questions of where is the, where is the public benefit? Does it clearly outweigh the loss or deterioration? Is is preeminently a plan making question. Well, one would have thought. thought. Yeah. One and would I think thought. that's why, obviously, we we uh, need to talk about it now. Um, yeah. And can I just, while we're on, and I don't know whether you were going to come to legislative points or not, because obviously the Natural England letter does touch on a on a. Well, uh, of indeed, yes, I think I think that would have come under my general a general right, point okay. about what level of protection. Yes. they have and I suppose work again working back from 180c my other question was going to be well uh, nothing specific other than in relation to mineral extraction um, which you know, obviously you can, you, that is a moratorium on mineral extraction I to think but um, another part of the framework you say nothing specific in the framework um, but which if you like other than 180c which other if there are other policies um, which would trigger be triggered in a non-specific way. So, one seven five. I mean, any uh, natural England refer to one seven five to one seven nine. I think. Uh, I guess where peat sits in that kind of hierarchy of habitats and so on is is useful there as well. So you pick up the statutory point there as well. Yes, but apart from obviously apart from issues relating to the habitats directive, which I was going to come to in a few mm. moments' time. But leaving that to one side just for a few moments in relation to policy matters which are set out in the framework i mean frankly one couldn't get a um a more restrictive approach if you like to uh, to um a matter of nature conservation ecological interest etc than one finds in 180c so if one were by proxy to treat peat as an irreplaceable habitat and think of it in 180c terms that's to say you shouldn't build on us unless there are wholly exceptional reasons that's to say where the public benefit would clearly outweigh the loss 
or, or deterioration of the habitat. That's the definition of wholly exceptional reasons. Um, if one treated peat by proxy in that category, then that's, that's as tough a test as you're going to get in the framework in relation to it, leaving aside the habitat's regular uh, directive point, which I'm going to come to. Um, and so otherwise, more general, more generic references to um, ecological or biodiversity, nature conservation matters in the framework, yes, you know, you would, you would apply them and take them all on board, but they're not going to lead to a more rigorous or more exacting approach than the one which is set out for irreplaceable habitats. And, you know, one can see, one can understand the logic of that, because if something is truly irreplaceable, then one would expect it to have that higher level of protection, if you like, that one finds in 180C. Um, while I'm on, I said I'd come back to the Habitats Directive, the Natural England Letter, page two, third new paragraph, says it's also worth noting that habitats present on deep peak can, and I'm emphasising that word, can, fall within the definition of Habitats Dir Directive Annex 1, priority habitat, and they've quoted it, degraded raised bog, still capable of natural regeneration. That's why I'm emphasising those words. They are not saying, and we do this site specific, so I'm not going to talk about the other sites now, but they're not saying that JPA 28, JPA 28 North Vernum is um, a degraded raised bog which is still capable of natural regeneration. They're not saying for one moment it's within the directives annex. Uh, had it been, they would have been the first people to say it, I'm sure. Um, they also then go on to refer to the duty under Section 40 of the National Environment and Rural Communities Act 2006, Section 40. Um, I mean, this is a I'm, I'm sorry, but this is a complete red herring. The duty um, there is, uh, is that in exercising our functions as a public authority, so here we're making a, a joint local plan, uh, but it's a general duty which applies across the board, but yes, it applies here. Uh, one is to, um, in exercising that duty, one is to, um, one is to consider uh, the general biodiversity objective, quote unquote, the general biodiversity objective, and that is the conservation and enhancement of biodiversity in England through the exercise of our functions. We're here through the exercise of making a plan, and we've certainly done that, and as you know, we've got a specific biodiversity net gain policy that we've already discussed, but in relation to particular allocations, yes, of course, we've considered biodiversity implications, and you have a paper on that as well. So that general duty to um, what is called the general biodiversity objective, um, that general duty has obviously been exercised here. Um, so to make the point in a letter talking about peace is, is a little bit off, off the point, to be quite frank, because it's a general duty that applies, applies across the board. It's not a specific duty about peat, for example. Um, so... Um, and then there are references to various local policies in the, um, in the Natural England letter, um, some of which are in places for everyone. Of course, we've discussed, we've discussed them. And others are within Salford's local, planning, local plan. Can I just draw to attention that policy EN11 Mosslands, which is on the bottom of page two of the Natural England letter, is a UDP policy which has now been superseded by, you know, it no longer exists. It's been superseded by the Salford Local Plan. Uh, this letter is dated 10th of February, so we'd adopted the Salford Local Plan by then, so naturally, I'm, I'm not criticising them, they hadn't caught up with that, that fact. <coughs> is there a, a similar policy in the...? Uh, well, they, they've, referred to, they've referred to the policies in the, okay, in right. the local plan. So is that G12, G12 and CC1 and CC1 are, are extant? Yes, they are in yep. the they are in the new local plan. Okay. I hope. Yes. It's actually policy GI two rather than G twelve. Okay. That's a type of oh, green infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, green infrastructure too. Yes, of course. Okay. So that that's my recitation about policies. Okay. Thank you. Um, Just in terms of the balance, you've, you've said you've, you've, you've done your balancing exercise and you've done your, um, you've made your judgment. In, in relation to this particular issue, is that set out clearly? Is that in the S? Will I turn, which document would I turn to? Is that in the IA? 
where it specifically considers? Well, obviously, in our strategic environment and assessment work, you have you know, the various checklists in relation to ecological matters and biodiversity matters. But my point was a broader point that the, even if one treats peat by proxy or by analogy as an irreplaceable habitat and within 180C, and I'm not saying for one moment that one should, but even if one were to, even if one were to, then there's a wholly exceptional reasons test. But that language, which obviously sounds different to exceptional circumstances, that language, when you read the footnote, is then defined specifically as where the public benefit would clearly outweigh the mm. loss or deterioration of the habitat. So it's a public benefit clearly outweigh. That is no higher, no higher a test than the exceptional circumstances test for removing land from the green belt. It's the self-same point. You have to decide that the public benefit would clearly outweigh whatever, whatever harm there would be. Obviously, when you're taking land out of the green belt, it's harm to the green belt and other harms, et cetera, et cetera. All those things are weighed in the equation. And one has to stand back and say, well, do I think this is, do I think this is exceptional? What do I mean by that? Well, do I think the public benefit or the greater public good uh, would clearly outweigh whatever harm there is? In this case, harm to peat. <coughs> And so oh, I suppose the point I was trying to make is that there's no sort of specific, I mean, this is like, you come to this conclusion um, in the round. There's no sort of, yeah, there's no right. document anywhere that says we've focused on Pete and this is our view on Pete. It is a, a broad pros and cons for very simplistically approach. Forgive me, sir, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, yes, it is, and it has to be. Um, there isn't a separate peat paper, if you like, that yeah. says, you know, we're like peat on, I don't know, North of Earlham or whatever site one's discussing at any moment in time. X, Y, Z, and here on the other side of the equation are, you know, all the pluses. It has to be. <laughs> there is no site where the, where, there is no single issue site, and this is an instance of a no single issue site. You know, not, there, is, there isn't, it's not a site which just has one thing. It's not a mm. site which the only point you need to worry about is peat. It's a site where you need to think, well, what are the benefits? What are the disbenefits? One of the disbenefits is peat. So you can only do this as an overall exercise. Um, because, because that's the way one has to do, deal with it when, one, when one's making a plan. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, just sticking to the policy, you've, you've, you've introduced so. the sort of, the, the, and again, it's been referred to a few times by today and, and, and Natural England uh, about consistency of um, development taking place on these sites with existing. Uh, well, well, the policies in the PFE, but also existing local plan policies. Is the prince, again, what we talked about in terms of 180C, you can, if, you, if you take the view that the allocation, if you like, is carried out the test, is the same, is that your view on the other policies? Well, about the, the allocation in and of itself has concluded that, that the, the, the development is acceptable in principle in relation to all of these other policies? There are, short answer to that is, is it, there's a short answer, there's a slightly longer answer. Yes, but, and, the, or, and um, what one needs to take into account here is that there are policies in the newly adopted local plan. It just happens this site is within Salford, which has a newly adopted local plan, which has an, policies on, on the subject. And in the wider Places for Everyone document, there are policies which also bear on this, on this subject. They are um, thematic, policies, they're not drilling down to a particular site and its pros and cons to be removed, for example, from the green belt, as in this instance, and allocated for development, as in this instance. And so um, when you come to the particular issues that revolve around a proposed allocation, you have to tackle these tests head on in national policy, which is what we've done. Um, and yes, I mean, I, I can well understand someone saying, well, hold on, how is it that you've got all these policies to protect peat, whether in the emerging places for everyone or in this particular instance in a locally, in a recently adopted local plan, and yet you're proposing an allocation on a site that's got peat, which in normal circumstances would be the subjects of all these protective policies. I can fully understand that point, and the answer to it is because all policies, as a matter of law, actually, have to allow of exceptions and in this particular case, even if you treat peat as the subject of the toughest, toughest test in policy, which is the irreplaceable habitats test, um, you would still have a built-in exception, that's to say where the public benefit would clearly outweigh the loss or deterioration of the habitat in question. So, yes, I can well understand someone saying, well, wait a minute, you're wanting to protect peat, but here you're not protecting peat because you want to, you know, 
in inverted commas, build on it. Um, but that's because there is, a greater public, there is a greater public benefit here. That's the overall judgment call. No policy, it would be illegal for any policy to completely ban or prohibit an action. Every policy as a matter of law always has to allow for exceptions to be made. As it happens, national policy here, even if you treat this as an irreplaceable habitat, has a built-in exception. Okay. And obviously, whether or not that balance you've carried out is justified is part of why we're Of course. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, of course. I mean, I'm setting out our position. Um, others will say what they want to say, but doubtless, you know, I'm, I've, I've no doubt at all there'd be, there'd be people who were say, and, you know, one entirely respects their position. And I'm, I do mean that, um, that um, others would say, well, yes, we are, as far as we're concerned, the public benefit does not clearly outweigh the loss or deterioration of the, of the mm. habitat here, Pete. I understand that. We're setting out our overall position. Others will have a different view. Ultimately, of course, you will report to us on the point. Quite. I mean, one of the things I think I was thinking about, I need to think about, was obviously when you have um, policies, which are thematic policies which address these issues, then you've got allocations, is whether it's su sufficiently clear to the decision maker what the allocation means. I mean, you might say states statements are the obvious but sometimes it might well be well if a site is partially affected by peat then you know the, those thematic policies would kick in because you can avoid it or you can yeah whereas it's entirely peat the question becomes well we have got all these protection policies um one assumes that you know one might assume logically assume those things have been taken into account when allocating the site and what that means um, and whether it's clear but that's a slightly different issue it, it is a slightly different issue and there i would say obviously as you know the law requires one to read the plan as a whole the specific would trump the general and um, where you have a, spe a specific allocation, uh, particularly when you know that the allocation has been made on, on the basis of a knowledge of the presence of peat, um, then a specific allocation plainly would, would override the more general or thematic policies when it came to determining a planning application. Um, but, but having said that, it would be a good it certainly would be. It certainly would would be an appropriate way to go about things to ensure that what you want to say about trying to mitigate the impact on peat is set out in the allocation policy. Yes, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's no issue here, is there, in relation to, you say, you've got a recently adopted local plan which has these policies. And you've got a you know a, com a new local plan coming through the process. Um, obviously, there's supposed to be conformity between those. Um, from a well, legal compliance, if we go back to right, any issues as far as you're concerned with that? No, sir, and that's because of the point which I've made about the overall judgment call. So there are protective policies. It just so happens we're talking about a site in Salford, but there are there are protective policies. Um, and um, bear with me for one moment. That's not specific. I've seen that. It's not specifically about people. Is it? Forgive me. Can you just give me one moment? Yeah. If you could find the specific reference on Pete, forgive me. Um, no, th there isn't an issue because we are through places for everyone making that overall judgment call. But there is a particular point about the local plan. Um, and can you just give me one moment? I just want, I just want to check something. Um, You've now got the local Salford local plan as document OD24, and the policies map as OD24A. Um, for your notes, uh, in the local plan at paragraph 22.9, uh, which is immediately before policy GI2, Chat Moss, uh, there is a specific reference in the supporting text to the process of places for everyone, um, which may involve allocating some land at chat moss etc etc and need to have regard to various priorities and the priorities are in the policies um, obviously those priorities are then taken into account by us in making places for everyone or proposing places for everyone by carrying out that overall judgment call about the balance okay thanks um so we understand your position on local policy um, and national local policy, you understand your position on the potential impacts and uh, there are potential impacts that you believe are outweighed. In terms of, um, and the policies we're talking about, they do have reference to 
um, mitigations, I suppose, or, or at least, um, if not mitigation, avoidance or, or minimise harm. So is there, are there, I mean, just in general sense, are, are there things that can be done to uh, address potential, mitigate or mi um, minimise potential harm, or is this, and, and, is the policy, and is the policy sufficient for that, um, or is this something that, you know, if you do, you know, these are the these are the impacts, and you can't do much about it. To be to be frank, it's going to vary from the site specific to the site specific. So, in in relation to this allocation, um, there may well be the opportunity to, through the layout of the of the overall proposal, to to make this position, you know, less less worse than it would be if one if one built houses across the entirety of the site. Obviously, there are open space issues involved here provision of on-site open space, which I've already referred to in my uh, little piece about this specific site. So um, potential to accommodate large areas of open space within the proposed allocation. So there are, there are things which can be taken on, into account um, when you're considering the master planning, the layout of the site, seek to mitigate, mitigate the impact. I don't know whether... Well, there's no, as far as there's no technical solution out there that says, you know, the carbon store, um, uh, credentials can be protected or uh, you know, not, anything of that nature? Not, not as I understand it in relation to, I mean, let's talk about the site specifics allocation mm. of 800 homes. Um, not as I understand it, sir, no. And, and you have Natural England's position and as far as they're concerned, the in, impacts would be irreversible. They say not, they don't think it's possible to mitigate them. Um, that's a point they make generally across the, across the piece about all of the allocations that involve peat, but um, let's treat it as a point made about north of Earlham. Um, we think there are things that can be done to make things, you know, less bad than they would otherwise be. But, you know, I, I've taken the point head on, you know, mm. frankly. Well, I did, did you want to add anything? I mean, I think we probably, we, we, I assume we might come to it again when we look at the criteria. Um, but the approach for north of Earlham, I guess, is um, partly through the master planning to try and focus uh, development on the shallower areas of peat and to use the open space provision to try and um, focus on areas where peat is deeper um, and also on potentially looking at um, in terms of the issue especially on carbon is, uh, is looking at restoration so through the BND looking to focus that on restoration of other areas of, of Mossland and because obviously we recognise this site is degraded in its current use is emitting carbon and will continue to do so. Um, and we have, I mean, there is, I think there are technologies, so there's a recent appeal decision um, nearby which accepts the potential to reuse uh, peat from a development. I don't think we're relying on that, but obviously that's something we would look into um, as one of, the, one of the directions prompted by the criteria, looking to try and minimise carbon and, and maximise sort of the ecological benefits. This uh, point about, um, I think it's, in, in the, the wording of the policy, I think it's here where you've taken something out of the reason justification and you're going to suggest putting it into, see the, yes, um, achieving, this is about biodiversity and again, to be fair, but it, does, it is talking about um, with the priority for any off-site nature conservation enhancements being new moss wood and the restoration of lowland raised bog and complementary habitat. So that's what that's, so, That's not suggesting, though, that you can, or is it suggesting you can fully mitigate what is happening? This, again, this is still in the minimise. I think it's potentially mitigating the impacts okay, overall. Right. On a, on so by restoring, by restoring the, the something that's degraded, impacts. you are, in effect, addressing the, the negative. I, I would say it, it, it addresses that, that, that impact. Right. Okay. On it. it's, it's a mitigation, obviously, we, it'd be, it's a negative in the balance, but there are, as an outcome, it could achieve, obviously, right. we're actually a net, a, a net gain in biodiversity and in terms of, of, of carbon sequestration. This site isn't a carbon sequestering site in terms of it's releasing carbon at the moment, and there's no reason to think it won't but continue to do so. So if we can restore a site, then that will become um, an effective carbon and, um, and, a, and, a, and a more valuable habitat. So is the point that the, this site... So is is degraded. It's emitting carbon. Um, it would be it, it it could be restored, you know, or could it be restored? But if it but without development, it won't be. And, and so actually, development facilitates the restoration of something else. Is that what you? Um, I think I think it probably there are probably 
it is feasible to restore it. I think that's a, quite a significant task. I think in the context of Chat Moss and the restoration challenge and Greater, Manchester, Greater Manchester's ambitions for restoration, it's unlikely. I think that would be, this would be a focus for restoration in that process. Yeah, just to, to add to what Jim, Mr. Shuttleworth has said, um, you know, the site is on the edge of the moss. It's separated by the M62 from the, the bulk of the um, Mossland area. Um, with the small exception of New Mosswood, the focus of bog restoration in Salford is all to the north of the M62. If you were setting out to um, achieve bog restoration, as the council working with many partners is, um, this isn't where you would look. You would be looking elsewhere um, to the heart of the moss. Um, some modelling work that Natural England themselves did a couple of years ago as part of the Deaf Repeat pilot, they had chat moss as a case study, um, and they modelled restoration scenarios of 50% restoration, 75% restoration. Um, so I'll just try and find my notes of... of but basically... Um, in the 50% scenario, um, this site wasn't under restoration at all in that modelling. Um, and the 75% restoration scenario, it was also not under restoration, although they uh, assumed some wetter farming in that scenario. It was only under the maximum restoration scenario where, um, that there was any habitat restoration shown on this site. So it, it's very much towards the bottom of the the pile, if you like, in terms of sites you'd look to to achieve bog restoration. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and, that, and that, whether it's mitigation, whether it's compensation, whether it's some mix or, of them, so that would all be consistent with um, the newly adopted local plans policy GI2 at um, item 5. Um, which you'll find on page 208. Two, policy starts on 207, the relevant bits on page 208 of the local plan. Yes, let me just pull this up. And indeed, below the numbered items, there's a, there's a restoration of lowland raised bog particular paragraph as well. So, so those aspects of the PFE allocation that refer to, and you've picked out the, the biodiversity net gain, I think there are four, there are at least one, two, three, four. There are four other references to similar points in the allocations policy, so it's not as if we've, you know, not mentioned the point. Um, though all of those references would, as it's now eventuated, as it's now become the case, would be consistent with um, recently adopted local plan policy. This idea of this idea of a wider mitigation, if you like, and or compensation. Okay, um, we obviously have moved between the general and the specific. Um, um, Understandably so. What are probably a lot of my other points, I think, are about are very specific about the criteria, which we've already talked about. I think I might, so we can open up the discussion about those general. Um, I mean, it's useful to talk about some of the specifics because it's understanding how it would work in practice, but I think I'd open it up now to talk about some of the more uh, wide points. Inevitably, people want to talk about this side as well. <laughs> Um, and so unless there's so anything else you want to say about in your, be, in your narrative that I have, haven't let you say. Thank you, sir. No, nothing, nothing in relation. No, no, no. You've been very fair to me, as you always are, sir, and your colleagues. Um, so I've made, I've made all the points I wanted to make. Um, a bit like Morecambe and Wise, you know, right notes, wrong order, but it doesn't matter, um, as long as the tune's still legible. Um, so all I did want to just clarify, sir, is um, all I did want to clarify is that, as I understand it, we are discussing in this session these general principles and anything site-specific about North of Earlham. When we get to this afternoon session, or whenever it is, um, on the next allocation, 
this afternoon, I'm sure you said so just now, um, this afternoon's session on the next allocation, um, we won't be reiterating all these general points, but we will if there are any site-specific points about Yeah, I think I'll, we'll just go into, I think then. my intention will be just to go into the site-specific, site, to, to, to address it through the development requirements. Exactly. As, as, right. as, as, yeah, because yeah. the site selection process anyway for employment sites has been very different anyway, so it's not yeah. quite the same. Exactly. Um, all topic. right, so thank you very much. Okay, uh, so yeah, I mean, obviously, we were trying to talk about national policy issues, general points of principle about develop on peat, um, where it's been helpful to refer to the sites to, to give some context. That's been helpful. But um, so, if we start with some, if we can just obviously focus on some of those points that have just been discussed, starting with CPRE. Thank you. Oh no, sorry, I should just say just again. Obviously, we've got the Natural England letter. We've got the comments that have been made by Barbara Keeley MP this morning, um, and with points we've been made before. So yeah. There's a context here which we're fully aware of, but uh, yeah, over to CPRE. Okay, uh, <clears throat> with that in mind, and because there's going to be contributions about local knowledge and the work of Lancashire Wildlife Trust, <clears throat> I'm going to stick in my capacity as a chartered town planner, understanding the overall reading the MPPF as a whole and understanding in terms of exceptional circumstances, whether there's actually the need for the houses. Obviously, before Christmas, we articulated that the housing need is overinflated. Um, there's also too much uh, employment requirements being set out in the plan. So overall, we think there's an issue in terms of the amount of development being planned for and the fact that there's been an under-recording of brownfield sites that exist across the geography of Greater Manchester. So. In terms of the need, and therefore that cuts across the value and the weight you would give to benefits. Um, as far as we're concerned, this chat moss has international and nationally, um, nas sorry, both international and national significance, and it is a massive, irreplaceable resource. We have issues in terms of natural capital. There is a massive opportunity cost. Once it's gone, it is gone. And in accordance with the information that has been provided by Natural England and colleagues in a moment, uh, I would suggest you attribute value correctly. So the basket of harms, it's the harms of the peat and the rarity of the biodiversity it supports. It's um, impacts of carbon sink, impacts of the hydrology. And um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ard. Uh, thank you, sir. We have been allocated four seats, two uh, front and two hot seats, because we each specialise in something different, so we're, we're pleased to be able to speak to you. Um, the first thing I want to say is that uh, site selection. We were invo heavily involved uh, with, along with the team, uh, at the Salford Local Plan stage, and at that inspection, we were not allowed to talk about site-specific allocations of JPA 28 and 29, which means that they have gone through to uh, PFE, and this is the first time through this that we've been able to actually speak specifically about the allocations. We've had no recourse during the local plan stage. No, that, that's because that, yeah, yes. We, um, because so the, 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 lo yeah, the local plan didn't include these sites, so this is the only place you could have had that discussion. So They were actually on the local plan, but they were so they were, we were told we couldn't speak to them. Oh. They, they were shown... Anyway, they, the, they, yeah, so well, that, that, so that was one of our concerns. Today is the... the, the being the allocated, was proposed date. to be allocating this plan, yes. so this is the right time to speak about this it. This is the right time to speak about it, and of course that's why we're trying to speak as well as we can. Um, Pete Depth is in the, in the site to JPA 28, is not even and is very different in a very short space of time. Uh, the site um, investigations have been, in our opinion, very poor. In a, a, the whole site had a very few boreholes and they were towards the edge of the site, not in the centre. And that meant that it gave an unrealistic uh, reflection of what the site actually consisted of. And we're concerned that the um, premise of a mixed bag of peat depths is not the actual truth. And that there are 
further, further investigations to be done. Uh, I'd like to pass over to my colleague now. Okay. Thank you. Um, just to give a little bit more elaboration on what uh, Francis has just said about the depths of peat, it was understated by um, the opener. Um, he said the depths of 0 0.2 to 4.95 metres. The ball report carried out by Urban Vision Partnership in September 2020 was much greater than 0.2 of a metre. That's basically a spade. It ranged, uh, I'll, I'll give you a quote from it, in the eastern half of the site towards Hasley Road, all borehole reports and survey de data show a rising depth of peat from the north to the south across the site. Whilst there are insufficient data points to provide an accurate profile, it is reasonable to assume peat in this area ranges from 2.3 metres along the south of the site through to 5.9 metres below ground level in the centre section reducing, the slightly, reducing slightly towards the north. Um, so it's a complete understatement. When you look at the ball report, and I don't know what information the right honourable gentleman has been looking at, is understated the depth of the peat. And moreover, to emphasise what Francis has just said, it was just a sort of periphery of the area rather than the central area where you would get a true reflection of the depth of the peat. So that's one point. Um, he talked about national uh, planning framework not referring to peat. I don't think it really needs to. Uh, just quote, planning for climate change. Plans should take a proactive approach to mitigate and adapt to climate change, taking into account the long-term implications of flood risk, coastal change, water supply, biodiversity and landscapes, and the risk of overheating from rising temperatures. So the planning framework doesn't have to refer, refer to specific uh, types of land, etc. It gives a, a generality which would include peat, there's been a greater recognition over the last 10 and 20 years, the importance of peat. Um, so, in, in fact, uh, the PFE also recognises the importance of peat as um, a carbon sink. The reference that um, this land is incredibly sustainable land for housing uh, I'm not too sure what the basis of that is, uh, particularly bearing in mind what I've just made uh, a statement of. Now, it was stated um, Salford recognised the impact of peat, and yet they are taking 30 hectares of land, when in actual fact, when you took an average density of housing, which is probably 50 you'd only need to take half of that. So there seems to be a land grab. The other point that um, CPRA made is that due to the fact that Salford have made errors in their calculations and uh, underassessed the number of people per house in housing, they don't need to take Greenbelt land. That's very evident. The population growth is in the document says 31,000. When you look at the figures and looking at our, um, ONS um, information, 81% of the development is going to be apartments, 19% is going to be houses, and it talks about the number of proposed dwellings is 26,528. What Salford has done is taken the 26528 and multiplied I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, we, we obviously, yeah, uh, I, I CPRA have, have raised this, we've, we've raised it before, so I, I understand the point about okay. that. Okay, well, if you've got that, that's fine. Uh, we, we've, we've got it many times. I apologise. So, yeah. right. okay. well, if you weren't just, here before, you wouldn't say that, but obviously um, CPRA did just make that point, so um, that's, that's fine. Is, is, um, I've just... Maybe, yeah, I mean... Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I just refer to the quote that said this is for the public good? I am that public. I live in Salford. I represent the wildlife of Salford. I represent the area.
from the stuff that I put out to people, they've recognised the worth and the value of this Mosulin, particularly since lockdown. Lockdown has made people realise we have something here that is the equivalent of a national nature park. It still produces food and it produces fresh air and it sustains wildlife. In round about the end of uh, round about 2000, there was permission given for peat extraction to take place on Little Walden Moss and Chat Moss. This is an area, envisages this area being full of wildlife. This is a complete area, trees, uh, peat and the like, all the insects and all the birds. Now, if I just sweep this desk clear, absolutely clear, so all you see is a desk, that's what happened. In 2012, the Wildlife Trust came along and bought this land and started to restore it. Right, here's the two sites. This site here is still owned by Peel. It's actually overrun with uh, motorbikes. So is this, is this the site we're talking about? No, 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 this, this, is, this is Chat Moss, the area. Oh, right, and what okay. I'm trying to demonstrate is the fact that the worth of peat. This is the bare area, still bare after 2012. This is what the Wildlife Trust have done to this area. This peat has got a great value to us all. Can I bring in the wildlife? I, I come across on this mosslin, or is that not part of this? Um, we were talking generally about the well, um, wildlife. Yeah, is part of the is part of the equation. Okay, um, so yeah. biodiversity net gain. We talk about new moss wood. New moss wood will not support lapwing. It will not support yellow wagtails. These are red data birds. The Birds of Conservation Concern tells us which birds are in the most danger and farmland birds are in the greatest danger. We're talking about farmland here where they wish to push these houses. Grey partridge, curlew. Curlew will probably disappear from the British landscape for the next 10 years if we don't do something about it. A skylark, listen to a skylark singing above that land, that will be lost. Red-winged winter visitors will be lost. Sedge warblers have now started to come in onto our, our mosslins because of the restoration. They'll be lost. Will it sit? One of the rarest tit mice in the country. Stronghold on the mosslins, they'll be swept away. There'll be no mitigation. You cannot put these birds of a farmland onto a park or a woodland. It's not their, it's not their way of life. And their way of life needs this open landscape. And this open landscape is of great value to us all. And I think we should learn from the past. We destroyed areas of the peatland that was full of wildlife. And now we're here again. Salford County is here again, revisiting destroying more wildlife. Now, the fortunate thing is about the peat extraction that occurred on the Little Walden Moss site is the fact that it wasn't concreted over. So somebody finally realised that this, the government realised that this is not a good idea doing this damage to peat. So they, the, the wildlife trust were able to purchase it and now nature's coming back. If this land, the proposed site, is concreted over, you'll never ever regain that. And in future generations, they will come back to Sulphur County and say, why did you destroy that which is so important to us locally, nationally and internationally? And this is why I can't understand why these people are coming out here and saying, let's just build on this peatland. It is of great value and we must value it. Understood. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We've already had two representatives from our say, if you're going to say something, I mean, well, hot desking is one made. thing, but there's another thing just to be keep going around in circles with different points your organisation wants to make. Is it a different point? It, it is. It, it was specifically about the mitigation, um, mostly being around the Little Walden Moss area. It's not something that colleagues have picked up on, if okay. that's okay to make. Uh, uh, the point's been made around um, you, you can't mitigate against building on peat, but very specifically, um, the, the advancements on Little Walden Moss in terms of restoration are brilliant. I, I, I accept that. Uh, the, my primary concern in, in relying on this area of the Mossland to, to mitigate around development on the, where, where people live um, is that it's two miles away. People can't access it. So there's a point about mitigating for wildlife, but also in terms of access for, for local residents. Thank you. Okay. Okay, focusing very much on specific, that's fine. Uh, wildlife trusts. Uh, I'll start with a few generalities and then hand over to my colleague for specificities. Uh, what, a point of clarification fr from you, if you would. Uh, there has been a development in national policy last week that relates to peatland uh, when the uh, government's uh, environment Im improvement plan for England was finally published 
is this an appropriate place just to quote a sentence from it? Yes. We would have done. If you, yes. <laughs> uh, GM say we'll have an opportunity to, to consider whether the, the yeah. weight we should be giving that. But yeah, by all means. Yeah. Uh, it says degraded lowland peat accounts for 3% of England's overall greenhouse gas emissions. Reducing these emissions by rewetting our agricultural peat soils is essential to meeting legally binding net zero targets. We are committed to halting the degradation of our lowland peat soils, which causes such significant harm to the environment. Uh, we're awaiting the actual action plan for delivery. So, can you just, just for the, so James, he can pick up what, what, where that comes from again? And, and it a page comes from reference. the environmental, sorry, the Environment Improvement Plan for England 2023, released on the 9th of February, and the sentence is from page 198. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, to go to the broader term of whether uh, peat is an irreplaceable habitat. You, sorry, can you just perhaps oh, you, uh, you bring sorry, your microphone a little bit close? Thank you. To go to the broader point of whether peat is an irreplaceable habitat, uh, given it's in an active lowland raised bog, accumulates at a rate of about one millimetre a year, you can see that it's not replaceable on any human time scale. So I, I don't think that's a question. Uh, I think that's probably it for broad things. I'll, okay. I'll hand over to Thanks. Martin. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'd just like to uh, go over, I think, three points that GMCA raised. Uh, one was that there had been an overestimation of the effects on the peat uh, from the development. I've been restoring bogs for over 20 years. Um, I still get confused by how peat works. Um, you do something that you think is going to work, it doesn't, and you stand there scratching your head. Um, the reason, for, I mean, peat, peat bogs are unique in many ways. But one of the reasons they are unique is that the way the water moves through the peat mass, it is very unpredictable. Um, and the secret lies usually in the interface between the peat and the underlying mineral soil. You can get rivers flowing underground through that interface. Now, we've, we've been told that uh, the development is going to be on shallow peat at the edge of the moss. If you sever that interface at any point on the peat mass, you can get water flowing off like a waterfall. So you cannot overestimate the damage that this could do to the peat. The second point, um, Dave has just kind of mentioned the irreplaceable habitat bit. I was going to say, yes, of course it's irreplaceable. You try and put peat into the BNG metric, it red flags it as irreplaceable. So, you know, kind of the argument that it isn't irreplaceable is nonsensical. The point on whether the land currently can be restored or not. This isn't theoretical anymore. The, the Wildlife Trust has done this. We're doing it in Chat Moss. We've done it on other sites. We've got peat vegetation established within five years on sites similar to this. So they can be restored. Uh, they are in irreplaceable habitat and they should be viewed as Annex 1. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very helpful. And uh, I guess Peel, but you'll be looking at it from the, some of the more general aspects. Thank you. Yeah, so trying to respect the integrity of how this session is working. If we just deal with the policy aspects and the, um, the generality, if you like, of those that are included in PSC, when we have our session, we'll deal with the specifics of our site, if I'm understanding that correctly. Okay, so I'll just introduce, well, the team will introduce itself in terms of um, the people we've got looking at this. Um, first of all, Francis. Yes, I'm Fran Francis Hesketh, um, Director of TEP, engaged on ecological matters for Peel. 
Good, um, and other issues we'll deal with in, in due course. I just wanted to start by, um, the first point is to echo entirely everything that Mr. Kikowski has said. Uh, that is, um, in it, if I may say so, an entirely accurate um, summation of where, where we are, uh, and quite rightly highlights the significance of um, Natural England's letter, because what they're saying is, we hope something will change in the future, um, but that hasn't happened, and you have to deal with the position now. If it changes, obviously, you'll deal with it in, in that context. Crucially there, they're suggesting, well, they're making representations to um, change the MPPF, national policy, but the, the current changes, which are the subject of consultation, uh, just in case anybody missed it, are primarily focused on uh, housing numbers to deal with the 59 rebel MPs who want advisory housing targets. So that's what those are focused on. There are some wider issues about beauty and design and so on, but those changes are um, not inviting uh, or ha have in fact not even consulted on the concept of changing the definition of irreplaceable habitats to include lowland, um, lowland bog. So um, it wouldn't be appropriate, in fact, for the government to seek to do that when they've made clear through the track changes that those are the changes that they're consulting on. And even when you go to the consultation document about the wider changes to the MPPF, that isn't something suggested in there either. So um, there is actually no remit at the moment for any proposed changes this, this year. That doesn't mean, of course, that on the wider changes, they couldn't change that uh, once they conduct another consultation exercise, but it's certainly not been identified at the moment as one of the issues. So this could be some significant time away tied into other legislative changes um, and so on. The, the next point to make is you've asked the, the question, uh, the understandable question in relation to the MPPF and paragraph 180C and you asked Melinda friend the question about irreplaceable habitats and is that a closed list? And obviously, as he rightly said, it isn't a closed list. Irreplaceable habitat is defined in um, the glossary to the MPPF, um, as you'll be aware, <clears throat> and that does refer, refer to blanket bog. But just for the avoidance of doubt, if you don't know your bogs, uh, a blanket bog is um, uh, an upland peat bog. And we are not talking about that here. So the issue of specific types of peat bog that are considered to be irreplaceable is identified in the MPPF, but it isn't the ones that PSE is concerned with. And as any lawyer will tell you, when something is specifically identified and, and therefore in that category and something is excluded, then you can certainly draw the inference that it's not meant to be there because a conscious decision has been made to identify that uh, part of that category. So the upland bog is in there, lowland bog is not. And there are real practical difficulties with, with doing that, actually, that would need to be grappled with by the government and DEFRA and so on, because a lot of lowland uh, bog is used for agriculture, and as a consequence of which there would be significant implications in putting that into that category even though, as Malona Friend says, even if it were to go into that category at some stage, in some stage of consultation in the MPPF, it wouldn't, in effect, stop um, the, the uh, ability to allocate these sites for housing or for employment. And if you read the um, England uh, Peat Action Plan, you'll see that there are some rather more pressing concerns, like uh, so many gardeners are continuing to use peat in their gardens, although it was voluntarily meant to end in 2020. Uh, professional agricultural services are able to continue to use peat until 2030. That's actually extracting it and using it in that way. So there are some very pressing issues about extraction, which are, you know, however important it is to, to have nice looking roses, that doesn't come close to the objectives of addressing housing need, employment need, and so on. So, um, I mean, I, I have been involved in appeals where a shortfall in the five-year land supply has been enough to meet the public interest test. 
So we are a long way removed from any suggestion that these important developments would somehow fall foul, even of a higher test, if that comes in, and lowland peat bog, despite all the difficulties, is included in that. Um, and so for all the reasons uh, that I echo with my learned friend, if I may say so, we are a long way removed from you needing to be concerned about that now, and only if it comes up in the currency of your reporting period would that need to be addressed. And so whilst, of course, it's important and people are very attached to that procedurally, we are not at that point or anywhere close to that point. And it is, as he says, telling that Natural England have not even attended this session to explain their aspirations. Um, if they really thought it was important, they would have done so. They recognise the difficulty of the position in trying to suggest it is um, somehow an impediment to PSE. I'll now turn to, um, to Francis, if I may, to just explain um, about what sort of peat bog we are talking about here, because that is of some significance. Okay. Thank you, yes. Um, I'm primarily, well, I am talking about PSC rather than the North of Ireland allocation, which I don't have any knowledge of. The, um, but in broad terms, so I feel like there's three. Is it, better, is it better to wait then? It's, it's a, no, no, I think what, what's being said is we're not going to talk about the specifics of our site. Okay. We're talking about the status of peat in PSC generally rather than the specifics of our site. Oh, uh, T presumably is Port Salford Port extension. Salford extension. Yeah, yeah, I think sorry, you, you think he might have said PFE, I think. But it's, yeah, yeah. It's the F in the... Yeah, my fault with the acronyms. I, it's when you want to hear it, so... Um, I think we'd, we'll, we'll pick that up later then, I think. OK, yeah. all right. But thank you. Uh, wildlife Trust, is that a new point, or is that an old... I, I, what I want to obviously try and get as much yeah. sourced as possible before we go back to GMCA. Um, it's just a clarification of a, a logical error. Uh, the list of uh, irreplaceable habitats in the glossary of uh, MPPF is not an exhaustive one. It's just an illustrative one. Yeah, the, the word include, I think, is, is there. Um, I'm sure there's been many, many debates about what that means. Um, but uh, it means what it says. It means what you say. Well, yeah. To my mind, I guess it does. You've got okay. You've got the um, 180C, which has such as, and then glossary terms, which says include either of those. Either of those closed lists, as far as you're concerned. I'm working on the basis that they're EGs in both instances rather than IEs. Oh, that, that's because I'm I'm taking this head on. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not seeking to, you know. No to wriggle if you like i'm saying that yes let's take it head on and you know i've done that but we, um if everyone else is finished i don't uh, uh, something else just come up but please i'm okay. um, it's a new point please not a reiteration of anything you want to say before you've just put your sign up yes so do you want to make your point i want to make my point that comments have been made about natural England. all i can say that natural England's commitment to the chat moss is there just was a vast acreage of the mosslands in order to bring it back to, into restoration so they are very much committed to saving this kind of landscape. Yeah, and I think, obviously, opinion. their letter to us is, is clear what their views are. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'll turn it over to the GMCA then. Thank you. Sorry, quite a lot of points. But, well, um, well, there are, but, I mean, I, to be frank, I, I think there are just very few that I need to come back on. I mean, there's the overarching point about the weighing scales and the nature of the exercise. So I'll just say see above in relation to that, the, the footnote 63 test okay there was one point i don't know if you were, you were including that in that mm. point but there was one point about the evidence um base yes. for for this and whether that's something oh. you were going to pick up on it, it was one of yeah. the points i was going to pick up on yes so and in fact it was the first point i was going to pick up on so as far as we're concerned in terms of plan making we have a sufficient evidence base to enable us to understand the issue in relation to this this allocation um there was reference to the information which i gave um, in relation to the depth of peat on this particular site as having been inaccurate. And can I just reassure you that um, the information I gave, that's at range from 0.2 of a metre to 4.95 metres, is correct for this allocation as it now is, bearing in mind that there was obviously information about wider and more extensive areas of land over the over the process of over the process of the evolution of the plan, so I've, I've you know I've 
it's taking my information from information that's been provided to me. Obviously, I haven't gone out and done these boreholes, um, and I've had that double checked. So that's that's our position. I mean, others might say that's wrong, but that's that's our position. And sorry to interrupt you. Um, is that the position that presumably? If, any site relating to peat, you, as far as you're concerned, a bit like we've had the question about biodiversity in general terms, you're, you're content that you've oh, got yes. sufficient evidence to yes. allocate, justify allocation yes. of the plan. Uh, yes, site. that was a, the first point I made Sorry, before I... No, no, no problem at all. Just, just to be crystal clear, yes, in terms of the, you know, higher level nature of the assessment which goes into plan making, we, as far as we are concerned, we are content that we have a proportionate evidence base in order to move forward, you know, and to, to have this debate and to consider the issues. So, based on proportionate evidence, paragraph 35 of the framework. Um, and I've clarified the position on depths. Um, as for the specific reference that was made to the recently issued environmental improvement plan, again, so you're, you might indicate to us whether you'd like that ad added to the examination library, even the relevant extract of cover page and page 198, as was very helpfully drawn to attention by the Wildlife Trust. Um, so just to reiterate the point, I mean, in, in fairness, the Wildlife Trust did read the relevant passage, but just to enable the flow of my point, um, the government advises that degraded lowland peat accounts for 3% of England's overall greenhouse gas emissions, and reducing these emissions by re-wetting our ag agricultural peat soils is essential to meeting legally binding net zero targets, committed to halting the degradation of our lowland peat soils, etc. And then we're told at the bottom of the page that there's going to be an update on next steps in due course. <laughs> and um, so with that in mind, with that theme in mind, I'll just draw you back to what I said at the outset, and was, which was reiterated to my left, um, that the peat on this site is degraded from years of drainage and agricultural activity. It has, has and is emitting carbon, and that would continue if the site is left undeveloped in its agricultural use. In other words, to be frank, I mean, if one's being sensible about this, what we're really talking about here on the negative side of the equation really is the is a lost opportunity to halt that degradation, which is, you know, in place now, and to re-wet, in other words, to seek to, you know, restore. So this isn't really, I mean, that's, the, I think that really is the nature of the point that we're dealing with here. That's the negative here. Um, and I've made my broader point that as far as we're concerned, the public benefit here clearly outweighs the loss or deterioration of the habitat, and including that lost opportunity, if you like. Um, so that's what I wanted to say, sir, in brief summary. It all comes back to the overall weighing process that we, we are mandated to, to take if one treats this as an irreplaceable habitat, and I'm perfectly content for the sake of the argument to treat it in that way, simply because it gives us a framework for the consideration of the of the points. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so is this a new, a new point, a response? It's, 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 dis the it's disputed where the learning gentleman gets his information from, because I'm only aware of one borehole report that's been taken on that moss where the proposed development is going. And point two is, is less than a spade. It's okay. eight inches. I think on that... You, you, but but you, I, I just don't know where he's getting his information on. This is the only information that I know has been published in respect of the depth of peat. So I dispute the information that you've provided. Uh, uh, and fine, that, that's, that's what I need to know. Okay. I think you dispute that. I've got the information. The information that's before me is before me. I can obviously check that as I um, reflect on these things and I, see. I, I've worked on the moss, and I know yeah. point two is totally unrealistic. Okay, understood. Okay. Um, just to give you the reference. Yes, the document, you, yeah, just yeah. A bit. So the document from which we're drawing our information is 10.07.37 and 0 .38. One is the full report and the other is the summary of it. And there is a, there's a map that shows or a figure that shows the boreholes and the depths okay. set out in a table underneath the figure. Okay, well, on that, I, I can reflect on that I can you know I've got that information now I can look at that and if I have any further questions or concerns absolutely I can uh, come back to you under an action point yeah, okay. all we're doing is reading from one of the documents in the library okay. yeah okay thank you for that um, very useful I'm sure it won't be the end of this discussion we've got other sites which are
covered by this issue. Yeah. Um, we've got criterion in the policy. We might not need to touch on this in much detail, but we, we, sure. we, it won't be the end of the, the discussion on this, I'm not sure. The end of Pete's so we'll move on, though, to, I think, the general development requirements. One thing I forgot to mention right at the start, my apologies, is that the Sorry. GMCA have submitted um, last week a document outlining what they consider the changes they wish to make to the, to the plan and to the policy. Um, I think just for ease, what we've tended to do is use this as our guide. So I'm going to go through each criterion in turn, uh, picking up any points or issues that people might have. Oh, sorry. You've, you've left without making a point. Are you happy? You've, 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 good, OK. Well, I always say, are you happy? <laughs> Knowing full well, probably you're not happy. Intense, but con yeah, you. that you. OK, good. Thank you. OK, thank you. I need to catch myself on that. Um, so we're going to go through the, the, the policy as it stands, as it um, obviously both in the submitted plan and uh, the suggested changes, picking up the suggested changes as we go and any points anyone GMCA wishes to make. GMCA 55. And this is GMCA 55. Thank so. you. Um, thank you. Um, so, get to my questions. So we start off, the policy refers to um, obviously a bit of location and then uh, capacity for around 800 dwellings and associated social and community uses um, before moving into the uh, uh, requirements. Um, we've talked a little bit about the scale already. Um, again, obviously you're content that 800 dwellings is um, achievable and uh, desirable on the site in terms of densities and any, any shall we say, non-peat related impacts? We are, yes. I don't know whether you want... The short answer to that is yes. If you'd like us to elaborate, we can, but yes. Well, there are issues around, I suppose, the why, you know, the, the approach to density and so you may as well pick up some of these points now if there is anything you want to say. Okay, thank you. Um, so, as you'll be aware, this, the site area is... Um, the, the allocation area is 30 hectares and additional seven hectares of land um, to be removed from the green belt, as we've, as we've already discussed. I think probably Ard raised it earlier about uh, land grab exceptionally low density, I think was probably the way it's phrased, and I think that was in the representations, I think, referring to the densities across the site only being 21 dwellings per hectare. But looking at that, I think what they've done is looked at the, you know, the, the allocation and the additional land to be removed, removed from the green belt. So taking 800 dwellings and then, you know, divided that by 37 hectares to get to a gross density of 21. And so clearly the densities, you know, within PFE are, are, are net densities. So once you start taking into account um, actual built development on the site, which, there's no master plan, but as part of assumptions for the, the kind of build costs uh, and the viability work, we made certain assumptions around that. And so the assumptions around that is about 20 hectares of the site would actually have, um, you know, built housing development on. So if you were to look at that, um, that 20 um, hectare net developable area, um, the density is 40 dwellings per hectare across the site. And so we think um, around three hectares of the site will be, you know, high density houses near, near the station, and then 17 hectares at around 35 dwellings per hectare. So that's kind of that gets you to the overall average density across of 40. And is that sort of broadly consistent with JPH4? Yes, so yep. JPH4 talks about in, in that location and the proximity to the train station, 70 drones per hectare, which is what we've assumed, and then the 35 drones per hectare as you'd move away from the station. Okay. Um, just for those who haven't been here before, what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to go, sort of go through the criteria um, I will keep looking up to see if you've got any points you want to make, but um, just to keep things moving, I'm not going to sort of necessarily say every time any points you want to make, any points you want to make. So uh, I'll, I'll announce when we're moving on, but if there's something you want to say about scale or density now, or that you've not already said, then now would be the time to say it. No? Okay. So move on then to criterion one, um, which is about master planning. Um, we, we talked about, the, this, this is a basic, and I'm sorry, the other, the other thing for people who weren't here yesterday, obviously a lot of these criteria are in all of the policies for Salford and therefore 
we've, we've talked about some of these yesterday. You weren't here, you might not have seen it, but you know, we may go over all ground, but um, the, the change here is to remove reference to SPD and to insert some text about um, how a master plan would be uh, approved and uh, in engagement and so on. Um, just for the benefit of the people who went here, Stephen, to pick them up. Yes, for the benefit of those who, who rather not hear or, and or haven't looked at, listened to what the YouTube uh, recording. The position is that item number one, the changes here are to bring um, the criterion into line with the recently adopted local plan, which in relation to master plans has an approach which is um, either word for word or very similar to the, the, the additional sentence um, at the end of item one. And we discussed whether or not that would be absolutely necessary or not. Absolutely, so. yeah. And in, in a way, and I, I totally understand that, you know, we, we, we look at these points again because people may understand yeah. me very well not being a party to or listen to our discussion yesterday. But yes, I mean, I, it's all as above, all as yesterday. Um, that's why it's there. And you will report back to us in due course, obviously, as to whether you think um, in order to make the plan sound, it should come out because we've got a local plan in this instance, which says an awful lot about master plans. <laughs> There's an awful lot more of them than the, this, this bit that's been added at the end of mm. item number one. And in fact, in this case, you've got item number two in this policy also talks about, um, well, it's, it's, I think sort of merge, one and two emerge in some of the other sites. I think it's effectively talking about master plan and a phasing delivery structure. This is a site where, um, a phasing delivery strategy would be needed. So that's our that's our that's our position, sir. And and I take your point that one could one could um, indicate one could have the phasing delivery strategy in item number one. Um, I'm not sure that it's you know w whether it's a soundness point or not. I'm, I'm, you know, does one need to repeat the effective delivery of the full master plan framework? I mean that would be the that would be the whole point of the phasing and delivery strategy in any event. So, you know. I'll leave it with you, sir. As to I mean, the, the we've been Criterion 2 wordy. does at least point out, mm. it does make it specific about transport, green and social infrastructure, yeah. housing, planning. So it's, it's giving that a little bit more it's guidance, it's a more, sort of yes, general yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was just um, given there's so many items of transport infrastructure identified as necessary in Annex D, the phasing probably is important insofar as when those items need to be, come forward. Thank you. So you're, you're, I think it's a sensible addition. I think there needs to be a reference to phasing, whether it, it can go in the same sentence as master planning, but there needs to be breaks at which, i.e., uh, no more than however many houses mm. can be occupied before certain items yeah. are... Built. And I think when you cross-refer to D1, if the, if the, ref, if the cross-refer is to D1, that's what I think D1 pretty much says, isn't it? I think it's what, you yeah. know, when, when things will be built and paid for. Yeah. So. There are, so I've just been pointed out to my left that a particular reason for this here is also there are a number of landowners involved here and we you want to ensure across the entire allocation that um, we do have, you know, not just the houses, in other words, you know, there is an, an overall delivery of, of the wider infrastructure, social and otherwise. Okay, uh, as I criterion three is about densities. I think we've covered that. Um, sorry, is, is your, no, thank you. No. Uh, affordable, sorry, uh, criterion three. Criterion four is about four. affordable housing. Yes. So, so in this case, we, we move from what was yesterday was 50% yes. um, with some um, offsite potentially. Uh, today's 25%. Is it 25% due to the specific viability of this scheme, or is it that's what the Salford Local Plan Record require? It's a, it's the specifics of this of this site. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, the local plan um, doesn't have green belt in any of its value areas, and so as this is a green belt site, at, you know, as things stand, it's not covered by a value area, so you won't be able to lift the table directly from the local plan and plop it onto this site. Um, but so this is a specific point about this about this site. So slight another slight quirk to this policy. Um, and it says twenty five percent and substantially more if other funding becomes available. 
to allow for this. Is, is that something which, I mean, because from a, from a decision making come um, how you require that, right? You know, because if a developer isn't required as a matter of course to submit, obviously the way I would read this, and not, not, notwithstanding I haven't studied the solved local land policy, if an application came in for 25% and all the things being equal, that would meet the policy requirement. There's no, there's no requirement to submit a viability assessment to say oh, we can do more, or is there? And would that actually be justified? I'll say something in a moment, but we'll just hear from Mr Shuttleworth first. <coughs> no, in terms of the policy, 25% would meet the policy requirements. Obviously, there are opportunities to attract funding to provide um, more affordable housing. I think our expectation is that we believe the site is able to deliver 25% through the planning mechanisms. If funding could be attracted, we'd expect it to achieve over that figure. But how would you, how would you, how, uh, me mechanically, how would you say to a developer, well, you've provided 25%, um, if they provide everything that they're required to provide, they don't have to put in a viability assessment to prove that they can do more. So how are you going to actually make, make them do it? I mean, I'm thinking I mean, here we, about we, effectiveness. We have a situation where, if, where public funding was, was attracted to the site, we'd expect to achieve above. The, the, because obviously you could attract these public funding to, to achieve the policy, but we think that actually the site is, is viable to achieve the, the policy. But you wouldn't and be able to require the developer to do it. Oh, no, no, no. But I think it's an acknowledgement that if you did attract public funding, it... Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm going I'm to let me intervene here then. <laughs> so, because unless, I mean, unless you actually seek to force an, a, a, a developer to seek public funding to achieve more, then obviously this is aspirational. So the way I would read this, to be quite straightforward about this, is the policy is at least 25%. So if you do 25%, you meet the policy. Um, if more funding, if pub funding was available, so that you know a, a particular applicant put forward, I don't know, 30%, and you would treat the extra 5% as a planning benefit. You would treat yeah. it as a as another reason for allowing the application. It would be a material consideration on the plus side of the equation. It's just, we, we wouldn't object to. Yeah, if, you want to put, if you want to put some more in, we not wouldn't only object would we to not it. Object, no, and we, who would? But, um, yeah, we would um, treat it as a benefit. We would yeah. treat it as a benefit. I, I think that wording is, is, is difficult. I think it needs to be looked at, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> but I, I take your point. It, it, at most, it's, it looks to me as if it's a supporting text point, to be honest. Mm. And um, I think the other issue about, obviously, about the, the, the policy includes the split. Um, we, we discussed that yesterday. And I think I need to consider that Comes in the context of the Salford Local Plan and what that says, and then whether it's a needed or whatever. Yeah. That's right. And, and um, if you were to decide it should come out of item four, then obviously we would need to specifically cross refer to um, in accordance with the local plan policy requirements. And so, just one final, I suppose it's coming back to. It's occurred to me the, the twenty five percent argument. Obviously, all the sites, the two other sites in Salford, have fifty percent. There's the twenty when you've again done your planning balance argument, exactly. and you've considered the fact that it's it's not a, not necessarily providing as the same proportion of the sites, and twenty five percent is you know you're still considered to be sufficiently beneficial to help. It so is like it's on your positive side of the scale. It is, I mean, and obviously, I think at the moment the fullest range so far of the sites that we've had in terms of potential affordable housing has been. You know, 5%, I think, is the lowest, and order of magnitude, 50% has been the highest. So, um, so you know, in in the Greater Manchester, or, or the nine of the ten constituent elements of Greater Manchester context, um, yes, at least 25%, or 25%, if you want to be very specific, is a, is a good contribution to affordable housing. And that's, anyway, in the, in the weighing scales, we've looked at it obviously on the basis of the way the policy is put, which is 25%. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ard. Um, it, I think it states a minimum of 25%. So I understand that affordable housing has got to be contributed by the developer itself. Now, when you look at this site, uh, it's in uh, an area where the foundations are going to be quite deep, you're going to need it piled, an expensive solution, you're going to need for rough foundations. Uh, this area has not got a high um, value in terms of um, property. Uh, so unlike South Manchester where you'll get high values, the, bulk the build costs uh, above substructure will be the same in this area as in South Manchester. But unfortunately, the recovery in terms of your value will be at least half, if not a third of that. 
So in terms of affordable contribution by a developer, I think it's totally unrealistic and no affordable housing will be contributed by developers because of that fact. Okay, thank you. Um, there'll be a general, I mean, useful point to make, in the show, there'll be a general but, but a bit on, uh, session, section on viability. So we'll pick some of those. No, no, it's fine, because I think it says context there, because obviously we are, the, what makes a site viable, not viable. I mean, to be fair, there are issues about, again, uh, getting back into the, the peat issue, I think, about what that means. And I, I could have picked it up um, in the general discussion. I could pick it up under the, the criteria. And I could pick it up under the viability. It'll, it'll get picked up. Um, that's the main thing. But um, oh, uh, Sorry. Uh, again, um, fine, but you know, it's different points, please. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, so you've raised the point around the 25% um, percent plus affordability point. Um, very specifically, the, the City Council, in terms of the consultation engagement with local people, has really laboured on the point that local people can expect huge amounts of affordable housing that will meet the aspirations uh, of some local people. Uh, respectfully, I, I think it's a little bit more than a, a wording change when the basis for which a lot of local people have objected or not objected or supported this plan has been based on um, huge numbers of aff affordable housing beyond that 25% um, percent point. So uh, to, to me, it, it, it's very considerable, really, in terms of the, the weight of the, the, that objection. OK, I think I understand the point. Uh, you're, you're suggesting, then, that the, 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 the bit that talks about, and, and you know, paraphrasing, and more, if possible, that's, that's key to your... It, it, it is, and... Public meetings have, of course, as you would expect, been arranged, and the City Council has represented itself there, um, promising, like a Matilda's dad car salesman, that it's going to be fantastic with tons of affordable housing. So right. in terms of the perception locally, it's not a 25% minimum. I'm not, it, I don't, I don't understand the reference to Matilda's dad car salesman. That's <laughs> probably, is that saying something about my age? Maybe or? some homework for you. I don't think <laughs> <laughs> it may be humorous, but I don't think it's meant to be complimentary, and perhaps we could be, right. perhaps we could be more respectful of each okay. other. Right, okay. Um, okay, I understand. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm considering the policies read, and whatever has been said in public engagement meetings is not for me. Um, Okay, thank you. Um, I'm moving on then, there's no other point, unless you want to come back on any of those points. There's a viability point, we're going to come to viability later. I mean, rest assured there are abnormals have been included in this. Okay, so criterion five, we are at the uh, minimise the loss of the carbon storage function of peat. Um, you suggested removing the phrase undertake a hydro hydrological assessment in order to avoid any adverse impacts, but that effectively leaves avoid any adverse impacts um, on the hydrology of the chat moss. Not um, quite. No, no, no. That's the whole point. And so, I mean, so it's because... So, minim sorry, beg your pardon. Minimise exactly. any adverse impacts. That's on the, the whole yes, point. Big, it, was, yeah. it was a bit of, to be honest, it didn't really quite make sense before. So, mm. um, so it's to minimise loss of carbon storage function and any adverse impacts on hydrology. So, you know, that's given that there will be impacts, that's the best that, we, you know, that's the best that we can, we can do, if you like, in, the, in this criterion. None the worse for that. Okay, and I think we've obviously understand that that's your position. There will be impacts. There will be. It'll be it's difficult to to completely uh, mitigate them, if, if not possible, etc. So we've had all that discussion. Um, we've had that discussion. So I think if we can, if it's the wording of this particular bit of exactly. the policy, not going back over that point. Exactly. So um, if we yeah. could just look at the wording of C five, of criterion five. I'm very concerned about the wording of, of that uh, paragraph five. Not to undertake a hydrological assessment is uh, a really very, very difficult. We have historically within the town houses that have t constantly been flooded in their, um, underneath the f their um, f ground floors because of eruptive springs through the peat and they are unable to s sort that, that liquid out and that's on in at least two uh, locations on the edge of the moss already. And historically, when uh, just a historic point, when the uh, swimming baths was built, the an eruptive spring came underneath the swimming baths, and they could not stop it. So the hydrological um, 
uh, importance is cannot be understated. Okay, thank you. Understood. Uh, wildlife Trust. I'm just seeking a bit of clarification on the term chat moss because it means different things to different bodies and agencies uh, that <coughs> might require clarification. There's historic chat moss, which is huge, and the former peat extraction site of the same name, which is not as huge. I, okay, yeah, helpful point. Um, might be something you want to, to, to come back on. Um, thank you. Uh, do you want to... Yeah, oh, beg pardon, yeah, beg uh, pardon. Generally, we're referring to the, well, from Salford point of view, only within Salford, but the um, historic chat moss within Salford, not just one single peat extraction site. Okay, I mean, that might be something that's uh, could be addressed in the reason justification, if, uh, if it isn't already. Or even already addressed in the Salford local plan. Or in the Salford local plan, yes. Extensive yeah. policies about chat moss yeah. in it. <laughs> but I think actually, two. yeah, I mean, clearly, well, we've... we've uh, and the local plan defines a boundary. The local plan defines a boundary. Okay, so we've got that relationship issue. There might be, I mean, as you, we talked about, or you talked about earlier, the, the specific trumping the general. So in this case, because there might be lots of policies about chat moss, but this is a specific policy. So we might, it, but it's, it's obviously easily, easily resolved that, I think, in terms of definition. It, it is, it is, that's um, right. In terms of the point about removing the words hydrological assessment from the policy, is that? But, uh, it's come out because it, it <laughs> because yes, because it, it originally read undertake a hydrological assessment in order to avoid any adverse impacts. Well, that is not, you know, it's, it's asking something to be done which can't be done, if you like. So, so that's why it's come out. I mean, it's not, it's not that one wouldn't, have a hydrological assessment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's not the point. This is a point about specific requirement of item number five. What's it getting at? And it's getting at minimisation. So, you know, whether one would, I'll, we'll leave it with you. So, whether whether somewhere there should be a hydrological assessment referred to in either in the policy or the supporting text. But it's come out there because it's in the way of it's actually obscuring the the point which we're seeking to make in item five. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, and it's understandable. People go, so one of my um, recurring themes that you'll, if you've been here all the time, is policies which refer to things you've got to do um, when the actual policy is what it is you're trying to either avoid or promote. And so the hydrological assessment may be something which is you'd have to do it anyway in order to be able to demonstrate how you're minimizing the thing. So there might be other things you have to do as well, you know, to do that. So, um, I, but I take the point, and I, and I will consider it. But you know, my, generally, my position is you don't need to put a lot of validation requirements into a policy. You just need to say what it is you, what you want people to do, uh, you want to avoid or promote. Um, That's exactly the point. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll move on then, and I think so. We've got a lot of points about Pete, and we don't uh, understand like, everything there. So we move on to the next point, which is uh, a suggested in insertion into the policy um, of the text that we've, we've is now becoming quite familiar about um, making provision for improved sustainable transport and highways infrastructure, having regard to indicative transport intervention set out in Appendix D with regard to policy JPC7. And then the consequence of that would be to turn uh, criteria six, uh, seven and eight as to these are things which are including so, as well as that, you're also including the requirements of six, seven, and eight. Is that so? yeah. That's right. So, forgive me. Yes, that's right. So, we just pick it up as a general sort of, I guess, transport point then. Um, Appendix D, I'm not going to go through in detail, but it does have um, quite a few necessaries and supportings in there. Yes, but the number shouldn't obscure the fact that in overall terms it's not, not actually that much but you know because the impact is not seen as being severe and you know necessary works are as set out there well i think that's the point is it, is yeah. it you know, again it's the mm. standard question if you like content mm. that you've got sufficient evidence and con and uh, we there's are a reasonable prospect that the transport mitigation or sorry the transport wouldn't the development would not lead to severe transport Problems. On the evidence base that we have, it's clear that there would not be severe, that's to say, very great impacts caused by the 
development of this site in accordance with the allocation. Um, on a worst case basis, that's probably understand, understating the point, but on a worst case basis, we consider that the list of items in Appendix D um, are potentially necessary um, things that would need to be secured in order to bring the site forward, but on a detailed transport assessment which, which was submitted alongside any, any planning application that came in, these matters would be considered again on the basis of you know, up-to-date and detailed information, and it may very well be that some of the things on the necessary list won't actually be necessary in accordance with the relevant legal requirements in Regulation 122 of the Community Infrastructure Levy Regulations. Um, but but the, the point being that yeah, all things being again, all things being equal, there is, as far as the Highway Authority and the GMC are concerned, the council are concerned, there is a um, there is a package of solutions, mitigation um, that you know. Which if and, and, and they, they have been factored into the viability assessment as well. They have been yeah. factored into the viability assessment, that's right, yeah. sir. Okay, uh, we'll just go, while, before I get on to, uh, while, I'm, while I'm, we're talking about transport, we'll just come to some of the, the, um, the, the actual criteria that are already in the policy, so we're inserting that into the policy. We have criterion six, which is about incorporating high quality network of public, public transport routes. I route through the site, so that's, that's on, the, on the site as part of the layout yeah I have no personally I have no particular questions about it if you wish to raise um, well I'm going to go through all the transport things first mm -hmm. so we don't get bogged down um, criterion seven is about minimizing the impact yes. on local highways to provide contributions to support the improvement of affected local drinks well that's actually that's actually, actually what we've effectively got what that wording exactly I'm not to be frank I mean this is this is uh, this is the first time we've we've had this sort of stray, stray item here, if you like, I and mean, that's the whole point of um, the new sentence about um, make provision for etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, in accordance with Appendix D, Policy JPC7. I mean, I don't think it does any harm, to be honest, it being there, and, and I don't think it's particularly a sound this point, but it's obviously yeah. slightly out of well, it's out of step with the approach we've adopted yeah, in mean, the other allocations. I suppose if nothing else, it's yeah. making it very clear. It is made um, very clear, yeah. And then Criterion 8 is about uh, providing new yep. direct pedestrian cycle routes to Earlham Station from the Western Enhancing yep. Cycle Parking. Mm -hmm. um, just to be clear, when you talk about, when it talks about enhancing cycle and car park facilities, is, is, that a, is that a requirement of the developer to provide that as part of those measures, or is that something which, if that were to come about, then that's great? Okay, well, I'm going to look to my left on this because what, I'm, what I see here in Appendix D is that increased provision of cycle parking at Earlham Rail Station mm. is in the necessary list. So it is. Uh, um, what I don't see at the moment in Appendix D is more car parking at Earlham Station. Um, so I'm just going to look to my left on that one. Um, in fact, I don't see it even in the supporting list. So is that is that a, an oversight or it shouldn't be there? Or what's this all about? Um, I think in terms of the cycle parking, obviously we would like to see more cycle parking. That's a requirement of the policy. I suspect the number of parking spaces at the station will be limited by what can be achieved there. So enhancing, I suppose, is trying to improve Im to improve the attractiveness potentially as well. But just looking at the overall, but that would uh, that would generally come under your path. Your, your if there's a package of contributions towards sustainable transport measures that would be likely to form part of it? I think it's recognising it as seeing the, the, the station as a parking facility for cars as a way of getting people out of the a further journey so it's part of that overall package of things they could look at. So. Yes, the pattern in MOS, so why would you need to improve car park so everyone really walk to the station? But um, yeah. Yes, it's the, it's the wider benefit point, isn't it? But yeah. well, can we leave that one with you, sir? Because I, yeah. <coughs> with Appendix D in mind. And um, I, I will just pick up Criterion 9 as well, because Criterion 9 talks about, it's again, it's a general point about accepting um, the access to the site. Should not have an unacceptable impact on the quality of existing residential areas. Um, this doesn't specify where the access should be, uh, but I think the point yesterday, we had a similar criterion and it was, Obviously, it's about living conditions. And it's a so quality of yeah. life point, yeah. that's right. And this seems to be a Salford-specific Salford approach, specific and we discussed issue. it yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, any general points then about, well, obviously, general points about transport, which you haven't heard, because obviously I'm conscious that we've, we've had quite a lot of already about, uh, I'm aware, if you like, of concerns about congestion and traffic in the area, um, anything that's not been raised before, or anything, obviously, specifically like these criteria that you're, you're concerned about. 
Yes, sir. It's the fact in the list of required, uh, there's no requirement to upgrade Astley Road. And Astley Road at the present moment in time, as we've said before, is a single track road. And I'd just like to make the point that the doctor's surgery that's on there is just not a doctor's surgery. It has two thirds of the Earlham and Caddy Z population on its books. And so it's an extremely busy surgery. Um, and the other point is that the, um, the pardon, the, the uh, bridge, the bridge is a real problem and it is down to bridge replacement across uh, Moss Lane. So I'm, I'm glad to see that on the necessary. Mm -hmm. Can I just confirm when it says the bridge replacement across, is that, is that the railway bridge? That's or the, or the uh, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, it's over the railway, yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't expect to be, yes. At the present moment in time, they won't be able to get vehicles through. No. So yeah. it's, it's a proviso. Yeah, Thank you, there are, There's a so you bridge at the other end as well, isn't there, over the motorway. Did you talk about earlier? That, no, it's the bridge over the railway. But it's the bridge over the railway, which that refers to. Yeah, yeah the yeah. bridge over the railway, yes. Sorry, thank you for that. Um, and as I say, we've got, I've got the other points generally about uh, trying to do... Can I just make another point that as ordinary people, uh, it's very, very difficult to actually keep on track with getting that information. And it's only because I've just noticed it over Jackie's shoulder that I've been able to come and access that information. Which information? The, append it, the list? The, the list. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it is, yeah, I mean, yeah, the nature of this process, unfortunately, yes. I would say, the nature of this process, obviously, we are, it is a, a live process. I mean, that, that list's been not, I mean, I'm not expecting, it's not your fault. No, uh, no but this has been, it has been available for a while. We talk about it regularly. Ad admittedly, perhaps now we've talk about so much we perhaps forget that the people who haven't seen it um, are aware of it. I think the... I, I think this process is very much, again, it puts us at a very big disadvantage because we haven't got the access to the information in a way that the other people have access to the information. So I think that's why it's very important that you allow us to, to speak. Thank you. Well, indeed, yes, that's why, why, you. why you're here, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes, but just making the point, thank you. Yeah. I mean, the main thing is no one's... Uh, Prejudiced by this. Um, so, any comments on what has been raised? I mean, the particular issue is about the, the, the if you like, the suggested there's a missing um, requirement. Well, all I can say is that there's been an extensive and detailed study and assessment, and the list of potential necessary works is as set out in the appendix. And if something isn't on it, that's because a conscious decision has been made that it's not potentially necessary in order to deal with the traffic impacts of the of the proposed allocation. So, you know, and that I understand that um, there's a different view about that and all I'm setting out is our view. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, but I must be allowed the last, forgive me, sir, I'm re really. It, it is preferable if we can, Mr. Katkowski's points often do raise people, they want yeah, to come back yeah. on it, and that's, I, that I happens sometimes. Ask, ask but when I've simply set out our position well, and recognised as an alternative position. Sometimes, I'm saying no, that. Not on this occasion. Okay. But uh, if, if as part of your um, the, um, inspection, you would care to come and have a look I've, at Astley Road? I've, well, I've been to the site. I mean, have you been to up yeah. Astley Road and looked at the road itself? What I generally do is go obviously go and familiarise myself. If I feel there's some need yes. to go back, I'll go back yeah. and look at specific things being yes. raised. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, if it wasn't a wasn't an issue after all. I was, it's my Polish blood, so it's getting a bit overheated yeah. at that point. Um, yes, you will know, you'll, you'll allow me to worry about those sorts of things, I'm sure. Absolutely, sir, forgive me, I, I apologise. Maybe, maybe it's because it's one o'clock, I don't know. Um, yeah. Well, that's a good excuse for me. Um, <laughs> We are on, where are we, Criterion, uh, we've got to Criterion 9. We're not doing as bad as I thought we might be, actually, so I may... Let's, let's do, shall we do a few more? I think we should try and get to quarter past again. Yes, let's, let's do that. Three quarters, sorry? <laughs> well, we'll get to it, three quarters, I think three quarters now should be enough for anyone's, anyone's lunch. So we'll do, we'll get to quarter past and we'll have a slightly shorter lunch and then that should help us get through. So we've done up to nine, um, the next, um, part of uh, the, the suggested change to the policy is to include a, uh, a clause criterion about compensatory improvements to the environmental quality and accessibility to any greenbelt. Again, as a matter of a little bit of background of that, that is a suggestion we've made uh, to be added to each uh, allocation. 
I think uh, because that is uh, reflecting national policy, which requires compensatory improvements. So um, I don't know if anyone has any points. The other point to that is that there's been, assess again, a, a, a GMCA-wide assessment of uh, potential improvements, and uh, the topic papers list what, what might be achievable. So um, it, it is just reflecting that, really. Um, okay. Um, I, I guess you're happy with that. Um, so the next one on that, we are into the reference to achieving a minimum of 10% net gain. This is another suggestion by GMCA in biodiversity in accordance with JPG9. And again, it talks about the offsite nature conservation enhancements. We've, okay, I think we've talked about those and obviously the concerns have been raised about whether that's achievable or not. I think I'm right in saying that is taken from uh, reason justification and inserted into policy. So um, I guess you must assume there's a, a good reason for doing that. That's right, sir. So, well, it's the, it's a basic point, isn't it, that in the reason justification, if it looks as if it's something we, we actually want someone to do, it needs to be in the policy rather than the reason justification. So that's why it's moved. And you know, you've had you've had the debate about whether this is possible or not, and you know we won't revisit that. Um, yeah. yeah, I think so. I think I think the actual cro the, the nub of that has been discussed. I don't think we need to no. talk about that again, unless anyone's got anything burning. So we'll move on from that. Uh, criterion ten is about. Um, green infrastructure and integrating high levels of green infrastructure. Um, the only suggested change that GMC have put forward is to achievement of 10% net gain in biodiversity. I assume that's just because it's mentioned in the, the previous point. So if, depending on what happens with that, that will stay or go. Um, but this is obviously a general uh, sort of policy uh, requirement. I, I've got no particular points I don't think about it. Um, if anybody has anything. Any? Green infrastructure, providing green infrastructure should be something which is to be um, uh, happy about, if, if it's, if it helps, um, sorry, <laughs> I should have moved on before I go to <laughs> Anybody know where Skylarks nest? What trees are you used to nest in? You'll, be, you'll tell me. I don't, we're, not, we're, not, we're not having a quiz. Anybody know? No, no, well, well the whole point is they nest on the ground. So if you create a woodland as biodiversity, you ain't going to create for the brass skylark. Please take that note of that. Most of these birds nest on the ground. So when you sweep the ground away and you put some trees somewhere, you're not gaining 10% biodiversity. You're losing biodiversity. In, in fairness, the policy doesn't say plant trees. It says, yeah, retain, it says well, retain trees. But one of the comments was the fact we would use new moss wood as compensation. New moss wood is a woodland. It's yeah, well, that's, well, sorry, we, we, yeah. we've moved on to a different um, point yeah. there. Um, and again, I've, I've got that point. So. Thank you. You've got, you've got to trust me. I do, I do take notes and do listen. Um, criterion 11. Um, discussed yesterday. And, yes. and, and frankly, if one's going to have it, which, you know, on the face of it, it's a fair enough point to make. And there needs to be a cross-reference to the to the local plan. G, it would be a GI, GI1? BG, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, BG1. <coughs> BG1, Sam Prime. Good. I, I just note on this, and we did talk about, you know, what is the wetlands nature improvement area, etc. We talked about it yesterday. I understand more about that. And we, I think there is a need to address an effectiveness issue there. The, just noting on this one, which don't think was the case in the two yesterday, uh, the deletion of the avoid harm to protected species. The other two left that in. I wonder if there was a particular reason for that here? Because there is... Yes, because of item number 12, um, that's why it's here. Um, but that talks about support by ecological surveys, et cetera, in, to understand and minimise any adverse impact. So that's that's why it's come out of 11, because we we considered it is adequately covered by 12. Okay. Uh, that, that's the reason. Uh, anyway. I'm bound to notice the difference between the words avoid harm to protected species and minimise any adverse impact on birds because, and protected well, species. Because, well, minimise is the, right, is the right language to use, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's your opinion. So is that, is that, so yesterday the, 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 there was the wrong language to use. Uh, did we have a, a void? Yeah, there's a void. Oh, I haven't was got it. A void? I think it's a void. The two yesterday are a void. I don't want to open that discussion no, again. No, okay. But, well, if okay, if the opposition is that that's the, the incorrect wording, then I can... Uh, bear with me for one moment. Well, the... 
Can I, I'll take that one away and think about it. Can I come back to you immediately after lunch on that, so if you don't mind? Because okay. I just want to make sure I haven't missed a subtlety, so I'll, I'll come back to you immediately after okay. lunch. Okay, well, I think the same issue applies to yeah. 29. Exactly. So we can, yeah. Well, you do, do uh, well, have you anything? I mean, I think we've sort of picked up 12 there. I mean, it's, it refers to the, the, the policy as is, uh, where you've, you've included some additional uh, uh, species and habitat in, into the into the list of things you wish to get additional evidence on. Um, and I, I was just wondering why it says winter birds. Why not? Why not native birds and our visit, our migratory visitors? So it should be all birds. Well, a lot of them are yeah. red and amber listed. I mean, to be fair, one of my um, yeah. one of my questions possibly would have been on this is, is it as soon as you start including lists like this in policy you get exactly that sort of question and is it necessary to list all of those species because presumably any kind of ecological assessment should pick them up anyway well, i would like to think so so yes yeah i take your point yeah so So I'll, I'll, I'll give some thought to that. Um, anything, yeah. Criterion 13 um, is a, uh, is being suggested, it related to habitats, reg habitats regulation assessment, it's been suggested to be removed. I think that's again, that, that fits into other, into other changes yes, that have been discussed. That's right, so yes. Sorry. Is that I had that up. For, yeah, no, beg your pardon. Number yeah. uh, 11. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would, just a point of clarity, uh, would it help the policy if the actual objectives for the Great Manchester Nature Improvement Area were in at least the subtext? Absolutely. I think, and again, beg your pardon, it's, it's my fault, um, because this is in the, all of the Salford policies. Um, and there was a discussion yesterday where I think I, I, raised, my, I raised the issue of there is no, you know, what are the objectives? You know? and so I think your point's well taken. Uh, apologies for not coming to you before. Um, thank you. And it, it is something I'm taking away. Right, so we've done 13. Um, 14 is about um, drainage. Any points on drainage? Uh, Microphone. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Drainage on, on a site like this would be extremely difficult. Um, you've got a, a, a great depth of peat, and drainage in these conditions will move quite dramatically. So there will be um, big engineering um, issues to address on a site like this. And if you've been to the site, which you said you had been, you can see a nasty road, how it's moved. It, it drops fit five foot within a matter of a couple of metres. And that will also happen to the drainage. So you will have an awful lot of uh, blockages unless you come up with uh, a different solution, take out the peat in its entirety, which will be extremely costly. Okay. So, okay, thank you. Um, I mean, we're content with it, so that it. Okay. Uh, criterion 15 is to protect the watercourses throughout and around the site. Again, I've got no, I've got no questions about that. Um, again, that's, this is a policy that's occurred in most of the Salford sites, all the Salford sites. Um, 16 and 17 relate to neighbourhood park and allotments. And again, as a little bit of context, this again is a, is a familiar site in the Salford policies. Uh, there was a discussion yesterday about whether it needed to be specific about what type of Open, pla open space allotments had to be provided in this case because there are other policies in the Salford plan which will guide the form of development. So um, I don't know if you've got anything to add from yesterday's discussion on that. It was something for me to think about, isn't it, I think? Something for you to think about. There's a particular twist in the tail here, though, if you like, because you're looking at 16 and 17, aren't you? So we've yeah. referred to Criterion 5. <laughs> I would like yeah, to think well, actually, yes, for pretty, yes, obvi for pretty yeah. obvious reasons. Yeah. So. Yeah, um, 
I mean, you'd have to read the two together. That's why we've we've done that. Mm. But otherwise, your broader point is absolutely as per yesterday. It's, it's a takeaway and think about because the local plan recently adopted has specific requirements for. Uh, and presumably, services. any any kind of um, development in the widest sense on the site, whether it's you know, would would have to accord with Criterion Five anyway. So if it was play areas or allotments, or I know allotments have a particular issue, but. Anything has to accord with five, doesn't it? I mean, I, th I think we included the reference because there's a specific issue in terms mm. of allotments, and I think the reason the criteria are included are so a neighbourhood park. I suppose you wouldn't conventionally the policy in the local plan would acknowledge that a contribution towards enhancing parks, whereas we expect a park to be provided okay. to address right. if it's a larger okay. development and it's a particular. It's a, it's a, so this is not this is this is different to. Yeah. I think it's, di it's, yeah. it's a different approach. We're specifying that should be these should be provided within the development. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see if we can get to the end of the criteria, have a break, come back, do viability, then move on. Um, criterion 18 is about incorporating appropriate mitigation, including tree planting to address issues of noise generated by the M62 and the railway line. Um, familiar point. Um, there are, there are yeah, uh, potentially fair enough. noisy, uh, noisy yeah. uh, Traffic, uh, tra noisy transport infrastructure in the area, and again, mm. I, I, I assume content that there are ways that can be achieved within mm. the, the the fabric of the site. Um, yes. Again, presumably talking about things like your sort of layout and mm. so on. So yep. Any any comments on? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, microphone, please. Um, having lived in that area, um, the noise from the motorway uh, it can be quite severe. I don't think the planting of the trees will actually mitigate it quite, um, sufficiently. Yeah, I mean, it does say including tree planting. Um. But bearing in mind, even though where the uh, M62 goes across that land, it's um, lower than the general level, the actual noise pollution is such that it will travel um, maybe a half a mile on certain dates. I don't believe that planting trays will eradicate that. Okay. I'm, I'm sure... I'm sure. Plant, trees Sorry. are planted along there and it still doesn't make much difference. Okay, thank you. So tree planting on its own wouldn't completely remove the issue. That's why it says including. But to be honest, we'll leave it with you, sir. I mean... The, the real purpose of this is incorporate additional appropriate mitigation to address issues of noise. Um, you know, the including tree planting seems a bit gratuitous, to be honest, but, you know, we'll leave it with you. But no, I'm not, we're not claiming that tree planting on its own would mitigate the noise from the motorway. Okay. Um, I seem to remember there's some rule of thumb about the depth of trees that you would need to mitigate noise impacts from motorway, and it's... And then actually it's we might get into, the, 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 there's other issues about tree planting on, in this exactly. site anyway, so we're, exactly. so so we're into might, that, you might want we're to into a circular. We are, so I think best, in, best read is incorporate appropriate mitigation, delete including tree planting yeah. to address issues of noise, because that's what we're trying to achieve. Okay, um, next one is about setting aside land to provide additional school provision. Um, again, I think, is this a case of, you, you, is this purely it will be dealt with at the time of an application or is this again one where you're fairly certain there'll have to be some school uh, have to be some provision of land um, I think it's it's a similar situation I think it's a substantial development um, obviously we are uh, when the term development comes forward there should be an assessment to assess capacity but we certainly think it's it's likely that there might be a need for for a new primary school provision and that's what is required in the in the policy on the same line as that as well that the contribution would be along you know, in line with the contribution in the local the rates of the local plan and the value of land would come off and, and i guess your answer to my question about you know one thing to have the land quite another thing to actually have the school is the same answer as yesterday the Making same answer as the school will have to be provided um but not necessarily paid for by the developer but it'll have to be in place and there'll be but there'd probably be a well, in line with the phasing Thing, there'd be a limit to which how many houses could be built prior to the school being delivered. You have to be in planning application, yeah. that'd be arranged, yes. I, I think this point would relate to many of the points been made about Astley Road 
I mean, we're talking about 800 houses now plus a school on a road with already two schools on it um, and a doctor's surgery. So ju just to labour that point about the unsuitability of this for a school, uh, an additional school. Okay. Stood. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then I think finally we have um, employee methods, uh, criteria 20, employee methods throughout the construction process will ensure the potential for archaeology investigators and any fine safeguard and properly recorded. Uh, again, familiar, that's wording that's been used in other policies. Um, again, it's something specific has been identified here. Um, that's right, sir, yes. If you'd like the detail, we, you can have it. But uh, I think it's in, I, it's, it's, it's in the topic paper, exactly. I think, yeah. Exactly. Um, I, my only issue with this is whether, and it's something I will think about, is whether the, that wording is Passes absolutely uh, <laughs> the, the, what I yes. would consider to be effective, but I yes. think that's the, the yes. point is there's an assessment yes. and uh, you, uh, addressing any you have issues. The, you have the point, and it's whether the wording is, is, is good enough to convey the point, absolutely. There is no criterion in this policy um, in relation to you know the, the other the other general point we keep coming back to about you know having regard to assets um, in or around the site like, is there anything here that would be referred um, there's to? nothing there's nothing on the site and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if there's anything around the site but you've you've got my you've got my I, I know your position on it but anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah okay exactly. so I think this might be deliberate rather than accidental here okay well that's that's always the question isn't it yeah. Okay, thank you everyone. That's been quite a long session, a lot get in, uh, but I think it's better to get it finished now. What I might do though, because I'm nice, is you know, if we have maybe till 10 past two before we start again, because that at least gives a bit more time, but I think it's good to at least get to the end of this particular topic, move on to viability, and then we can move on to the other side. Thank you for your patience. Um, so if we come back, and I think everybody's here today, this is the whole day, so it's not affecting everyone. So if we come back at 10 past two, um, uh, thank you all for your contributions so far. Thank you.
Okay, um, I'm going to start. Um, it's ten past two. Thank you all. Um, thank you all. Um, we were, we got to the end of development requirements, so I was going to move to viability, but there was a, an outstanding issue that Mr. Katkowski asked if he could uh, go and think about and come back to me on. Now. I think he wishes to come back to me on now. So. Thank you, sir. Just very briefly, before it drops out of my head, so the question arose from item uh, 11 and 12 in the policy for this allocation. 11, 11 had originally spoken about avoiding harm to protected species, and 12 has moved protected species into it, um, but with the preface that one should minimise adverse impacts as opposed to avoid. And so the question arises about what exactly we're seeking to achieve. Um, well, we're seeking to achieve the application of the what's loosely called the mitigation hierarchy, which is set out in the framework and which is also now set out in our amended version of policy G9, JP G9, in the um, latest version of the plan that you have, sir. Um, and it's set out after the seven items at the beginning of the policy, you then find the mitigation hierarchy. The one twist in the tail that's 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 what's been causing me consternation about this is that is that the mitigation hierarchy in the national planning policy framework and indeed as it's been transposed into g9 is dealing with a situation where one really hasn't got an allocated site because it speaks in the first item of avoiding significant harm to biodiversity etc etc through consideration of alternative sites with less harmful impacts um, then it goes on to mitigation, then it goes on to compensation. Um, and the difficulty with national policy and that thematic policy uh, is that when you've got an allocation, you've obviously already made the decision through the plan making process to allocate the site. So any avoidance would need to be within the context of the allocation. So, you know, in some instances, it will be possible within the layout, for example, of a site to avoid a particular protected habitat, for example. In other instances, it won't be, and, no, and then you would move on to mitigation and ultimately to compensation. So it's finding a way, that's a brain teaser. At first we thought, well, we'll just simply refer to avoid, avoid mitigate, compensate in accordance with the um, mitigation hierarchy set out in policy JPG9. That was our first thought. Um, but when one looks at the detail, there's just that wrinkle, really, and I haven't got an answer to it yet, because I think if we simply refer to the cross refer to the policy, then you do run in, you run head into that head on into that that issue. Um, so I think we probably would need to end up with something in the policy criterion itself referring to avoiding and or mitigating and or compensating as as appropriate or something like that, because we've got to we've got to capture the fact that if the plan is made, et cetera, et cetera, in due course, it will have this site and other sites as allocations in them. And so you can't be saying to the, the beneficiaries of those allocations, well, we're asking you to avoid harm by looking for other sites, because that's an exercise that's been done through the plan making process. Um, so that, that's what I wanted to get off my chest, sorry. sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, and that would obviously yes, relate to yesterday where the two, I think I'm right in saying the two sides talked about yesterday. There was no, you know, that avoid harm had stayed in. There might be, reasons, but I think it's a, you, something for me again to take away and think about how yeah. these things. Obviously, this might not just apply to Salford. It seems to me. This, no, I, I agree. Yeah. It's a cross-cutting point. Certainly a cross-cutting point for the Salford allocations, and it may well be wider than that. But, <clears throat> but we just need to. One just needs to think about that point that if you simply apply the mitigation hierarchy as written in national and and or in draft PFE policy, um, then you do run into that potential issue. Um, so I think there's, I'm sure there's a way around it where you'd simply refer to avoiding and or mitigating and or compensating as appropriate, you know, in the allocation item itself. Um, yeah. Okay, something for me to think about. Thank you. Right, with that then, we'll move on to uh, issues of viability on JPA 28. <clears throat> um, again, my understanding is that the viability assessment was carried out, identifies uh, a residual value of around 2.6 million pounds on this site. Um, and, and, and is that right? Am I wrong again? Well, there is, right, sorry, the residual value is 7.4 million, yes. which then can accommodate strategic costs of 4.8 million. No, no, no. Um, and the residual after cost is four. Yeah, so you get. So, oh, sorry for it. So you start with a residual value of seven point four million. 
you then put the strategic transport costs in and you end up with a headroom of, or residual value, the headroom okay. of four point, about £4.8 million. Pounds. Misunderstood your... No, no, that's note. fine, that's fine. I mean, I hope I've... But either way, it's, it's, so, either yes. way, 2.4 or 4.8, is, it is a viable, as far as you're concerned, a viable proposition. It, it, it's 4.8 and it's a, it's a category one site. Um, and that, as we've already discussed, that take, that's taken into account a reduced affordable housing um, a requirement or, or, or rather the costs associated with some of the constraints this site have led to a reduced affordable housing uh, requirement, but all of the costs that have been talked about in terms of the, the issues surrounding uh, the, the, the implications of development and PEAT, which have their own particular things, yes, and yes. The, the list of requirements in criteria in, in Appendix D, including a new bridge, et cetera, et cetera, have all been factored into that to get you to that figure. As I understand it, two, two heads nodding to my left, so must be right. That's the, that's the position, sir. So. Okay. Um, you'll note, obviously, from the representations and written statements we've had, um, uh, Wayne Holmes and Simon Holmes are here to, to, to make the point if they wish to, um, but their, their point was, I think, that there is no developer, well, their point was there's no developer on board on this one. I suppose my question is, is there developer interest on board on, on this one? Um, I think there has been developer interest. We haven't got developers. There's not a developer on board at the moment. But the council is, you know, council has experience in supporting developments and is keen to bring it forward with landowners, working with landowners and an appropriate developer. Right. So how does that, so is it being actively marketed now by the landowners or anything of that nature? Um, it's not being actively marketed. I think we're encouraging landowners to work with the council to so you, bring forward. A, so you expect you expect the council to be the developer? Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure how the council's going. I think the council is happy. Obviously, we recognise that the landowners could pursue a range of options in terms of, of doing that. One of the reasons for the second criterion of the policy is to recognise the need to have a coherent approach. The council is very keen to try and facilitate and support um, a sort of framework to development as it has done in other parts of the city. So it's a facilitator rather than the developer, sir. And the time scale, what are you, what, to remind me of the time scales for this one? Or your expected time scale? I think we expect it to be probably sort of medium term, so beginning of the next sort of beyond five years, but obviously if, if, if the circumstances allow us to move earlier, then we'd be happy to support that. And are you aware of it? I mean, obviously, you know, we, we, most of the sites, I think, have been, have been site promoters on board, and, and, and I think it's fair to say an argument has been put to us about viability is that, you know, look at the opposite side, opposite side of the table, as a developer here, so you know, it's a good indication that it is viable and deliverable. Um, is, is there any particular reason why this site hasn't gone forward in that way? Is it, I mean, again, again, suggestions are that there are such significant constraints, it's become unattractive to the development market. So, before, so just first of all, we have, a, we have had instances, we've had two categories so far at these proceedings. We've had sites which are on the face of the work, category four, not viable, yet we've had promoters slash developers actively promoting those sites and explaining how they've looked at viability issues and explaining why, as far as they're concerned and we're concerned, the site would come forward in the fullness of time. That's one category. Another category is where our own work has shown no viability issues at all, and we have promoters slash developers who are saying, yes, that's right, here we are, we're very keen. I think this is probably the first time where we've had a site, but just bear in mind what it is. It's a Category 1 site, it's not a Category 4 site, so, for example. It's Category 1, so it's one of the best. Uh, there isn't someone promoting it. Um, the purpose of the viability work is to show that it is, you know, in principle, a deliverable site within the context of national planning policy and therefore making this plan. Uh, so it's good and what we've got is perfectly good enough for the sake of the plan making exercise. I'll just look to my left as to whether there's anything you wanted to add about, you know, the, the, in, in the proposition that's been advanced is it's not, we, there isn't a promoter because the market thinks the site stinks or whatever, so. No, I mean, my understanding is there has been interest from developers. Um, we're quite keen from the council's point of view to try and manage as best we can delivery in particular to try and ensure we can deliver all the benefits in a coordinated way. So we are, we've taken a role to try and engage with landowners and try and take a sort of facilitating role, which we'll be very happy to work with appropriate developers when the time comes. And obviously, as we discussed yesterday, 
the city council also has its own house building um, it's proposing which we, we probably anticipate could well have a role somewhere in this site but obviously so from your perspective there's no no sort of obvious showstopper that's stopping this this coming forward it's where we are in a matter of t in, in time that there's no developer on board at the moment that, that's right so yeah the work is the work that we've done shows there isn't a select a show stopping issue to um, preclude the site coming forward. Okay, thank you. Um, CPRE? Yeah, it was just um, during the conversations about peat, we understood that the peat is at deep depths, and it's just understanding the additional costs of ground conditions, how you construct to a point where well it's just a, it's just a, I, I foresee that as an expense and I don't know if it has been specifically recorded in the viability assessment okay thank you oh, there is a ground conditions document which talk and there's some talk in there about a methodology I think isn't there for that so I well I will let them go back um odd um from my recollection the study uh, said that there's 18.5 million pounds worth uh, of additional costs associated with the peat. I don't know if it's fully recognised the actual costs associated with peat in terms of its drainage, the roads, and the uh, solution for the foundations. What, it, what that meant for each dwelling, uh, it was an additional cost of £23,125. Now, since that feasibility study was carried out, um, concrete, which is going to be a large contributor to that with a piling solution and a raft solution, has gone up 70% 70, 70 <coughs> since January 2021. So I'd question the costings that have been carried out. Um, in general, um, with labour costs, etc., and you won't need a high degree of a labour cost with, with piling, I would think that, that would be under-assessed by at least 50%. So I think there would have to be complete review. Now, bearing in mind... Uh, the point I made earlier on is that it's not a high cost uh, recovery area in terms of value of property. Um, with the additional costs, I can't see it being viable for uh, an external developer. The only way you could actually do that is increasing the density of dwellings per hectare. And going back to the learning gentleman further down, uh, he said it's 20 uh, houses per hectare. That's low density very low density, I'd expect it to be at least 50 to 60 to have any chance of it being viable. Um, and I, ju I just can't see how you can suffer a cost of £30,000 before you even start. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the general uh, additional costs that have uh, been attracted following the, the closure of the pandemic um, and the shortage in labour. Um, I can't see this being a viable proposition for developers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any other points on that before I let James say respond? No. Um, oops. No, there's no. No, yeah, sorry. When you said sorry, I thought you meant you wanted to speak. Sorry. We're all apologising. I apologise for responding to the points in that case. So, um, so just very briefly indeed i mean money has been put into the viability assessment in relation to the abnormals um vis-a-vis uh, -vis peat ground conditions um and secondly um you have a note from three dragons one of the one of the hearing documents about the way in which although construction costs have gone up um values have gone up across greater manchester far in excess of any of any increase in construction it's a point which has been raised sev several times during the course of these hearings um, you know, understandably, don't, don't get me wrong, I understand the point being raised, but there are two sides of the equation. One is, you know, how much have the costs gone up to build things? And secondly, how much has uh, what you can sell the things that you've built gone up? And the one is considerably outstripped the other. Uh, okay, sorry. No. Um, well, with, with respect to the Three Dragons um, feasibility study, which was carried out a number of years ago, and with respect to the profession that they belong to, they generally under budget these things. Okay. Well, that's a that's a point. Fine. As with all these things, the, the information is before me. I can uh, 
I, I can say that with a certain degree of authority because I belong to a profession. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, that's an interesting conclusion you've drawn then. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. We'll perhaps leave it at that because um, that's a rabbit hole we don't want to go down, isn't it? Um, okay. Don't get KC started on the legal profession, yeah. so Barbara. Um, okay. So, will any other points about this site um, before we move on? So. Is everybody here who's here to talk about JPA Torrent staying for the Port Sovel extension? They are, you're all nodding. So what I'll do then is rather than having another adjournment a few minutes after we started, I'll just have a few seconds for let people sort of rearrange their papers and things, and including myself, and then we'll make a start on uh, Port Sovel extension. Okay, thanks, just, so just a couple of minutes. Okay, um, I think a couple of minutes. Um, so yes, moving on to Port Salford extension. Um, some familiar, as we've said, some, there'll be some familiar themes in this one as well. I think now we've had the general discussion out, Pete, and we picked that up on the site selection in the last one. I think we'll we'll address any site specific issues when we get to them in the relevant criteria in the plan. So it's, it's slightly different, but the outcome will be the same. Everyone will get their opportunity to look, say anything about, specifically about this site. Um, so, with no further ado, if, as normally the case, if, allow Mr. Kokowski to introduce the site. Yes, sir, thank you very much indeed, if you'll bear with me for just one moment. So, um, yes, Port Salford Extension is in the plan for, it's a, it's a major employment allocation. Um, so, we're rather changing tack here, having spent so long discussing housing sites. Um, and the tri-modal road rail water, the tri-modal um, nature of the facility is, as far as we're concerned, what marks this opportunity out as being very special. Uh, it's a very important point to us in, in making the plan. Um, so the site meets in our book, uh, Site Selection Criteria 2, 5, and six, two, five, and six. So again, it's a slightly unusual one in terms of that combination. Um, two is, as you know, taking advantage of key assets and opportunities that genuinely distinguish Greater Manchester from its competitors. And the two key assets in question here um, are, um, in this particular case, the, the key asset, forgive me, is Port Salford. Um, criterion five, um, urban regeneration, the allocated land is an area is in an area of high deprivation, um, and criterion six uh, transport in investment here by the developer and others, creation of new, significant new demand, would support the delivery of long-term viable sustainable travel options and deliver significant wider community. But here we have in particular the um, we have the broader points I've made, but there's also the potential to contribute to a business case to extend the Trafford Park Metro Link line over the ship canal. So anyway, that's why we're dealing with criteria two, five and six. Um, we see the proposition with its trimodal um, nature as having, um, you know, to bringing, potentially bringing something very, very different and special to Greater Manchester, uh, has the potential to attract investment which otherwise wouldn't come to Greater Manchester. 
It's one of the most significant economic development projects in Greater Manchester um, and would significantly enhance, as far as we're concerned, the core growth area and boost the competitiveness of northern areas, that's uh, Strat 1 and Strat 6, respectively. Um, as you know, um, the proposal involves um, the removal of land from the green belt and the overall level of harm that's been found in our study work for that is a moderate level of harm, a moderate level of harm. We're going to, on the negative side of the equation, have our discussion about the peat specific implications. So I'll just put those to one side just for a few moments, but we recognize that peat obviously involves issues which need to be addressed in this overall weighing scales exercise. Um, the site is um, uh, agricultural land. <laughs> Um, grade one, grade one agricultural land, so that needs to be factored into the equation as well. We're going to uh, need to have a discussion, obviously, about traffic impacts and highway improvements, so we just note that those are obviously on the, potentially on the negative side of the equation, and we will, will obviously have a, connected with that, we'll have a discussion about viability later on, but we see various impacts as being capable of, of mitigation. The overall weighing scales telling us, as far as we're concerned, there are exceptional circumstances here to remove this land from the green belt and to allocate it. I want to emphasise and re-emphasise, and I don't think I can emphasise enough, how fundamental the tri- or multimodal access is to this, to the whole proposition. And that's what marks this out as, as special stroke, very special. Thank you. Okay, so um, <clears throat> moving on in the agenda, then we start with greenbelt issues. Um, you, you've already set out the level of harm you, your assessment has identified. Um, concerns, I think, have been raised, obviously, generally about uh, the development filling filling gaps um, and uh, affecting, uh, sort of, leading to the merging of um, distinct town centre or towns, I should say, or settlements. Um, any, any particular response to that? I mean, I know I know what your response will be, but just so, it's, that so people can come back on that as they... Certainly. So the, the site has been split into two parcels, as you know, in the, in the assessment. And um, for the western element, as against each of the purposes of the Green Belt, in fact, in relation to preventing neighbouring towns from merging, the impact was regarded as being relatively limited. And that's the same for the uh, eastern element as well the higher impacts came in relation to other, to other um, purposes, so sprawl or unrestricted sprawl. Sprawl were the two, were, was the purpose that achieved the higher levels of impact, um, as indeed did safeguarding the countryside from encroachment in both the case of both parcels. They're the ones that, they're the ones that drag the overall assessment up to moderate okay. rather than the merger point. Others will have different opinions. We've made the point that the studies, study work's been done in a cons consistent fashion across all of the allocations that are up for consideration through this process. And on that basis, we obviously stand by that assessment because it's been done in that objective way across, across all of the uh, relevant sites. Okay. But that's our position. Others would disagree, <coughs> but that's our, that's our case. Thank you. I know points have been made um, about generally points have been made about um, the need to release green belt in principle and alternative brownfield sites and so on. Obviously, those points have been made about other sites. Um, yes. I, I don't think they need to be rehearsed again. They, they don't need um, to be rehearsed again. We had all of that conversation before yeah. Christmas, I suppose the challenges, which arises from the pre-Christmas discussion, so we won't reactivate it now, but find us a tri-modal site Mm. Know, which is brownfield, but that's all as a result. That's all as a result of our discussions before Christmas. So you'll make of those what you will, and if you uh, if you side with one side of the arguments on that, then we won't get to this allocation. If you side with the other side of the arguments, we will potentially. So you know. Okay. Uh, moving on then to boundaries, um, the sort of one well, the, the western the boundary runs from sort of southwest to. Northeast, as it were, is the motorway. I think. So we're off to a good start. Yes. Um, yeah. So the east, it's the A57 and the Barton Aerodrome, broadly, I think is correct. The two 
one, the two boundaries, just, just I'm not sure this has been particularly raised as an issue, it may well have been, but just for my benefit, the, the north, north, northeastern boundary, the sort of curve uh, that goes in a curve, that um, looking at the site, as I was on site and also looking at the site visit map, it's no obvious feature there. So perhaps Indeed, you explain yes. to me why that boundary has been I'll, selected. I'll look to my left. I know the answer, but I'll look to my left. Were you here this morning? I wasn't morning? here this morning. Gone, no, no, you're, you were there, weren't yeah. you? So if you just introduce yourself again to... Yeah, it's uh, Jimmy McManus from Salford Council on behalf of the GMCA again. Yeah, the north eastern boundary follows the line of the rail, the approved rail link into the first phase of Port Salford. Um, it's obviously not there now. And so we've added a criterion into the policy about defining that boundary and also the, uh, the southern boundary as well. But that's a, that's um, a committed scheme, yeah. is it? So you know exactly where it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. The southern boundary, which is the other one, which is um, that that's referred to, I think, as um, along the line of a um, indicative line of potential road link. So we've got indicative potential. Um, I suppose in in the context of national policy and you know what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, does that make a, 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 a boundary which is consistent with national policy? Well, not if, you, not if you take national policy in its literal sense and you're looking for an existing strong feature. And so this is one of those ones where the policy would need to cater particularly for this boundary being a, a strong boundary. Um, we, will, we can obviously look at this when we come to the uh, criteria themselves. Um, just bear with me for one moment. Yes, I mean, there is a specific criterion on the point. Um, we can look at how good or bad or indifferent it is when we come to the specific criterion, but we've sought to capture the point in the, uh, in the allocation itself. Sorry. OK, I'm, I'm sure there'll be an opportunity to you know, address that. Um, the... Yes, sorry, that, that's my, I think, most... Uh, just understanding those two boundaries um, in terms of uh, what you're proposing there. I'll see if any comments. Uh, compensatory features, again, we'll pick, they'll pick that up as we, as we go through the development requirements. And then we have the uh, loss of green belt. And again, there's, a, there's an area of land, which I think is primarily within the Barton Aerodrome, which is identified as green belt, which would be released. Is that the case? Again, and I think I can presumably, without putting words, you know, assume that is because it would leave an island of greenbelt un, um, un, unconnected to any other greenbelt. That's your, your argument. Yeah. Okay. Any points on those issues, um, Ard? Uh, yes. The southern boundary is uh, through the, what was a, a, a golf course is a very soft boundary and has already been subject to a, plan, a, a, a preliminary planning uh, application for 1,400 houses, which uh, didn't come to fruition as it was in Greenbelt. So our concern is that that would be the last vestige of a break between the two, between Peel Green and Erlen. And my second point is, that the visual impact of Port Salford is such that it would completely alter the landscape on that side of the road. We used to be, the other side of the road is a brownfield site and has been a brownfield site for over 100 years, but that is a green open site and it would completely alter the vista. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I just ask the one that's been nagging me or, or ever since I saw this Port Salford uh, application? When I first read it, uh, the company was extremely happy to have the, the Brownfield site as the Port Salford. Extremely happy to have that, and that's the way it was. It wasn't even called Phase 1, it was called Port Salford. Then all, all of a sudden, we suddenly get Phase 2 is necessary for this to survive. How come it wasn't was passed if it was going to fail in the first place? They've got enough brownfield area there. It's a large area. That's enough for the port. Why do they want to go over to the green belt? It puzzles me immensely. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Okay. Right. Uh, Sorry. The point is, uh, probably echoing a little bit what David's just said, phase one is still yet to be developed. It's less than 25% developed. Why is it that um, it's being put forward for a secondary development when it's not completed its first development in over 15 years? It seems to me it's, it's just an, an opportunity to take an land away yeah. for future, uh, which is needless at the moment. It's not required. Yeah, fine. Uh, you, I will just remind you, you both said effectively the same point. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, I know it can be a bit for sure, but, you know. Um, okay, shall I? I think, yes, we'll, you may well start answering GMC's questions for them, but if you want to. Oh, oh, it might be other issues, though, Greenbelt issues, so. I don't want to trespass on that. I'm happy to speak yeah, now I know you, just those, just the Greenbelt boundary. Just Greenbelt Green boundary issues you may. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So, so obviously we would echo, as you'd expect, uh, what an important proposal this is because it's multimodal, uh, which actually in the context of everything we're discussing is specifically designed to um, ensure that more sustainable modes of um, transport are used for freight. Uh, it is highly unusual to be trimodal in this way um, and to restore the use uh, of the ship canal for the purpose of, of distributing freight. Uh, it's a long-term project. Uh, it's already seen a significant amount of investment, and um, that's the nature of the project and the, you know, the justification, the exceptional circumstances. Um, as for the boundary, well, the defining boundary here really is, is the motorway, is the M62, which obviously is uh, a very significant and permanent boundary, and the development along its long axis goes up to goes up to that boundary. So that's what we would say is the significance uh, and the importance of that boundary. Um, there are lots of solutions at the southern southern end. Um, it's right that I should mention we've we've sought uh, an extension to what is allocated with an additional area of land south of the access road. Um, and that could be accommodated by virtue of uh, a landscape buffer. Uh, that the intention is not to have continuous development to Earlham, even with that additional extension. But you know that's a that's a point that we made in the submissions, focusing on the allocation that you're considering now. It, it's the motorway that's the key is the key boundary there. And there's a significant difference actually, and we'll come on to it later between the condition of the peat and the ground, this side of the motorway, and the other side of Chat Moss, but we'll, we'll have that discussion later, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, yes, thank you. Uh, GMCA, you want to come back on any of those points? Um, I don't think so, really. So you've, you've heard what we said about the southern boundary, the soft boundaries it was described as, um, and, you know, why are we doing it? Well, because we want to make the most of this extraordinarily unusual opportunity. And there's no particular issue, uh, the point specifically about, well, poor phase one, if you like, hasn't been completed, so um, it's a slightly different need point to the general it, it employment, is. at least a more of a specific need point here. You know, there's, there's obviously no need for this because the first phase hasn't been completed yet. So a lot, as, as has been said across the table by those who, who, I mean, you know, you've heard it from the horse's mouth, but, you know, it's a long-term project, and obviously the plan is not a plan for tomorrow, it's a plan for many tomorrows over a considerable number of years. Okay, okay thank you. I'm going to move on then to, <laughs> if I could try and get, I mean, I, yes, I don't, I'm going I don't to say mind. Yes, i this very but, quickly. Yeah. Uh, my concern is this is early, early release because phase one will not be delivered, I feel, in the, in the course of this plan. Okay, and I, and I think, um, yes, that point's taken. I mean, yes. um, again, we've had uh, similar points about other developments. I'm not saying you shouldn't make these points, but I'm saying no. we've had similar points about other developments where you know, the, the green belt is released on day one, mm. if you like, in principle, and then yes. what does that mean? So, I, yeah. Slightly um, different, but what? What's slightly different? Yeah. Um, did you want to? Just, just on that point, you, you know, it's not that there's a lack of demand. In fact, there's a lot of demand, but there are important triggers that Peel has obviously been adhering to 
in terms of that release. And um, what has been allowed up to now is based on a certain amount of works. Uh, the next stage involves a substantial amount of additional work, and, and so it's the triggers in the planning permission which are um, the reason it's not built out. The demand, as we'll see, is absolutely there. <coughs> okay, thanks. Okay, moving on to site location then. I think quite a lot of those points have already been uh, touched on already um, because, of the, the, uh, as has been explained, the uh, need is expressed by GMCL, the justification expressed by GMCL for the site is the economic benefits, the trimodal um, approach. Um, yeah, you can't extend Port Salford somewhere which isn't an extension of Port Salford. Mm. I mean, it's, that's, you know, it's here. Yeah, well, I'd say it's location here because of what's here. Now, I know, again, from probably earlier um, discussions when we're talking about sustainable, a sustainable location, a sustainable pattern of development, which is part of this question, um, notwithstanding the trimodal aspect of that, you know, there has been some suggestion that it will either, as well as or in spite, or instead of it, will actually generate a very significant amount of uh, road-based travel road-based transport, which in and of itself is not sustainable. Is that any, any views on that? We can well, it's, this is all to do with the logistics sector, and, and the key sustainability point here is to seek to, uh, to seek to facilitate a more sustainable logistics sector because of the trimodal access point. Obviously, you're going to have road access, but the whole point is that if you don't exploit an opportunity to broaden modes of access to include rail and water, you might as well give up and just say, well, all logistics is by road. So this is why this is such a special opportunity, really. Um, so yes, I mean, obviously one can make points about lorries and logistics, but this is an unusual opportunity, you know, very, very special indeed, to have logistics which is multimodal. Um, obviously the traffic implications we're going to come to when we come to traffic implications. Yes, so, uh, oh, the sign's gone down. Okay. Yeah, we'll deal with the uh, deal with the specifics of traffic. I think um, this is more about sustainable location. I think as a broad broad heading, um, and you've already gained the other sort of, if you like, other than peat, um, the, another sort of location aspect is the Grade One agricultural land, which you've, you've you've raised. And of course, there's no criterion about that. There wouldn't be, um, but you've explained again, just explained that the, as far as you're concerned, that it's a you've taken that into account in your planning judgment. Absolutely, yes. All, all these things are an overall judgment. I mean, every single allocation, and this is a very good example of, of the process, is an overall judgment call where you, yes, you have to, you can't shut your eyes to the negatives, but you mustn't shut your eyes to the positives either. Um, you reach an overall balanced judgment, but of course, in the context of removing land from the green belt, you have a particular threshold which you need to meet. And of course, we're going to be talking about peat again, but we had our earlier discussion about the principle vis-a-vis -vis peat um, as well. So, you know, yes, we consider that um, we recognise the negatives, um, but the key point is we recognise the positives, and we consider the positives significantly um, trump the negatives. That's our view. CPRE? Just in terms of site location and sustainability, there is obviously, in addition to the fact that there's peat, it's grade one agricultural land, and it's just weighing that into the um, planning judgment. Thanks. I think you just, yeah, I, I meant, I, I preempted that probably by, I did just ask that. Because I, 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 I could take great offence to people not listening to me. So. But I won't, because it's normal. Um, but it's, it's, so I think the, the point has been, I asked the question, um, and, and effectively asked the question because I knew you might be raising it. So I was getting in there first. Um, okay, thank you. Um, okay, I think a lot of the issues around principle um, anyway will come up when we talk about development requirements. Um, they often do. So I think we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which I think is the development requirements. Um, and as usual, I will go through the, um, or use GMCA, is it GMCA 54, this one? Or, or 55? 56. 56. I'm, yeah. Sorry, 56. I was Distracting yeah. myself. GMC, from else. we use GMC 56. That's everyone's, right. <laughs> no, everyone's, everyone's doing other things. Um, no, no I, I, was, I was thinking ahead, which is a very dangerous thing to do. 
Think here to a few minutes' time as opposed to. <laughs> okay. So we'll, we'll go through the policy as, it, as it's written and yes, as it's yes. set out. Um, yes. So we start with the uh, scale of development, which is referred mm -hmm. to as um, 320,000 square metres of employment for space. Around, yeah. um, the, uh, I think one, well, We've talked about this before because we talked mm. about it under Strat 4, so I think, and there was a, yeah. a little bit of back and forth over 320,000 versus yes. 500,000, and yes, so, yeah. I've got that. I think I, yes. I pondered that. Can, Obviously, can, yeah. from an employment, it says employment. I think in previous, we've had some sites yeah. where we, we've perhaps just, it, that ought to be qualified, perhaps. It, it needs to be, yes. Thank you, sir. We, we, in reviewing this policy, we had literally forgotten, I think, the, the, the point about employment, the use of the word employment, certainly some specificity, and uh, elsewhere we've referred to use classes, haven't we? I think, and I think you've yeah. suggested, we've suggested, I think, because employment can be abroad. Exactly. And I think point. in this case as well, it's one of those where, because the justification for the allocation is so specific, mm. then being specific in of what it is you're after would be quite I agree. sensible. I agree. And I assume, I'm just assuming, it would be B2, B8? Yes, I um, started was pointing out the end of this introductory paragraph. Oh, it does say with a strong focus on, but that's... Logistics yeah. and high quality, but... To be fair. Yeah. To be fair, but I think, pre well, I know previously we've spoken about actually referring to the use classes in question so that we, you know, there's no yeah. room Yeah, I mean, there's a... There's a if I was... I, the pedant in me would say there's a big difference between a strong focus on which is, you know, doesn't necessarily mean the whole thing has to be B, B, B2 and B8. You know, it's, it's a right. slightly different thing. So it would I think never occur to me to describe you as a pedant, sir. So. Many people have. <laughs> I surprising. find that very surprising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah, on, on the type, type and scale of development. Yeah, should it not even be more specific, i.e. port-related? So it's really port-related. Port-related, OK. Because um, at the airport, users haven't been particularly ring fenced, so you've got... It's a missed opportunity not to have port related. Should it be allocated? So this would in this would then um, in your mind. So if somebody came forward with a um, well, something that didn't require the, the trimodal location, it, it wouldn't be there. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks, noted. Um, I don't know if you... Um, we wouldn't accept that, no, no. sir. But, I mean, we specify the use classes, yes. Um, take advantage of the trimodal <laughs> aspect of the site, nature of the site, yes. But to say, if I understand the principle correctly, that, you know, you can only... You would only have things on here that would, what? You draw on only one of the three um, modes of access or would have to draw on all three? I don't really understand the point, so... Okay. Um, so no, it's, it's perfectly good enough as it is with the addition of specific references to the use classes. Okay. I understand the point. Uh, uh, Peel. Yeah, I mean, I would guard against saying port related. I mean, was that anchor manufacturers or, um, you know, those associated with um, shipping? It, it, it's completely unnecessary. You need to be able to transfer the goods in all sectors. That's the nature of the facility. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on then to criterion one. Um, this is the uh, quite uh, familiar Salford policy about master planning and um, inserting wording related to phasing delivery strategy in cross reference to D1. And this is additional text about how the master plan would be managed. Um, I've got, uh, we've discussed this several times. I've got, I've got no further points on that. Any, any points? Same here. Okay, good. Okay. Move on. Um, Yes, so Criterion 2 um, is an interesting one. Involve high levels of community engagement <coughs> and then inserting the text throughout, throughout the construction phases, including through regular liaison, meet liaison meetings convened by the landowner and or developers. One question on this is how does that relate to Criterion 1? Um, is, it, is this part of the master planning? But it, it doesn't seem to be because it's talking about Construction phase. So, so it's not it's not the same as the master plan process. Mm. It's construction. Are there's a specific um, archaeology I think for this particular item. So I just look to my left. 
No, so uh, you, you're right, it goes beyond just the master planning. Uh, it's, it's about delivery as well, and it reflects a condition that's also on the phase one of Port Salford about engaging with the community. So it's carrying on that. So that's where it comes from. Right, it comes from a condition. Yeah. We'll leave it in your lap. So I'm trying, and just so I don't understand, it's, I'm trying to think about how, from a decision maker perspective, that works. You know, you're, you're, you'd, you're faced you'd with it. it. You'd have to do it by condition again. Exactly, so, you'd have to do it by condition, so but to what, I suppose, to what end? To what end? He's got permission. The no, 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 no. In, in your new planning permission, you would need to put a condition on... Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, that's what I mean, though. So oh. the condition would be, you, you, you put your application and you'd say, yeah. OK, here's a condition to have yeah. liaison throughout. Is this, is this more to do with things like, uh, sort of, according to the construction management, where you're explaining it's to people how they're going to be dealing with it? Sorry, so it's managing the construction process, engaging the community yeah. so that the community is given every opportunity to be fully aware and to be involved in you know, making practical points, if you like, about how that construction process should be carried out yeah. in terms of impacts on the local community. So I can, one can understand the sen well, I hope one can understand the sentiment of the, of the item. It's an existing condition. It would have to be secured by a condition on any new planning consent. Should it be flagged up in the policy? Well, it's certainly not not sound to flag it up, if you like, so, you know, yeah. Okay, okay, and at, at least I understand where it's come from. Um, I suppose, yes, I'll, 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 I'll have to think about that. Um, yes, please. Yeah, I mean, j just to give you something more to think on uh, around that one, I think in terms of the existing precondition as a local council, I've been quite disappointed with um, the level of community engagement, um, but we're not here to discuss the pre-existing condition, other than to say um, that the pre-existing uh, condition, I think, is stronger in terms of the, the ability for the community to have some kind of um, stake in this process. And I think that the addition, additional proposed text reduces that to merely through construction phases, and I think that actually reduces the the um, opportunity for local people to, mm -hmm. to engage and be part of this process. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think those two, for me, I've got those two criteria sort of go together and, I'll, and I've got to consider them. Um, okay, I'm moving on then to criterion three. Um, this is about, fa this is a phasing aspect. So criterion three requires the development not to go, not to be commenced until the rail link, highway improvements, canal berths and container terminal associated with the permitted port of scheme have been completed and operational and clear commitment to ongoing maintenance. So, um, I suppose the, the first thing is, the, the thinking here presumably, again, I'm, I'm assuming this is my understanding of what this is about, obviously, this is an allocation which has been justified primarily on the basis of this trimodal uh, facility and the special nature of that, and therefore, in order to ensure you achieve that and justify your release of the green belt and so on, that it, that it requires that um, that phasing requirement. Otherwise, you might end up with something completely different. You might end up with something completely different, and this is an extension of um, of Port Salford uh, permitted scheme, as you've heard. Um, and so, yes, I mean, this wouldn't. There are several points engaged here as, as, you know, on the plus side of the equation, but fundamental to this is the trimodal, multimodal access. And so therefore, item three is, is I mean, very important to us in relation to securing the, the whole reason why we're here in the first place, if you like. Okay. Um, um, depending on how the uh, site promoter comes back, you might have something to say about this anyway. Um, I just, might just want a, a general point about um, where we are with, if you like, with those infrastructure requirements. You know, are, are, they, are they all committed and ready to go, or are they, is there any sort of uncertainty about any of those things? You know? Um, delivery has begun as part of the, from the, the highway schemes. The Western Gateway Infrastructure Scheme, WIGIS, which I'm sure we'll say umpteen times today. Um, the first part 
has been has been delivered and work is beginning I think probably allow the promoter to give full data of how, of how things are progressing but in terms of looking at the whale link um, I know still there is still some work to do to secure uh, the wider how investment um, but the, the, yeah. the initial phases have begun and lots of work is going on to consider what what might be in place for the subsequent stages of investment around around Port Salford but it's, okay. it's vital for us I think we think that yeah. Port Salford needs to, uh, the, the condition requires delivery of certain elements of it and we think it's, it's key that these things are in place before the extension comes forward okay thank you um can I just ask a point of clarification? It's my understanding that the rail link has to be in before construction can start on the original phase, not the, not the extension. And um, what sort of time scale is there on that rail link? Have we got a date when that might be actually coming okay. through? Okay, okay. Um, Please. Obviously, in terms of this allocation, you know, yes. what, what the condition is, and that might, might be interesting to know, but I, I'm generally interested to know, but obviously the, the point is here that... Um, the, the, my point is that if, yeah, if we can't do phase one, why are we release, until the rail link is built, why are we releasing phase two at this point? That's my point, if you understand. But the, the phase two the, the can't extension. be commenced until rail link either? It no, says. but they can't have even started building the warehousing on phase one until the rail link is in. So they've got to build that once the rail link is in, but we're already saying that to release the extension, Port, Port Salford extension. So what we're doing is we're, we're sort of, are you, am I explaining myself very well? Because you're looking um, at me as I'm not sure, no, I'm sorry, I'm not no, sure. What that, I'm not, I know you don't understand I'm what not I'm sure, saying. I'm not sure what the point, what, what your concern is, I suppose. My concern is Other, other that, that is, sorry, if I, if I may cut through it, other than the point that's already been made about releasing this site prior to that being complete and, and the, the point about is there a need to do that well that's why um, yeah. i was wondering what if there was any clarification on exactly how long we've got to wait for the rail link right okay that's because yeah. that then will take us way way outside the, the term of the plan so I, i'm just concerned well, i think about i think that. fair point i think some yeah. of this i might come back to on yeah. viability because i think it's about when it's going to be delivered and can it be delivered so yeah but fair point um um, my, from my recollection, the rail link was dependent upon European funding. In that, we don't belong to the European Union anymore. I'm not too sure how valid and realistic this pro proposal is. Okay. Well, I think, well, again, viability. There's a there's a um, whole debate to be had about funding, I think, to be had later on. Um, Peel, do you have any comments on... Criterion three. I think you did again a little bit like you may, you may have put us a, a marker down, but yeah, change your I, position. I, I'm careful trying to make sure that we answer the right thing. So on criteria three, um, people are asking questions about the timing of the um, the rail connection and so on. But this this is about not to commence until the rail link. Well, it, it I mean it won't commence until the rail link is in there <laughs> and the highway improvements and so on. So um, that criteria doesn't give us a difficulty. Okay, we can turn this off. You, um, I think you, you raised some concerns that you didn't feel it was necessary to wait. You know, those things, your, your, the extension could come forward before that, but you potentially, you are content with that now? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah because, because first of all, we know about the importance of the rail link, that's the first thing. And then in terms of um, uh, other aspects of this, it will be, you're right, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's an extension to an existing facility. And so we've got a situation where we're still obviously in discussions about precisely what the highway solution will will be. Um, but the council will, I'm sure, require um, the certain highway works to be done. So I don't think it's it's causing us a difficulty. Okay, I don't, I don't want to get necessarily get into a back and forth, but if there's another point. My point is that this is an extension to a development that doesn't exist. Yes, well, I think, and I think, yeah. I, I definitely get that now. <laughs> um, Could so we just, can we just help with that then? Just, to, 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 I mean, it does exist because part of it's already built, but uh, leaving aside the kind of um, the loose language around that, perhaps if we just explain. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean. Briefly, sir, the, um, 
Um, as Mr Young has, has explained, the development does exist. It is on, on site. The first, the first phase of phase one has been delivered and, and is operational. Um, there is good progress towards um, delivering the rail link. Uh, it's got a planning permission. Um, it benefits from uh, significant private sector funding um, contribution. Um, and there is network rail approval in place for the connections of that rail link to the existing um, network. Um, the rail link will, will operate on a commercial basis. It will, as a piece of infrastructure, it will generate its own income. Those that use it will be required to pay to use it, um, unlike a piece of highway infrastructure where, where, that, where, where that doesn't apply. Um, survey work on site is ongoing um, to uh, procure the construction process for the, for the rail link um, that will be delivered in, a, in a, an approximately a, a two-year window. Um, so all that work has gone on largely in, in the background and outside of the sort of public eye um, to ready the site for development and to enable the phase one scheme to be um, delivered in, in the relative short term. Clearly this plan is looking much further beyond that and has to look beyond uh, the delivery of Port Salford phase one um, to secure the next wave of logistics uh, development um, for Greater Manchester. Uh, and as um, as the GMC have explained, this is the perfect um, location to do that, capitalising on its uh, multimodal characteristics. Thank you. Thank you. Helpful. Um, sorry, I'm just finding something in the I want to refer to later. Um, <clears throat> okay. Okay. Right. So I understand that on criteria three. Um, Criterion 4 is related to being designed to form part of an integrated facility with Port Salford site. So I think that's, that's uh, which is the same point about ensuring that uh, this is an extension to Port Salford and they operate together. Um, and I suppose when you talk about encouraging and enabling occupiers to utilise rail and water connections for freight movement, um, that's yeah, it's linked to, designed to, so it's about layout and infrastructure, in, internal That's right, internal communications and so on. Okay, any points on criteria four? My concern is the, uh, the, the north-south transport links between the two phases, which are crossing the A57, and the amount of, of uh, movements there will be between the two elements of Port Salford, which will impact greatly on the road. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to, too many bits of paper, I'm trying to find my Appendix D, to see if it says anything about that in particular, or it might just be an internal matter. Um. Okay, there are some relation, there are some things related to that, but I take, I take the point, and um, James A can respond, I just want to see if there's anything specific. Um, um, anything you want to say on question four no, at that point about, I mean, we might, might well pick that up again in tra we general will. transport matters I and don't want concerns. To enter into it yet before we get to traffic. Okay. Um, criteria, well, we are on traffic now, ironically, <laughs> so we are on to um, the inserted text about making provision for new and improved sustainable transport and highways. Again, this is the list, Appendix D and C C7, and then that would... The, the consequence of that is that criteria five, six, seven, and eight would all become including parts of that. So, um, we said there is, a, there is a list. There is a, um, a, a, a list of potential transport infrastructure um, requirements. Um, my standard question at this point is obviously, and you, you've said it before, but sufficient evidence and. Uh, prospect of there being a, a acceptable scheme that wouldn't result in severe transport implications um, yes the work has, that's the whole purpose of the work um, as I've indicated before but just to put in the in the narrative here yes the work that we've carried out has addressed that issue so would there be a severe impact in terms of traffic um, no um, bearing in mind on a worst case basis that there is a 
pretty hefty list of um, a pretty hefty list of necessary works, which are set out in Appendix D. Obviously, in the fullness of time, if as and when the allocation is made and planning applications come forward, then that list may well be refined through more detailed work. But our take on it at this high level at the moment, and you know, in making the plan, is that one can have a situation here where the development we envisage takes place without causing severe impacts on the highway network, um, with this list of in principle necessary works, although whether they will turn out to be necessary or not is a matter for detailed examination later. And we know, I think, I think it's fair to say, you know, it's not, uh, the, the, the worst case scenario is, an expen is a quite an expensive package. It's, it's, a, and, um, it's an eye-watering amount of money yeah. and that has given rise to the viability discussions um, and the information that you have. And when we come to viability, we obviously need to deal with that. But as you know, we've made the case consistently. Well, I'm going to resist the temptation to start talking about this because it's best dealt with under viability. But mm. I'll come back to the okay. Yeah, and I, I, what I, I, we regard as a compelling case to make up any shortfall in, in funding. So, but we're, we're come to that, sir. Okay. So, I will, as before, I'll just go through all these transport criteria as they appear here, and then open it up to any transport points. Um, so, criterion five. I think it deliver necessary higher improvements of a street in local nature. That's effectively what I think the preceding text is, is saying, isn't it? It's about delivering highway improvements. So that, it's doing right. that and it's similar to the last policy where we think, you know, exactly. it's, not, it's not, a, not a terrible thing to perhaps say. Yeah. I have no particular point on that. Thank you, sir. Um, criterion six, incorporating suitable HGV parking. Um, there's a thematic policy relating to that, but again, if there's a specific requirement here, then it might seem sensible to say so. Given the nature of the beast, I mean, there certainly is, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Criterion 7 is about high quality walking and cycling routes from and across the site to the bus stops on A57. Again, um, I have no particular point on that. Um, so people may wish to, to comment. Um, and Criterion 8, um, we are maximising links to existing public transport, which again, I suspect would be a layout issue, um, but then including, and then including accommodating a potential extension of the Traffic Park Metrolink. And again, I've, I've taken that from early discussions on that similar kind of way, and this is not a contribute, necessarily contributed to, because obviously it depends what Appendix D and the, comes out, but in this context, it's about making sure that it doesn't prejudice any future line. That's absolutely the point, sir. That's right. and. Um, Bear with me for a moment. The uh, Metrolink extension is in as a supporting work rather than the necessary work in Appendix D. Uh, but yes, you wouldn't want uh, you wouldn't want the layout and the bringing forward of the development on the extension site to preclude, inhibit, you know, the actual delivery on the ground of the extension. That's the point. So although the Metro, I get my, I get my Metro links confused, maybe but the Metrolink potential to help a business case Metrolink was part of the site selection criteria but it's not necessarily required as at the moment to deliver the highways improvements. It's, forgive me, it's not necessary in order to deliver the um, allocation, but with the allocation made, let's just assume that we're in that well, that adds to the case, adds very significantly to the case. Um, the language I read out earlier on um, adds very significant to the, to, the, to the business case for that extension. Uh, bear with me, I quoted the exact language. Um, which I've now lost, even though I read it out earlier on. <laughs> Where's it gone? Site selection. Oh, yes, it's in the site selection sheet, isn't it? If you give me one moment. Gone. There we are. Thank you so much. Yes, that's right. So to make a significant contribution to the business case for that for that extension. <clears throat> so if that if that extension weren't to happen, though, it, it, would, would it affect your overall justification for the allocation anyway, as it's part of the site selection process? When. No, it wouldn't, no. because the, the way it's taken into account in the site selection process is, is, is on that one of the three site selection criteria that are played in here, so it's one of the three criteria that we rely on, 
but the playing in of the point is the ability to support the case for that extension, not that it would bring the extension or that the extension is required in order to get this development off the ground, but the simple presence of <laughs> this large logistics multimodal facility here enhances, strengthens the case for that extension. Okay, thank you. That's, that's the way it's taken into account. Okay, thanks. Okay. So that covered um, some general issues about transport uh, mitigation and, and the case for transport and those criteria. Any points on either of those things? Um? Yes. Uh, are the walking and, uh, point seven, walking and cycling routes across the site, is that for the people who are working within the site or is that for public? Public consumption, please. That's a point of clarification. Okay. Um, is, there, is, it, is it specific to either? Could be any, any and all? Go. <clears throat> well, I think reading the criterion, it would apply to people within the site accessing and be able to have easy walking routes to public transport facilities and the wider pedestrian network. I think it's connecting people from within the site or out with the site to the site rather than the more broader network. Okay, so it's connected to the site. Okay. Any other points? Yeah, yeah. Just make it clear that there's a right of way that goes at the back of the airport and I believe the plan is to move that right away to uh, the pavement along the main road. So there will be a loss of a right of way that goes through that site. Okay, thank you. I mean, that's not written into the policy. That might well be a proposal that someone's put forward. It's not, I don't think it's referred to in the policy, so. Well, there's, there's certainly a lot, but yeah. Um, yes, and obviously sometimes there are proposals being talked about outside this room, uh, uh, which aren't before me, and you know, all I can go on is what is in the word in policy, but, but I, I take the point, there's, there's potential issues there. Um, so. Any other points on trial? Again, again, obviously, I'm, I'm cognizant of any general concerns people have about the impact of these schemes on transport um, and junctions and so on. So that's useful. Thank you for um, for not to necessarily repeating those things and, and as long as you're happy that I'm, I'm aware of those things. Good, um, that's good. So I'm gonna move on then to criteria nine, which talks about um, protecting uh, full function operational safety of Barton Aerodrome, I don't think I've got, uh, sorry, are, are your signs up? Is that a no? Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I've, I've got nothing particularly to say about that. It seems a quite logical thing to do. Um, I would hope so, sir. Hmm. Yes. And then we have... The next one's the usual one. The yeah. heritage assets are off-site, so um, we'll leave that one with you on, on the basis of the general discussion. Well, not the general, specific discussion we've had on a multitude of occasions. Yes, I mean, some people may not have been part of that, so I'll just explain, um, just, just fullness of, time, uh, fullness of uh, to help people. The criterion 10, as it's set out in the submitted plan, has sort of these three criteria relating to conservation and heritage. In previous sessions, we've, we've highlighted the fact that some of these policies don't necessarily coincide with or, or relate very well to national policy or even internally consistent. And so we suggested a form of words as an example of how that might be addressed. That's the example. Um, so we need to think about whether that's still appropriate. There are, I mean, there are, as you say, on this case, there might not be assets, there's no assets on the site particularly. Um, I think when I read the original Criterion 10, I had some questions about some of the wording in there in relation to things like um, minimizing adverse impacts, um, you know, where there's an impact, opportunity should be sought to, at least... Uh, you, you, I can understand why you raise issues, questions, forgive me. Obviously, I, to make recommendations sounds in the plan, I think I, I probably would have, whether it's that form words, I, I would have been questioning that. So I think, exactly. unless anybody would I'll just take that away with me. And, you yeah. could, and, and we await your guidance on whether one needs to have the revamped item at all, given mm. that these are off-site assets which will be captured by heritage policies within this plan, captured by five policies on heritage from the recently adopted Salford local plan, covered by four pages of the national planning policy framework, if that's not enough for anyone. Uh, but there you are, sir, so we'll we leave that one with you. But, sorry, there's a but, and that is because, sorry, there is a but, because of the nature of the wording of that original policy is 
is there a sort of inbuilt assumption? Because it talks about minimum, you know, it, 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 the, 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 there will be harm. I suppose is the point. Is, it, the policy reads as if an element of harm has been accepted, is baked into the decision making, if you like, and therefore um, we we need to minimise it, or we feel there's enough there to, that you can follow. That, you know, there may not. You know, there's a way of delivering the site which won't result in harm. I think. I think one needs to be wary of making the assumption that it's baked in that we accept there'll be harm to the significance of these heritage assets off site. Um, I'm just looking at the, it's a classic really to be quite frank, I don't know how many times I've come across this, but item 10.1, adverse impacts on the setting of, etc, etc. Well, as you would know, um, yes, you would assess whether there are adverse impacts on the setting of a listed building, for example, but then the acid test is, do, do any such impacts work through to harming the heritage significance of the particular asset, which is not the same question, it's a different point. Mm. You know, you would take into account, you know, yes, this is the harm we consider there would be to the setting, but then query, does that actually um, reduce the heritage significance, the heritage value of the yeah. asset itself? And, so, then if, and then if it does, yeah. you've heard, let's assume, say for sake, less than substantial harm and then public benefits. I suppose exactly. a little bit in my mind was, is this the same as, say, some other things where the if you go through the logic and yes. get to the public benefits thing, the public benefit you've already, the allocation. You've already exactly. addressed that, or is this a case of, well, actually, let's wait and see what the development comes forward with, and we can assess it in, in, on first principles, as it were? No, no, no. This is, this is um, where the public benefit, if, been, if, you, as been, if you agree with us, is, 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 is being determined yeah. through this plan making So that's process. right. I saw I meant by yeah. it, that, that you've gone, oh, I see you've gone you through Forgive that. Me. My fault. Because I understand. think and this is always an issue with allocations for me. I understand. Where yeah. heritage assets are an issue. Yes. Because you, you can, and I think the only reason I've raised it here and not elsewhere is because the wording yes. you know, slightly, was slightly different, mm. is where there's a way of delivering a site which mm. doesn't necessarily cause yes. harm and therefore yes. you, you consider it in first principles or mm. by allocating yeah. the site we've accepted there will be a degree of harm. Obviously if something comes in which is completely acceptable that's different but we've yes. accepted a degree of harm and we've built, we've done our public benefit assessment through the allocation. It's a subtle difference, not always clear. No, no, I understand. I, I understand so. the point, sir, which is why I think we've got the, you know, how elegant it is is another matter, but take appropriate account of formulation. But as these are off-site, I'm not sure it's needed. No. You, Sorry, you, I probably you, over it. But not it, at it, was all. Just that it was just because no, that particular form of words in 10, 1 and 2 was... I understand. Sorry, I know you've suggested it, removed it, but mm. I still need to think whether it's done. So. Anyway, any points on heritage? After that, sir, long diatribe on this... Uh, just my point uh, is about um, the airport. Barton Airport is, is now surrounded by open farmland and it won't it'd be surrounded by warehousing. So by definition, its heritage status is going to alter in, uh, because of its visual, visual impact. And also the com compensatory improvements to the environmental quality and accessibility. How will that work, please? Because at the moment, there's no accessibility at all. At the, this present moment in time, we can walk on the farmland if we so choose. There are paths and things that we can use, field edges. There will be no access to that open ground at all. And so the little area that's left, what sort of compensatory things will happen yeah. there? Okay, I mean, some of this is getting into very much the detail of, of what might come forward. I mean, the, the, the part of the point is that the, the, the policy would require it. So, you know, and that sort of thing would be, I'm not sure anyone might be able to answer that question at the moment because it would be dependent on an application coming in and showing how they would meet that requirement. Um, I might, you know, and there has, I'm just, we are jumping ahead, but, but there is a document, one of many other documents, which sets out the kinds of things that could be could be done, but they're not, it's not an exhaustive list. It's, it's My big concern is at the moment, I was looking at a historic uh, planning application for the um, rugby ground, and it was a beautifully landscaped, beautifully finished area. And basically it's now a building surrounded by concrete with no landscaping at all. So environmental concerns, of, because planning doesn't really see it right through to the end sometimes. Okay. Well, again, I, I can't, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't do much about that. To talk to you, you you're quite welcome to talk to your, your colleagues in Salford Council outside this room. You know. 
Mr Shuttleworth will be very pleased to have that conversation. So, okay, I'm going to move on then to, we've got an extra, um, after Heritage, we've got an extra criterion about defining and strengthening the boundaries, which we've, we've talked about earlier. Um, I don't know if anyone wishes to raise any points on that. Um, but I think we've talked about that, so I've got nothing else I want to, to say. I need to think about you know, whether that will be sufficient. Then we move on then to the suggested insertion of making provision for compensatory improvements to the environment cost, we've already touched on that. Um, again, as I said earlier, this is a kind of standard policy that's, um, that's been suggested to be put in um, to most allocations because it is national policy, it is a, is a requirement. Any other points on those, on that particular issue? Um, this is yeah, you, you, the, sign, the sign's up. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is point 11 we're discussing, is it? No, it's just, no the one before. Just the one before, yeah, yeah. sorry, I'm just, uh, all right, apologies. Yeah. No, no, fine. Oh, yeah, well, Ron, yeah, so there's no, no other points on compensatory improvement, so I'll move on then to point 11. I'll just, um, the golf course. Um, the golf course, so the original, uh, as submitted policy, said justify and provide full compensation for the loss of the golf course in accordance with national policy. Uh, the suggested change is to replace national policy with local planning policy. Um, yes, is the assumption, it, yesterday, yesterday we had a discussion about the a lifetime ago, so. playing fields on, I see I've got an eidetic memory of it. We had um, playing fields on east of Boothstown. Yes. And, the, and there was a question there because the policy was well, it, it, you know, retain or retain or replace, and you know that would be subject to national policy or local policy. Lo local um, policy. But it would depend on that. Um, but there was a sort of we don't we don't really mind. I read this, you know, justify and provide comp justify. So the, the implication is there that if the golf course is to be removed or part of the golf course in this case is to be removed, they've got to justify that loss in the first instance. So there's no assumption, again. Just, just the word justify, the words justify and are, you know, yes, not, not appropriate, I don't think. I'll ask Mr. Shuttleworth to explain this in a moment, but I think it's a compensation rather than the justification because the allocation necessarily involves um, bidding a fond farewell to, um, to at least yeah. part of the golf course. Well, that, that, that was my assumption. If the, does the allocation effectively does the, you've, you've done that assessment. Yes. Um, so then there's a second question about whether asking for compensation in that in that context is justified in its own right. So again, I suppose that's open to you to answer that. I'll turn to Mr. Shuttleworth the compensation. What 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 are we driving at? Oh no, that's a terrible pun. What are we? Oh dear, oh, I, I hate golf anyway. But but what what are we aiming at here? I can never understand why people play golf. But why what 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 are we aiming at here in the compensation point, Mr. Shuttleworth? Please. We are aiming at um, having the development. Uh, Considering the implications of the loss of the golf course, the loss of the golf course, I think, is implicit in the allocation, isn't it? So justify fields probably a step that we've already been through. But the policy R3 in the Salford local plan explains the considerations that need to go through when there's loss of recreation facilities. I think we'd expect the development to go through those processes to, to compensate and mitigate that loss. So whilst we've considered it acceptable to lose the golf course in this case, it doesn't mean we don't want. Wait, so you've... You've considered it acceptable to lose it in the context of replacement only. Um, well, there are the, there are criteria to work through in the policy R three, which then can be can, that's how, how we would consider any proposal for development on on <coughs> facilities. Okay. Oh, well, I'll have to look at policy R three, um, but it just obviously, as you say, it's one of those things again where you, you've you've gone through a process, you've allocated the site for development. You've assumed, you know, and tridal mo the trimodal is far more important than people playing golf. I think is the point, but but yeah, I, okay. can, I think you'll need. To, I think you best, if you don't mind, sir. Can I suggest that you put this on? Not that it's for me to suggest things that you should put on your list, but I think you might find it sensible to put consideration of this in its relationship with policy R one, R three, R three of the recently adopted local plan on for further consideration by us. I'm looking at the policy itself, and I'm. I need to have a discussion with Mr. Shuttleworth about how close a fit those criteria are with what we're seeking to achieve here, because just looking at the criteria, I mean, one of the criteria is the site's been allocated for alternative purposes in the development plan, <laughs> which it would be here. Yeah. Um, but 
development would deliver a net improvement in the city's recreation resources. So it may well be jumping straight to item four in, in, um, in the policy. But uh, we'll have this conversation offline, if you, if you don't mind. I think we need to talk this through. And, and OK, we'll leave that there. I'll, I'll have to look at policy R3 myself um, when I've got a, a spare moment sometime. Um, you, you wish to raise something about yes, the Yes, yeah. In this discussion of the golf course, are we also included in the achieve a minimum 10% net gain in biodiversity? Is this within this, this discussion, the next part of it? Or? No, no, sorry, it's separate. It's a separate, separate entity. So as far as the golf course is concerned, just a point, it's quite tree-lined now. It's quite busy with trees. The trees generate insects. The adjacent farm is one of the most strong, large strongholds of swallows and house martins on the moss, which are in rapid decline. They feed in the rain round the trees and get the insects off there. And the, and the loss of the golf course will mean the loss of their food supply, which will mean further denigration of our wildlife. And sorry, I should say, just for, just for completeness, sorry. in terms of the criterion, I was talking about that's yeah. the next criterion, but in terms of the, you know, the, the calculation of biodiversity net gain, if that's what you're doing, that then is the whole, my assumption would be the whole site would be factored into that uh, calculation. So I wasn't quite sure if that was what you were getting at. But. I wasn't sure if, you, if the, because the 10% gain, I would also then wish to continue with the fact that the, the whole loss of this area for this so-called phase two would be the same wildlife loss as we're talking about near the station and that all farmland birds, and they're the most depleted birds of all in the UK, and don't let us forget this, if I can just do you one quote, which needs to be remembered, this 10% diversity thing. We're the most de nature depleted nation in the world, in the world. And here we are wanting to destroy even more of our wildlife. It's not a really happy way to go about things, is it? We can't keep on doing this and say one day we'll do something, because that one day is now. Sorry. No, a bit emphatic. I apologise for being emphatic. Don't apologise. No, it's <laughs> fine with me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peel. On uh, so, my learned friend is not the only one who, who doesn't uh, enjoy or necessarily enjoy golf because uh, this uh, golf course isn't being used and you're probably aware that that is a national trend. Um, it would seem uh, plenty of people prefer cycling these days um, and as a consequence it hasn't been used uh, for a number of years. In fact, it has um, uh, tip material on it, I think, in places as well. So. The, the position is we're perfectly happy with the reference to R3. I would entirely endorse what my learned friend has said. Um, R3 is a policy uh, which is relevant for this area and, and therefore I think it just needs to refer to policy R3, uh, to be honest, and, and there's nothing more to be said that. I appreciate the, the wider um, issues about wildlife and so on, but this is the balance, isn't it? This is the balance between um, multimodal... Uh, interchanges and you know there is obviously uh, some impact on ecology and that's why we have biodiversity net gain in other facilities now okay thank you okay. uh, I just want to uh, say something uh, and I hope you've not been let misled the golf course was actually under lease from Peel by the uh, Per person who used to own the land beforehand and that lease was taken in, the actual person who ran the golf course didn't want to go. Okay. So it, I think I don't want you to be misled. Nobody's being misled. They, 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 it's all subject to demand and, of course, whoever operates the golf course doesn't want it to go, but that, that they're not the only people who determine how much okay. use there is of it. But as it stands, the golf course is not being used. Yeah. It's, not, it's not operational, I should say. Not, yeah. But it's a loss to our community and it was very badly it was felt okay. when it Thank was you. lost. Thank you. Um, Right, we're going to, then I think we're going to move into various issues around biodiversity and, and different kinds. So I think what I'm going to do is just have a short break before we do that. Because um, when, when we come back, are we going to deal with peat and then other biodiversity issues? Because like we did before, <coughs> site specific. I think the next is, criterion, mm. which is about biodiversity again, but just talk about this sort of issue around complementary mm. habitat, uh, you know, restoration, yes. it, it, it segues into. Okay, so Pete. whichever way you want. So I think I think we may we may we'll start with 
principal, we start with the peat issues, Great. because then I think that will lead into some of these other policies. That's what I wanted yeah. a clarification. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed. So, so we'll start with site specifics vis-a-vis -vis peat yes. when we yes. come back. Yes, that's okay. So we'll, we'll come back at five to four. Thank you.
Okay, thank you everybody. Seems to be quite a hubbub of activity. Everybody chatting nicely, friendly. It's very social experiences. Um, right, we got to um, where I think we we're sort of starting to move into territory around uh, biodiversity issues and prob probably Pete. I think what I'll do is take this point uh, to, we'll talk about Pete in, in Pete now and then as we move through the criteria, we'll see how it all relates. So I think the easiest thing to do is, in the first instance, ask GMCA to, if there's anything additional you want to say to what you've already said, um, to, and then probably open it up to the site promoters they want to say, and then see what anyone else has got to say. I agree in, entirely. So with that, thank you very much indeed. So no, in relation to the matter of general principle and approach, I've literally not, not a word to add to what I said or change to what I said earlier on. Only, obviously, on this occasion, we would insert into the weighing scales the particular benefits in planning terms as we see it of this particular allocation. So, obviously, it's a different weighing scales because on you know you've, you've got a different type of development in on the on the plus side of the side of the equation. But I would otherwise literally repeat everything I said earlier on, and I'm not going to do that. Um, as for the detail of the peat on this site, I mean, rather than me give a poor, I suspect, and perhaps even potentially inaccurate summary of a lot of work that's been done by Peel, it'd be much better to hear it straight from them, to be quite frank, um, as for the detail, because they've been responsible for doing quite a lot of work on this. Okay, that seems reasonable. So, okay, I'll pass over then to Peel if you want to... Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm also going to refer to my colleague Martin Dyer from E3P, who deals with geotechnics and engineering. Um, the map that was produced yesterday by GMCA showing the overall wetlands nature improvement area and the very large um, brown splodge, which for the sake of shorthand, I'll call it chat moss. There are a number of sub mosses within that, but uh, that broad brown area is, can be called sub, uh, chat moss for ease of reference. So JPA 29 is at the southeastern edge of that. And what the plan doesn't show is the M62, which separates uh, Port Salford Extension from the core of Chat Moss. Now, Peel are a major landowner, obviously not just of Port Salford Extension, but own significant areas of Chat Moss and are engaged in and supporting bog restoration and wetland restoration and other uh, habitat restoration on Chat Moss. In terms of the particular characteristics of the peat on Port Salford Extension, it has become uh, extremely degraded. Talked earlier on this morning about agricultural drainage, but there have been additional factors here at um, Port Salford Extension, which have also led to uh, further degradation. So obviously the arable agricultural deep drainage we talked about, but also the infrastructure such as the M62, the Liverpool Manchester Railway, the Barton City Airport, and there's a ground gas extraction plant, and they all create uh, preferential drainage pathways which tend to pull water out from the PT soils. Um, the boys, the former Boys and Oak Golf Course, which occupies I think around 15 to 20% of the allocation area, was created in the early 1990s by deposition of inert fill. Um, so that essentially squashed the peat, there's peat underneath that. Uh, so I'd say that about 80% of the allocation has peat at the surface and 20% is buried by the fill material. Um, there was uh, historically uh, a lot of night soil was deposited in the 1800s, agricultural fertilisers. Also, um, again, the presence of the M62, nitrogen emissions is quite detrimental to the formation of bog plants, bog flora. And finally, the diversion of the River Irwell, uh, I'm reading this out, Mr Dyer can speak to it a bit more in a minute. Diversion of the River Irwell into the Manchester Ship Canal, south of Port Salford Extension, altered the hydrogeology in the mid to late 19th century, which in an initiated a rapid reduction of groundwater in the Port Salford Extension area, and that remains a, a, a factor. So, as I say, there is peat at the surface, and um, initial indications are that there's a maximum depth of 4.5 metres, ranging between 0.5 and 4.5 metres variable. So for, the, for those reasons, 
the, the peat has undergone particular degradation. We've carried out phase one habitat surveys and there are no sort of active bog habitats. There are a few areas of marshy grassland and there's some ditches with wet woodland lining it, but there are no significant areas that you would look at and go, you could build a restoration project on the basis of those habitats as they are at the moment. So we don't consider that they, the site currently falls into the Annex 1 definition, which is a degraded raised bog capable of restoration. And the interpretation manual of a European habitats stresses that it's really, these have to be habitats that are capable of natural regeneration, where hydrology can be repaired and with appropriate re rehabilitation management, there are a reasonable expectation of re-establishing vegetation with peat forming capability in 30 years. So we um, don't consider that there's anything in that category at the moment, but obviously Natural England's peat action plan is very much about you know, looking at opportunities to restore peat through re-wetting. And um, so I'm gonna hand over to Mr. Dyer who will talk about the work that we've been doing at looking at whether a re-wetting solution either to recreate bog habitats or to raise water tables for a form of agriculture known as paludiculture uh, is feasible on the Port Salford extension. Uh, thank you Francis. So um, we've considered this site in a lot of detail and I'm looking at it from an engineer and geology point of view and the first aspect to consider as Francis mentioned is can the site be re-wetted? But when we look back at the history of this site, it's not a natural environment. The River Irwell used to flow very close um, to the southern boundary, and that was infilled and canalised with the Manchester Ship Canal. And recent works, including the diversion of the Saltai, means that, in essence, the PSE site now forms a base flow to the Saltai Brook. And the geological sequences beneath this site are a glacial fluvial sand and gravel, in essence, a free draining soil. So what's happening is we, the water is constantly being drawn from our site down to form the base flow to the salt eye. So the interaction over the last 100 years in terms of building a, an airport and the drainage infrastructure has resulted in the groundwater table dropping beneath this site to the fact that the peat is no longer saturated. So therefore, when we consider the opportunity for potential for resaturation of this, then fundamentally it, you couldn't achieve that because the site is free draining and it is being, the, the groundwater is drawn into the salt eye, which is within the phase one of Port Salisbury extension area. Um, and then we other have major influences. You know, if we did allow this to re-wet and in theory, if we could get the groundwater table to rise, which is probably not a possible eventuality, we would create wetlands next to an aerodrome, which is not okay because of the civil aviation implications of increased bird strikes. And due to the levels of the site, we'd induce flooding onto the M62 and also ad adjacent development areas. So it's not a functional wetland and it's not a possibility in terms of an engineering prospect to bring that to fruition, unfortunately, in this instance. So, um, so we've looked at that and, and we've been through it and you know, and establish that the peat is drained in this scenario and it will continue to drain and there's no real mechanism to consider the possibility of re-wetting. Um, we've also looked at engineering options to ensure the delivery of this site in a sustainable way and we're acutely aware that the delivery of this site should not involve wholesale extraction of peat. So we've devised a number of sustainable engineering options and appraisals that will allow the Port Salford industrial scheme to come forward um, with its trimodal rail, highway infrastructure and industrial development in a way that retains the peat in situ using sustainable construction techniques. Um, so yeah, I think that's sort of where we've got to in terms of our synopsis. Sorry, when you say you, you've been looking at engineering to try and keep the peat in situ, you've been looking at it, is it, 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 how far have you looked at that in terms of whether it's possible or not, uh, both either theoretically possible or practically possible? Oh, we've, uh, Peel have commissioned detailed engineering studies. So we have looked at, um, when I say looked, we have analyzed, run computer modeling, geotechnical simulations, calculations, and we've come up with four engineering solutions 
that would facilitate um, the construction of the trimodal facility in accordance with current design standards for whether it's a CAT 123 highway. Um, as we mentioned before, the rail link, um, we go through different phases in the rail link, and that's now at the final detailed design stage for a rail link going over the P area. And um, again, with regard to the industrial development, we've got to the phase of actually um, foundation designs for the buildings and, and external infrastructure and hard standard, you know, are all done at a feasibility stage. Okay, thank you. Very helpful. Um, any other comments on uh, this issue? Uh, well, I'll start with the Wildlife Trusts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, obviously you visited the site, you know the site, so I, I'm not going to sort of dispute what you've found. Uh, just a couple of questions, though. How you, you said the peat was degraded. How far did this degradation go down? In our experience, you get to 30 centimetres and then you start getting good peat again. Well, just I won't, um, it's obviously the, the forum isn't necessary for you to ask questions of them, and it's for me to ask questions. So, uh, I think your point, I beg the, your, pardon. your point to the examination, obviously, to me, I guess, is, is, is question, querying the robustness of the assessment. I'll perhaps, it would, you know, if you generally GMCA would respond. I think it's probably fair to let Peel respond to that because it is helpful to me. But if you've got <laughs> any other other points, then please make them. Yeah, one of the techniques that we use is deep trench bonding. This goes down two metres, it recompacts the peat, it gets rid of any fracturing and um, peat pipes that might be there, um, and actually helps, it provides a peat wall that retains the water within the peat mass. So it is possible to re-wet the area. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll get the other, any other points as well before I reopen it up. So. Um, with, regress, with respect to sorry, with respect to the comments about it being degraded farmland, in the past two years it's grown oilseed, rape, carrots, wheat, and silage. So it's still in use in parts. It's still in use productively. Otherwise, the farmer wouldn't have used it. So I'm not quite sure where this degraded farmland comes from. As far as it being dry, from my own experience of the site, it has uh, in areas it has phragmites and sedges there, which are plants associated with wet, so it still has wet within it. Um, I feel as though we're giving up on this land too easily. I think this land could be made use of for wildlife and farming for many, many decades to come, and to throw concrete all over it isn't the right idea. A recent bird watching session there brought willetit, snipe, stone chat, yellow armor, rebunting, a reasonable numbers, all of which, as said before, are um, red data birds. So I'd like that to be taken into consideration when these things are being said about this site. It is of great use to me as an ornithologist and great use to our nation for many things, for such as growing crops and having marsh on it and sustaining wildlife, which we sorely need to maintain and look after. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, wildlife Trust, your sign still up. Is that... Um... No, nope, sorry. Thank you. Um, just because it will be helpful to me, obviously, because um, GMCA might not be able to answer the question, if you could perhaps res respond from your perspective on those points and before I let GMCA come back. Um, looking at the peak degradation point, um, as I'm sure you're aware, we've used the Von Post classification system um, to log over 100 locations, and really we've classified it in H4 to H6, which is a pseudo-fibrous, it's not really a pseudo-fibrous material, it's a very organic silt. So we can see that the log, it's been logged in detail and analyzed. So um, yeah, we have logged it and classified it. And um, in, to pick up your point about the wetland habitats, the, um, the fact that we don't believe it's restorable to a bog habitat or even extensive polluticulture doesn't mean that we don't think that as part of the landscape of the scheme, wetlands shouldn't be created, because absolutely, yes, there is the possibility of creating reed beds, pools, um, subject to bird strike air safety considerations uh, as part of the structural landscape of, of the extension, which is one of the, um, one of the allocation specific policies. Okay, thank you. Any one more point? 
As far as bird strike is concerned, the airport's been there. It was actually Manchester Airport initially. It's now Barton Airport. It's now City Airport. And in all my time bird watching there, I've never seen a bird strike there. And I do bird watch this area a lot. It's area on my map, area 50, 55, 49 and 50. I know the area well. I go there often. I've never seen a bird strike, seen any problems whatsoever. I can't quite understand that point. Okay. Why we suddenly mention bird strikes. Okay, understood. Um, is that the same point? I saw you, I saw you nodding in agreement. So, thank you, thank you for that. Any other points you want to make before I, I come back to GMC on? on I mean, we're obviously going to go through the criteria, and there might be some things that come up through the criteria. But um. sorry, do you want me to respond on the bird strike? Point oh, well, clarity? yes, if you want, yeah. Um, it, quite simply, there's no wet, there's no uh, standing water bodies. So if we create standing water bodies, we'd have a huge influx of avian life, and that will contravene um, the national. Uh, um, transport guidelines. Okay. Yeah, ju yeah. yeah just, just on this issue about um, degradation. Sorry. So I think we might be slight confusion over the terminology. The degradation is in terms of the peat, hmm. not in terms of the agriculture. I'm, I'm quite certain, you know, the agricultural, the ph farmer is uh, very satisfied with the agricultural use because it is peat. Uh, that's the whole point. But y you can't complain simultaneously about loss of grade one agricultural peat and then say you want to preserve it as well. That's a, that's a complete contradiction. So, um, yes, it's going to be taken out of agricultural production, but that isn't ultimately what people who are focused on the, the peat bogs are seeking to do. And can I just make a wider point that Peel um, controls uh, a lot of the peat bog to the north of the motorway and so as part of the specific details of this proposal the potential to provide compensatory enhancements on that area that is uh, in much better condition is available and in the control of Peel. So we are perfectly capable of providing compensatory measures to enhance that which is um, north of the M62. And that, I suspect, whatever happens in the, in the long run about peat and national policy will be part of it. We'll, because if you read the, nation, the, um, the Peat Action Plan for England, they talk about the billions of pounds it will cost to deal with the um, huge areas of peat if you want to, to preserve them it's very expensive to achieve, but this is an instance where Peel would be able to directly benefit peat um, and restoration of peat, but the other side of the motorway. Okay, thank you. So just please come back and it's, it's a point. Bird strike, well, if you look back at my records, it's a college unit, have of 173,000 records I've done since 2005. One of the records will say that uh, nearly 400 pink-footed geese landed on that peel there. They would be a potential bird strike, and there was no bird strike there. The planes were flying in and out of that. The birds are well aware of that. The other one is, is the point that's being made about the north of the railway line, and it'll be a great restoration. I showed you this picture before. That's what the Wildlife Trust have done to this peat, to a peat extraction site from 2012. That's what's been done by Peel since 2012. This site is exactly the same as that landscape. If they cared so much about it, why haven't they done that already? Okay, well, we're getting... That's in. a point. It's yeah. a point. It's a point, it's a point, it's a point, it's a point you've made. Yeah. Um, it's a point you've made, and it's a point I've taken on board, but it's, it's um, uh, you know, we are talking about this allocation and, and what the policy says about this allocation. A final perhaps point before we start getting into it, because this isn't on the end of it, because we've got the criteria to talk about. So, but final point from Wildlife Trust. Yes, thank you. Just um, a point on the case of us wanting our cake and eat it in terms of agricultural land and retaining the peat. We're advocating wetter farming, um, which is something that is gaining momentum in the area. Uh, and certainly will be kind of funded down the line. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so um, just on this point, uh, we've, we've specifically looked at this as well, this, this wet farming concept, and we'll just explain what the difficulty is there as well. Yes, it's, it's similar to the reasons why bog restoration isn't possible in this case, because... Polluticulture, the you would really need the water table 
within sort of five centimetres of the surface um, to grow particular crops that, that, you know, reeds or in some cases sphagnum, although I don't think that would be feasible at this stage. Um, but it's similar to the reasons that Mr Dyer explained. It's very hard to keep the water table on this site up at that level for engineering reasons. And also, the we, we talked about the bird strike reasons as well, but there's just a lot of preferential drainage pathways, which would mean it's extremely difficult to do that from a technical point of view here. And um, I think the point was raised this morning by GMCA that absolutely this is the right thing to do with peat generally, but you'll have much better results in the core of Chat Moss north of the M62 where there are a, a lot fewer constraints in terms of heavy engineering, remodelling of the ground, etc. Our, our key point, just for the avoidance of doubt, there is no prospect of bog restoration through natural regeneration, even with rewetting. I'll just say that again. No prospect of bog restoration through natural regeneration, even with rewetting. We've looked at this, we've looked at it in very considerable detail, and that is the conclusion. Okay, thank you. I'm going to, I, want, I do want to move on. So. Uh, yeah, uh, my, my response is that it's still Grade 1 farmland and it is still peat. Yes. And, 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 and that needs uh, not I, to be forgotten in all of this. Uh, don't worry. Yeah. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's very difficult not to make the points, but because we've talked about Grade 1 agricultural land, we've talked about peat, uh, I'm fully aware of the state of the land, so... Does that, do you, GMC, want to say anything else from what you've heard? No, sir. Okay. Right, so we'll, we'll get back into the criteria then and where some of these criteria are relevant to the points we can pick them up. Um, dear, where did we get to? We got to... Number 19, no. <laughs> uh, we were at... We, uh, we, we just... We were at... Uh, We've done just after 11, sorry, yes, because this is where the suggestion is for the, yes, the uh, moving yeah. some of the text from reason justification into yeah. uh, the policy, which is again, which was about the 10% the net gain yeah. and the uh, setting out where uh, the net gain should be focused. And it also talks about restoration of lowland raised bog and complementary habitats in the chat moss to the north. So um, any other point, again, Familiar to any other points, Wildlife Trust? Thank you. Just on relation to restoration of um, the wildlife sites to the north, a lot of those restoration works are already happening. Um, they're already funded. And as was alluded to before, Natural England have bought quite a bit of land around there and are restoring it. Um, just the point that any restoration to the north would have to be on land that would not normally be restored by any other means. Thank you. Sorry, just make, make a point, pick, pick that up. The, 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 you want the policy to be to, to say that it wouldn't restore land that would be restored under the image. So this is like additional just, additional benefit. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly, yes. So not just... just Carrying on with what's uh, business mm. as usual, this should be something uh, um, in addition to. Yeah. Okay, I understand the point. Um, any? Well, it, it would have to be because yeah. the whole point is net gain. So if it's already being done, it's not a net gain. Okay. Okay. Understood. Okay. Um, thank you. We'll move on then to criterion twelve, um, which is about incorporating uh, high levels of landscaping, including retention and replacement of existing woodland hedgerows ponds where practicable. Um, to minimise impact, visual impacts on the wider landscape and mitigate the environmental impacts in development, including noise. So again, this is a, a, a policy or criterion which has uh, appeared in other policies. Uh, the reference to 10% biodiversity net gain has been moved because of all the changes proposed. Any, any points on that particular criterion that haven't been raised before? I don't know if that's signed. Thank you. Cri Criterion 13 is, and um, again, familiar, I think now, support the objects of the great, great Manchester Wetlands Nature Improvement Area, originally said, and avoid harm to protected species. Um, and criterion 14 is this issue about ecological surveys, including breeding winter birds and so on. 
certainly had to make sure I was reading the same, it's exactly the same policy. In, indeed, yeah. so, um, same as the earlier discussion. From yeah. So we've had the same point, and the same point there would be what was discussed earlier. Um, That's right, sir. About the, that policy, but did you get wildlife trust? Sorry, just a, an additional point there. The um, survey of potential compensation areas uh, goes on to say to demonstrate that displacement is possible into the wider landscape. Yeah. And that begs the question, what if it isn't possible? Uh, and I'm just wondering if the demonstrate that should actually be changed to demonstrate if displacement is possible. Because as far as I'm aware, the surveys haven't yet been undertaken. My understanding of this is that if one is uh, posing a, an area of compensation and one is to demonstrate that it's that displacement is possible, um, so I think the two things are linked. I don't think this is an if. I think that the compensation areas need to... The, the, if I suppose the, the yeah. point is, um, is, is the survey. Let's say let's, mm. let's go into a little scenario. The, the survey take place. I think the conclusion is that it, it can't be. You know, it isn't demonstrated that displacement is possible into the wider landscape. So then, what happens? Well, under the logic of the policy, one would one would have to find some other compensation area mm. that does. But. Um, and if one couldn't, then you, your app, you, in your application, you would then have a, you know, a conflict with one item in a multi-faceted allocation policy. You'd have to make a judgment call as to whether that meant there was an inconsistency with the policy read as a whole, let alone the plan read as a whole. Um, so that's how it would work. But I think that's what this is driving at, if I've got it right. I'm just checking my ecological notes here. Just bear with me for one moment. Um, so I don't think it's meant to be... In have I got this right? Can I just check? Because I'm just reading this. And good, 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 good. Well, that's a relief. So, <laughs> I've got. Yes, that's where we are with it. So it's not not meant to be an if. It's meant to be a that. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, but I think there are things for me to think about with that. Those two uh, criteria, anyway. There are. And what we talked about, and particularly that, in, you know, as well as other things about. Um, that list of species and so on and so forth. So there are things for me to take away on that. Um, 15 is protect and enhance surrounding habitats, including the Fox Hill Glen site of biological importance, which I, according to my site visit map is in the Barton Aerodrome area. All right, um, I don't think I've got anything, anything to say about that. Seems, again, as, as with all these things, uh, one, one would have to assume that, that is possible to achieve, but bearing in mind that that site is not within, as according to this, is not within the allocation or immediately adjacent. Um, yes, I was just wondering whether one would roll it in with the BNG, with the biodiversity net gain mm. item in any event, but, um, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, hard on that one. Sorry? Microphone, sorry, I can't hear you. So Fox Hill Glen has been destroyed. It's gone. Right, okay. It shouldn't have been, but it's gone. Right. That, that, but that, the Fox Hill Glen is outside was, this... Well, well yeah, but it was, all, it, was, it was always mentioned in all these things that right. were going to go on, that it would be protected. One of the things that it would do to protect it, well, it's gone now, because there's an access point that's on the airport. There's some work going on there. I'm not quite sure what it is. There's some work going on the airport at the moment. Quite a lot of diggers there. A lot of stuff has been dumped on there. And from what I can see, because I don't have any private access to that site, but I can see you in my blocking us over it, that Fox Hill Glen no longer exists. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, can we just quickly respond on that? Because it's, it's, it's a designated SBI, as I understand. I might need to bring the ecology unit in on this, but um, yeah, it is. there have been works uh, to the aerodrome which have affected the SBI. The ecology unit have been out to survey it since and have confirmed that it still merits designation as an SBI. Is there anything? Want to add? Yes, hello. I'm, I'm Derek Richardson. I'm an ecologist uh, with the GM Ecology Unit. We designate and survey SBIs. 
Um, it has been under significant pressure, that S particular SBI, because it's in the middle of the aerodrome. Um, so they, they like to keep the vegetation very low, and there are safety concerns with access. Um, so we, we have dealt with a, a couple of planning applications there um, that have involved uh, losses and harm to the SBI, but we've agreed compensation packages um, for those, um, those works on site. I, I haven't been there for eight, eight months, 12. 12 months, so I would, I would need to go and have a look at what the works are underway there now. To, but to I think the point is from this policy point of view, obviously, is, uh, they perhaps need to get into too much detail on this because the policy um, requires it to be protected. Um, that I guess the, what, what's there to protect uh, if it, you know, it's something to assess at the time of application. So I don't think I can, you know, if, if, you know, if there's something to protect, the question for me is, well, can it be protected? What's left? If there's nothing, if there's if some other action outside this plan has had a negative impact on that, well, some some unfortunate, unfortunate, but it's not nothing I can do with anyway. So I think I'll probably leave that there. To be honest, I don't think there's much more point we're talking about Fox Hill, uh, Glen site there. Um, so I will move on. But thank, I understand. Obviously, there is an issue. But I don't keep um, sorry. What concerns me is by just sort of saying Fox Hill Glen site is not an issue then uh, we are at the mercy of people being uh, Well, I'm not, sorry, I'm not saying it's not an issue. I'm saying that the, the policy says protect and enhance Fox Hill Glen. Um, that's what the policy says. You know, it's not, yeah. I'm not saying it's not an issue, but it's not, not much else I can say, because if it's, it's, it's a designated SBI now, it will presumably be a designated SBI until it's not. And, you know, it, what else can what else can we say about the policy? The policy says protect right. it and enhance I it. Ah, yes, I understand. Yeah. Criterion 16 is to such be deleted. That's about habitat regulation assessment, and that's again tied into other uh, discussions about whether that's suitable for allocation policy. So it is hard to sign up. Is that, okay. Moving then on to criterion 17, uh, mitigate the risk of surface water and groundwater flood risk, incorporating green stable drainage systems. Again, this is the same um, same policy that was in other policies. Any particular points on flooding or drainage that anyone wishes to raise that haven't already been covered? Nothing that hasn't been covered. Nothing that hasn't been no, covered. Nothing so. around the table. Okay. A fairly standard, obviously, it's a fairly standard policy. Uh, Again, we're back to Pete in Criterion 18, which is uh, minimise the loss of the carbon storage function of the peat and avoid any adverse impacts on hydrology of the surrounding areas of peat mossland, while ensuring that there is no potential future problems of land stability or subsidence. Um, so yes, I mean, again, we've talked about this leg, but in terms of this, the wording, yeah, uh, microphone, please. Uh, the wording is fine, it's just that, um, the subsidence and the, the the stability of the land, it's right by the M62 and the M62 is in a cutting and that, that means that the land has had to be dug out to actually get access to the stable ground underneath. And so I concern myself about the stability of the very That's large the warehousing on that site okay. and the compression of the peat, which will then cause further problems. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that is another dimension. To be fair, I've got to yeah. list in the, all the other dimensions, but it's a it's a fair point. I think they're well. We've heard some stuff about the engineering solutions that are being considered. I think I've read some documentaries talk about some of these solutions and what that means, and it's it's added to the list. So thank you. Um, do GMC just want to come back on that point about subsidence? You don't want to come back on it. No, sir. Oh, okay. 19 is about protecting the quality of water courses through and around the site. Again, that's a fairly standard policy. I've got no particular questions about that. Any points about that? No. Criterion 20, protect the amenity of remaining residential properties within or on the edge of the allocation, including the, through the provision of appropriate landscaped buffers. Again, seems fairly self-explanatory. Um, one, one again, one would assume that that's, that's actually possible to achieve on a site of this scale? Yeah, well, yes, one would assume so, and, and 
looking at the residential properties in question, one would say yes. Okay. 21, provide an appropriate property to Barton Moss Secure Care Centre. Yes, yeah, so that's on, that's on Barton Moss Road, which the previously meeting of residents and staff. So it's a, it's a, it's a, yes, it's on the, where the public arrival, where the track, the, the road goes down. Um, again, I don't think there's anything I've got to say about that. If anyone does, just put your signs up. Um, air quality, so 20, criteria 22, impl implement an agreed strategy for dealing with local air quality impacts. Slightly different way of expressing yeah, it, it is, as to what yeah. it's usually expressed, but I think it's the same yeah. general it's approach. The same, it's the same approach. We may, we may look at the wording of that. Indeed. Um, What's 23 doing here? So, so just on 22, so you agree, yeah. Yes, I'm oh, sorry, yes. So 23, um, give, positive <laughs> give positive consideration to the incorporation of renewable and low carbon energy infrastructure. This has been removed generally in most of the pol allocation policies uh, because it's covered by generic policies. That is there a particular reason for it's keeping it here? We've had this debate. I'm gonna to look to the left as to what the reason was for keeping this here. I think I was on slash and burn, but there's a, there's a yeah. plea for it to remain. So I think I think we felt this was such a it was a such a, a, a development of such scale that there was a real potential for incorporating particularly solar solar PVs on the roofs, which wasn't necessarily covered specifically in the generic policy. That's why we quite liked keeping it. Obviously, you will you will consider and decide whether it's appropriate to keep it. But I mean, that, that was our why we kicked against probably our august advice <laughs> from our KC, but. Um, Okay. You'll decide okay. whether it is all cost or buy. Okay. Fine, I suppose as well. All right. Okay. Okay. We'll have a think about that. Um, and then twenty-four employing methods. So again, oh, we're back to the issue about archaeology. Um, and I think this is again the same word as in other policies. I'm perhaps I've you know indicated I might I'm, I may or may not have some thoughts on that at some point, but. Um, I think that the aim of the policy is clear, um, and presumably there are things, issues on site, I suspect, which, uh, which have been identified and which is why it's referred to. Any questions, any points on archaeology? No? So finally, there is the, again, fairly standard approach of suggesting additions of the mineral safeguarding um, uh, policy, a reference to the mineral safeguarding policy. And again, I've got nothing to ask about that. Any other points on development requirements? Um, and so on before I move on to viability. No, thank you. Okay. Um, I may just, in the first instance, ask, you know, because this is, I think it's fair to say this is the, if not the most unviable. On the base of it, face of it, sorry, um, it's only one of them. So, one, mine one. Is, 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 is currently yes. in the Three Dragons. I've got my figures wrong on this before, so I've got my figures wrong. Uh, apologies, but to, Not to, at all. in the red to the tune of around 132 million. That's, that's right. Ish. Yeah. Um, but there's been a lot of correspondence, uh, both through written statements and sure. response to MIQs and statements going around about how that may or may not be addressed. So, I think, again, it's probably easier. For you to explain if I give an the overview. position. There, Thank so. you. I'll, I'll do that. Yes. So, um, so yes, the three dragons work identified a, a large viability gap. So category four, as you know, category category four doesn't mean you know that's the end of it. Category four is consideration needs to be given to whether or not public funding uh, is likely to be available, if you like, to uh, to resolve the issue. So. I'll try and do this chronologically. Um, the position as at the date of our matters statement, so that's M21.1, is recorded on well, the last penultimate page of that document, page 25, in response to your question 21.30, reasonable prospect, your you know, standard reasonable prospect question. And for the reasons explained, um, 
with all the documents cross-referred to in paragraphs 21.43 through to 21.45, the conclusion reached at that stage when one was dealing with this potentially very large gap in residual value on the one hand, and it's a particular the strategic transport costs on the other. Um, the position recorded and explained in that document, our matter statement, was that the, there would be uh, there would likely to be a compelling case for public funding to supplement contributions from linked developments such as Port Salford extension towards those strategic, I suppose the clue is in that word, strategic, strategic transport costs, because they're not just all related to Port Salford extension. Um, so that's where we were as at the time of the matter statement and obviously before that there was our response to your preliminary questions which had a similar uh, point but there was a bit more elaboration as we as we move through time. Now more recently more recently there has been um, further consideration and dis well there's continuing further consideration and discussions between the relevant uh, parties and, and Peel, and they are, a summary of those is captured in this uh, new Statement of Common Ground, GMCA 60, 60. Um, and two, I mean, it needs to be read, it's relatively short, five and a half pages, five and a quarter pages, um, but the gist of it is that um, it does seem to be the case that um, values um, can reasonably be attributed to be considerably higher than the values attributed in the Three Dragons work. Um, so that's section two of the note. It does seem to be the case that there's a, you know, a very good prospect of the highway costs not being um, as expensive, being considerably less expensive than the uh, overall scheme costs, which was considered at the time of the Three Dragons work. That's section three of the note. Um, and that, um, the conclusion, adding those two things together, is that the viability gap, which was identified as being considerable at the stage of the earlier work, uh, will be very, potentially will be, and probably will be very significantly reduced. Um, and in any event, um, and the significantly reduced viability gap is referred to in paragraph 5.1 of that statement. And so, um, and so on the basis of that work, you'll recall that when the perceived viability gap was very considerable indeed, we had expressed the view for the reasons explained in our matter statement that there was a compelling case for public funding to make up that gap, because these are strategic works, not just related to Port Salford extension. Um, and so similarly, if that gap is to reduce and to reduce very significantly, as this latest piece of work explains, um, then to the extent that there's a need for public funding, um, as far as we're concerned, and this is agreed to by Peel, but obviously in particular, the public authorities view of this one would have thought is particularly significant, um, there is a potentially strong case for public funding, but in these circumstances we're dealing with um, obviously a smaller gap um, in viability terms than the gap that we were previously discussing in our masses paper. So even if you take it head on as the worst case as it was at the time of the earlier work, we consider the yes, it's a category four site, so does that, you know, what are the prospects of public funding? Well, as far as we were concerned, uh, the prospects were... Um, were compelling um, and in fact we expressed a view that there was a significantly beyond reasonable prospect that the development would be delivered. Um, significantly beyond reasonable prospect. Um, and so, as I say, if that gap then significantly reduces because the values are likely to be considerably higher than the values assessed by Three Dragons and the strategic transport costs may very well be significantly lower than the cost put in in that work. Obviously, the gap then becomes much smaller, potentially. And, um, you know, if there was a strong case for <laughs> the very large gap, there would be a strong case for public funding for a much smaller gap. So that's where we've got to. So we, and we obviously have across the room, we have um, site promoters who are very keen to bring the, uh, to bring the allocation forward. Um, but in terms of the position, that's where we are, sir. 
So there are in effect two major steps. Major step number one is where were we before this more recent discussion, this more recent discussion and analysis, and second step is where are we now as a result of all of that. In both eventualities, whether you take it head on at the worst case or whether you take on board this more recent work, in both cases we're convinced that there's um, every likelihood of public funding being available to resolve the um, to resolve whatever the viability gap might be. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before I open it up a little, I probably will come to Peel first because it's logical from their perspective to see see what they say about this. With this. Um, but in terms of the range, and I think one of your responses to our, if not more than one of your responses to our um, questions, set out the, the, the sort of types of you know or the potential public funds that could be um, looked at in terms of. Um, Achieving right, this kind of funding. Um, the question, I guess, is, and it may be, the answer is it's, it's premature to that, but whether any of those public funds have been, you know, any AI, any committed or as, uh, in the process of getting any of these or, or any of that kind. It, it, the answer is well, it's too early for that, then fine, but um, just, just wondered. Well, it's going to be some and some, to be honest, because you'll, you'll be referring to our response to your preliminary questions, I think, PQ42. Mm. And our response, which is in paper GMCA 3.1, run through, uh, in particular in relation to Port Salford, run through, run through the various uh, pots of funding, um, some of which related to the first phase of the Western Gateway Infrastructure Scheme, WIGIS, I think you called it, mm -hmm. um, or part WIGIS, if, you want, <laughs> if I can imagine such a concept. Um, and that has already had um, a capital investment funded by a private public partnership. So some, some money's already come in, but in relation to the extra over funding for future things which aren't already covered, no, there aren't any committed, there aren't any commitments yet, as I understand it. Well, some of, some of, obviously some of the infrastructure that, that, that's, if you say that the WIGIS. Yes, um, part WIGIS. Part WIGIS is, 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 is necessary, uh, it's in the necessary list. Yeah. So some of that, that relates to this, then, or as a, pre as a prerequisite? The, I don't want to mislead you at all. My understanding is that in relation to the sums of money that have been discussed in relation to this viability gap, which may well be smaller than it was originally thought to be, um, there aren't any committed sources of funding yet for them because it's too early to, to have reached that. All I'm saying is that WIGIS, the Western Gateway Infrastructure Scheme, already has some has already had some capital investment funded by private and public partnerships, so part of it's already secured, but the remaining WIGIS um, isn't yet the subject of committed funding, if I've got this right. Yes, good. So what we're talking about here, because remember, forgive me, um, if we take a step back, this is all about, we make an allocation, is there a, I'm trying to summarize this, you know, is there a reasonable prospect, is it likely that the allocation would, co would come forward. Obviously, viability in some instances is, re is relevant, particularly relevant to that. In this case, one would have thought, you know, particularly relevant. Um, we know at one end of the spectrum what the worst case position is. We know that more recently that worst case may well be considerably overstated, but in either eventuality, um, the question is public funding. Um, and in order to make a plan, one doesn't need to be able to guarantee things. One needs to be able to look as best as one can at the evidence base and reach a judgment call as to whether there's a reasonable prospect. And here, um, the way that we've expressed it is that, well, I mean, we've gone way beyond reasonable prospect. We've got compelling case for public funding, as you know, in one of our papers, and in another paper, significantly beyond reasonable prospect the development will be delivered. So, you know, we've gone a step beyond, considerably beyond what the threshold test, if you like, should be. Okay, thank you. Um, just to, um, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute for, on this. Um, of course. And then, obviously, in terms of this site, then, we are potentially relying on a few unknowns in terms of, so we're relying on um, the infrastructure needing to be built out, you know, the, the, if you like, the criterion three, infrastructure needs to be built out before development could commence on here. There's obviously, there may be issues related to that. In. Um, in terms of timing, if nothing else, then we're obviously relying on change, potentially relying on a change in the transport mitigation. Although I guess you're arguing you, 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 you don't, you don't require that. No, yeah. I'm taking it 
this yeah. is my reference to head on. So you yeah. take it at its worst, and its worst was the three dragons work yeah, with the yeah. eye watering sums from the highways works, relatively low values generated by the development. You know, big gap. That's the big gap that we were dealing with in all our earlier work until GMC sixty, which okay. is so you're not you're not yesterday. relying on you are not relying no, no. on that coming down. I, I'm okay. relying on I'm relying on where we were. I'm I'm introducing a note of what we okay. regard because we signed the statement of common ground, what we regard as a note of realism, which is that it does look to be pretty clear, to be quite frank, that the values are higher mm -hmm. than have been assessed and the transport infrastructure costs are likely to be lower than were assessed. But I'm resting my case, if you like, particularly on where we were, because even at a worst case, as far as we're concerned, compelling case for public funding beyond reasonable prospect or whatever the language was that I read out to you just now. But, but either way, of, you know, whichever scenario plays out, there will be a need for public some public services. Yes, unless, some unless yeah. in, in a further iteration that, that, that gap, you know, gets removed completely. I mean, and that's crystal ball gazing, but, you know, yes. Hmm? Yeah, and there is, yeah, there are some scenarios where there, would, there wouldn't be a, a need for public funding at all. Okay. But, you know, we have to, you know, look at this on, on, on the various bases. So, but my point is that even looking at it on its worst case, um, this is a site where there's, you know, at least a reasonable prospect and then just to uh, kind of so remind me, and it may be that thinking's changed as time's moves on anyway, um, the time scales for when you expect this to be on site and completed. I'm thinking obviously that that's uh, plays into how long you've got, if you like, sure. to deal with the issues. And I think we've, we've anticipated delivery at the end of the plan period, so delivery by 2037, but certainly starting post, I think probably the promoter has higher ambitions in terms of time scale, but we've, that's what we have anticipated. It would be towards the end of the plan period. In terms of start, though, because I, um, I, I seem 2020, to remember there was, there was wasn't, wasn't a huge, a huge time scale for this. It was sort of quite, quite a quick delivery. Um, I think we've, what, well, we've anticipated start around 2031, completion okay. 20, so maybe not as quick as you remembered. No. And so on that viability yeah. gap, and obviously the result of GMCA 60, the statement of common ground, is that the very large gap gets very significantly reduced and the ultimate conclusion is in paragraph 5.1, significantly reduced viability gap, significantly reduced viability gap. Mm -hmm. So the public funding is, on that basis, is addressing a, well, this is, is, a, this is a much, much, much smaller gap than where we were, but my, I'm trying to stress that, you know, I'm taking this on both bases, you know, as was and as seems to be the case now. On either basis, we're, we're satisfied. The, uh, just... Paragraph five point one. Yes. Doesn't quantify that. that no, that's that because is in the, that is in the document, isn't it? I've seen. Mm. It, it is, but there are different there are different scenarios. So you know, as to where money might come and whether or not people would be able to, in effect, translocate funding from other other schemes that are on foot. Um, or whether we could, if you like, rely on contributions from Peel, the same developer, uh, to feed into the, this equation. So there, there, there are whole, as I understand it, there are a whole a range of different, I hate this word, scenarios, there are a mm -hmm. range of different ways of looking at this. Okay. But you're probably thinking of the figures in 3.17 on the transport cost side, and the... Um, and the increased values which are referred to earlier in the paper. But yes, there are a whole bunch of figures, but I don't, I, I may, think, I, may also, I, think, I think I'm right in saying that in Peel's um, written statement, I think you've suggested a, an alternative figure for the, for the gap as well. So I'm possibly yeah. thinking about that as well. You, you might well yeah. be so, but unless I've wholly misunderstood the statement of common ground and you know, I, I wouldn't put it past me to have done so, but um, as I understand it, there are various. There isn't one scenario which is addressed in that paper. There are various different scenarios, you know, in, in sources of funding, including, as I've said, this point about Peel being the developer of other schemes and contributions being able to be transferred, so to speak, which is um, which is uh, referred to at 3.19 of the paper. So, okay, thank you um, for now. Um, I think this point useful if Peel, if there's anything you wish to come back on. 
Yeah, or okay, explain. so um, I'll just introduce the team because there's a number of people who help address this. There's lots of numbers and uh, lots of things to deal with. Um, so obviously I'm, I'm going to start talking and then um, just going down the line. Yeah, good afternoon, Andrew Bickerdyke uh, from Turley. <coughs> afternoon, Matt Spilsbury, Senior Director, CBRE, Charter Surveyor. Good afternoon, Jamie Ellis from TTHC, Transport Planning Consultant. Okay, if I just start with an overview, um, if that's okay, uh, obviously you've got the benefit of that updated note. Now the position is, the as far as uh, we are concerned, we've done an enormous amount of work on this, um, and obviously that all happens behind the scenes, and um, as a commercial organisation, obviously we're looking at a commercially viable proposal and a deliverable proposal. And the starting point is that we... Um, undoubtedly say this is a, a deliverable scheme and it's deliverable, we believe, on the values that are achievable and we don't think there's a need for public subsidy. Now, of course, this type of scheme, as my friend has already indicated, is precisely the type of scheme that can benefit from public subsidy because it translates directly into jobs and that is what politicians like to see. Not that there isn't funding for housing these days, but certainly this type of project that unlocks development, um, that leads to jobs, is uh, an extremely attractive proposition. And you see that with what's already happened in phase one. So um, it may well be that it achieves public funding, but to your question about whether there's any certainty at that point, not that there needs to be certainty, but no, we, we've not pointed to a particular fund that will provide the money. What we have done is look at Three Dragons work and um, we're distinguishing here from anything related to um, the housing work that they've done on viability. But in this particular area, specialist knowledge is particularly important. And you're going to hear from Mr. Spilsbury about the work that he has done. He um, is a specialist in this area. And in particular, most importantly, the values in the Three Dragons assessment which is 1.7 million pounds per hectare is far too low. And it's far too low for a number of different reasons. First of all, the evidence base for that goes back to late 2020. Since then, a number of things have happened. Remember, that's just, just at the start of COVID. There has been uh, a huge increase in the demand for logistics as more and more people have moved to online shopping and um, logistic demand is sky high. And that has a direct impact on values. The council in the notes uh, are accepting of um, the fact that you would expect values to be at least two and a half million pounds a hectare. We're talking about 68.5 hectares here of net developable area. In fact, uh, Mr. Spilsbury um, believes the values that could be achieved in this location, given where it's located, are closer to three and a half million pounds a hectare. So immediately, that is a significant answer to this issue. Obviously, these things change, but um, it's really important that because of updated evidence, trends in the market, and the locational view that Peel as a commercial operator have about this location, which is now already established, um, the values are much, much higher. And that, that's hugely significant. Um, the second point to make, which the council has made, if I, if I may say so, Mr. Shuttleworth has made, is that we're talking here about proposals that are not gonna come on stream you know, in the next couple of years. We're looking in a plan-making system to a position where it, it will be delivered um, closer to 10 years from now. And as a consequence of which you could, you know, we, we could shower you with endless figures and forecasts in relation to this exercise, but who knows what the price of steel will be in 12 months' time, let alone in 10 years' time. So there needs to be a sense of... Um, realism and a sense of proportionality about getting too hung up about the numbers but we wouldn't be progressing all this work if we didn't think the long-term trend in logistics was extremely positive 
and extremely positive in a location like this. So um, it's important to, to say that the, the three dragons were, well, you know, useful because they, the council have done what they're required to do, which was employ viability experts. It was a very high level approach and our analysis is much more significant. In addition, as Melinda Friend quite rightly says, as the councillors are aware, been looking at different highway solutions which are nothing like as costly. Um, nothing has been finalised in that, but there are a number of different um, out, out turns which don't involve such significant cost. And, and that's why we don't think there's any viability gap at all. But <clears throat> can I, as a, that's an overview, can I just then turn to Mr. Spilsbury just to give you um, the substance from the perspective of a surveyor specialising in viability. Thank you. Yep. To, to add to that, I think, um, as was said by, by Mr. Young, the, the Three Dragons work was quite high level. It was non-specific to a multimodal logistics facility. It was generic across GM. Um, our view is this is quite a unique scheme. It's a long-standing priority for Greater Manchester. Uh, it, it is prime and it is unique. And as a result, it's a, it's a high value market proposition. It's prime. Um, the 1.7 million pound per hectare value that was suggested back by- So I'm just going to bear in mind what we said about statements. I mean, Mr. Young said a lot of this already. So, I mean, if, 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 Mr. if Mr. Young covered it, I mean, Mr. Young's covered it. If you're happy with that level of detail- Yeah, I think uh, I mean, that's something that is missing. I don't think I need to hear it again just okay. from- yeah, okay. well, that's that's. I'm sorry, Mr. Spilsborough, I've stolen your thunder, and, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> he he's done all the work in respect of all our yeah. sites, in fact. But I, I mean, those I'll, are the headline points there, and it's just a couple of sp specific points yeah. about it. Yeah, I think the, the key point was um, that we we've had accepted by the local authority through discussions the lower point in the range, but actually with a higher point in the range, it can make a very very substantial difference. The, that isn't the only point that I wanted to make. The other point was around the cost analysis that's included for the site servicing uh, and infrastructure. So that's the on-site works, not to be confused with the strategic transport works, which we'll talk about separately. Um, but the, the on-site works has been detailed analysis informed by some of the technical due diligence prepared by Peel's consultants team, um, who you've heard from earlier and others, which has actually determined that the costs would be in the region of about 15 million pounds below the level that was identified in the Three Dragons work. So not just um, our view that actually the values would be substantially higher for this site, um, but also that the cost in delivering it would be significantly lower, which has, a, again, a, a benefit to the viability of the scheme and closes that gap we talked about. The other point that, that Mr. Young didn't make um, in providing the overview, and I'll just add in detail, is that in reaching our view that values in the current market could range to circa three and a half million pounds a hectare, we actually saw only a year ago values exceeding that by significant way, going up to five million a hectare. Um, it's very easily conceivable over the time scale that this site would be delivered for values to get up to those levels and beyond for a site okay. of this nature. Okay, I think that, that point's understood. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just emphasise that fifteen million pounds in cost savings is not to do with the highway. Yeah, and yeah, I understand okay. from your again previous submissions that there is a, and as Mr. Kukowski, there is a not not worst case scenario, if I want to the best phrase, in terms of transport mitigation that you've assessed, and you think there is a there's a different package potentially, or or if not, or or a cheaper package. Um, or rather, the mitigation can be carried out cheaper. Um, yeah, than, than what has been in Three Dragons work. I think. Absolutely, but can I just turn to Mr. Bickertar on that specific yeah, issue, yeah. just on that issue? Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, yeah, I just want to spend a, a couple of minutes outlining to you, if I may. Literally, be, please. Yeah, the, 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 the credibility of the, of the proposition that the highways package um, will be significantly less than assumed by Three Dragons. So the, um, the Three Dragons work assumes a, a strategic transport cost of £147 million in total, which is... £140 million pounds for a, a link road, uh, sorry, for a junction on the motorway, um, and £7 million pounds for a link road and some localised Im improvements. Um, the, um, the, the transport work underpinning places for everyone assumes that WIGIS, a scheme you've heard about, exists in the baseline, 
um, and in order to, to test what additional work is needed on top of WIGIS to deliver ports off an extension, it effectively bolts on the link road and, and, and the junction. Uh, and then comes up with an overall package of, of WIGIS plus link road plus junction to deliver Port Salford extension plus a number of other consents in, in, the, in the area including Port Salford phase one and a scheme known as, as Trafford Water to, which is in the note. The reality is the locality assessment work in uh, the underpins places for everyone accepts that that's probably uh, t too much. Um, the, 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 the model isn't sophisticated enough to um, have dissected those two things and identify which components are needed in combination because of the way in which the, the link road and the junction has been, have been bolted on. Um, so as a result, it invites us to undertake further work to assess, well look, in the context of Port Salford extension coming forward, um, how much of WIGIS with link road and junction is, is actually needed. Um, I won't go into to detail on the figures because you, you, you want me to be brief. Um, but, but effectively, what that does is take the £147 million strategic infrastructure cost on Port Salford, it reduces it right down to £74 million because what you're doing, you're bringing together retained parts of for Wigis, the bits that you, you need to keep in the context of the link road and junction coming forward, and you're allocating a cost to Port Salford extension. The balance of that cost of, uh, of the combined strategic infrastructure package uh, we have assumed for the purposes of this exercise, it's distributed to Port Salford Phase 1 and the Trafford Water Scheme, which is referenced in the, in the, in the Statement of Common Ground. Um, and when you, when you undertake that work, as I say, the proportionate cost of that combined package to Port Salford Extension is £74 million pounds, rather than the £147 million. Pounds. If, if you run that through to the appraisal with, um, with, with Mr Spilsbury's um, figures on values, then you start to bring that deficit right the way down to um, just over seven million pounds. Now that's taking a worst case scenario still because it assumes the Wiggis costs and the link road costs and the junction costs are at the upper end of the range, which uh, Sistra, the advisors to GMCA, have identified. Um, if you actually use figures towards the lower end of their ranges, um, then that, uh, that deficit actually turns into a surplus um, of, of nearly 28 million pounds. Appreciate all those figures are not in front of you. Uh, we can put them in front of you and provide you with the detail if, if that's helpful. Um, but it reinforces and demonstrates the, the route map to a lower transport cost um, and underpins our position that um, the public sector funding isn't needed here. Okay, thank you. I think it's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll park. No, I think we'll, we'll park that there. I think I think I've heard enough um, to understand your position. Um, uh, this side of the room, then, um, hard or yeah, any points you wish to make? I'd like to comment on the um, advocacy on the other side of the table. Um, I'm just re referring to a, a recent Financial Times survey about warehouse sales, and they are generally in decline throughout Europe. It states that UK's more developed warehousing market has been adjusted quicker than European counterparts, with deals being negotiated prices 10 to 20% lower than the peak early in the year. Now, the reference to warehouse demand was driven because of online purchases throughout the pandemic and thereafter. Following that, warehouse demand has been reduced to the point that one of the big warehouse users, Amazon, is now closing down warehouses. So that's a point that I'd just like to make. In terms of your costings, um, an adjustment from the three dragons. Costings, since that survey was probably done, uh, concrete, which will be a constituent part of warehousing, has gone up by 70%. In January 2020, it, the cost, oh, sorry, January 2021, the cost of concrete was £80 a cube for a C3240. It's now £136 a cube and will be going up another £15 a cube. So I'm not too sure how they've got lower costs. Re uh, steel has doubled from around about £460 a tonne to the current value around about £920 a tonne. When you're looking at roadway, aggregate's going to buy 35 to 40%. You're looking at tarmac, which relates to oil prices. We all know when we go to the petrol pumps, 
what the cost of that's risen around about 30 per cent along with the aggregate that uh, falls a constituent part to it so without the benefit of the three dragons assessment and the assessment across i would question severely what has been said i realize that um, values will relate to location uh, like anything else but uh, the values quoted there seem to be counter to the article uh, which has been established by the Financial Times. And the costings, I know, because I deal with those costings every day of my life. So I'm not so sure whether the gentleman over there, CBRE or whatever, uh, has got that information and has analysed that information and put that data in the current costings. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm probably not going to get into is a sort of very detailed discussion of a spreadsheet and the costs. I understand there's a there's a there's, there's a difference of opinion um, about those issues. I think you know it's not going to take us very far to to, to to drill down into what what cost for concrete they've put in there. I think it's for me again to go away. Well, I've got all that information in front. I've got your points. I've got um, if I want some additional information. I can ask for it, um, but I, 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 your, your point is taken. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so thank you. But, uh, but I, I said I didn't want to. I'm not necessarily going to ask them to respond particularly. I, I'm to that. sure. I'm sure you know that warehousing constituent parts are concrete and steel. Yes, quite, quite right. Yeah, and so, I'm going to drag this out, but I think there's, that if I may, there's just a really quick point to be made. Yeah, on just that. a very quick one. If um, Mr. Spills. Thank you. I, I just thought it might be sensible just to respond back on those points um, taken from the press. So I think it, the, the key point is that it's fair to say we've already reflected that reduction uh, in, in from the peak of the market that was referenced um, by the fact that I've, I made the point that it was five million a hectare and we're allowing considerably less than that. So my view is that the market has reduced, but actually it's stabilised and it stayed very strong uh, overall but it was an extremely hot point. Um, in addition, um, the lettings market, the, the, the level of demand for space has actually remained incredibly strong across the Northwest. There is not enough space for industrial and logistics in the Northwest to meet the demand of occupiers. So the market will continue to strengthen back from here. The other point around construction costs, very briefly, um, Peel's role in this, the way the assessment is considered is in relation to the servicing of the site and then the sale of service parcels. So that is preparatory works and infrastructure, so not steel prices. Um, but Turner and Townsend, who are a very reputable uh, construction cost organisation, engineering firm, have undertaken a very detailed technical assessment here. Uh, and actually found a more efficient engineering solution than was assessed in the original work. Uh, that has been reflected in our assessment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just one thing, I was, when, you, when you've been doing all of this work, taking us back to the issues referred to by your colleague about engineering solutions, different engineering solutions relating to the issues of ground stability and peak, they, they, are in, they are all plugged into your assessment as well and the additional, potentially additional costs associated with that. Correct, um, and, and the efficiency that's been determined through the technical work has been reflected in that as well, and that's part of the, the, re the acknowledged saving that's been made over the original assessment. Okay. Um, the, the, the work has led to you, because of the detail, led to beneficial savings against exactly as your question, looking at how to minimise the effect on people. Okay, thank you. One final point then on this. Uh, yeah, Turner Townsend, uh, one of the largest QS practices in the country. Uh, unfortunately, I come across their budgets on a regular basis, and generally, they're not up to date with current prices. Okay. Okay. Well, so similar point to what you've made earlier, so I accept that. I think it's um, yeah, and I understand. Obviously, you've got to some knowledge of these things. So, um, yeah. So, right. Any final points from GMCA? on viability, I no, think sir. covered it in some detail. Oh, yeah, so they'd be repeating things and okay. let's not do that. Right, so thank you. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, no, well. Uh, 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 with your microphone on. Yeah. Well, uh, so these general points. All right, well, okay. Um, 
let me just do my spiel then for my closing. Uh, one is obviously, first of all, any any points missed? Uh, anyone wish to raise about JP, JPA 29 that haven't been raised? Was it a general JPA 29 issue or was it a general issue of, uh, if we can, yes, if it's a, but let's try not to open up a new area of debate. So, yes, go on. Uh, so, so, yeah, I'm, I can before go we close. Yeah, yep, thank you. Uh, I just want to repeat back something to Mr. Kowalski that he said in November about you can never have too many houses, can you, sir, which he uh, said to Mr. Fieldhouse. And I feel today that we can never have too many houses, uh, too many houses and too many warehouses. And that's how I feel that, that from the summation of this. Um, the other thing is that economic things are given higher value and environmental and by, uh, ecosystem things are given lower value. So we don't feel we're on a, f a level playing field at all in this. We feel as though we're on the wrong side of the seesaw. This irre irreplaceable ecosystem is under threat of destruction. We are, we are, um, I'm, I'm, Once I am lost, a, it's lost forever. Uh, fine, and thank it. you, and you know, you have made that point. Yes. Um, obviously, we're, we're looking at it, uh, when, when you yes. say you're on the wrong side, we're looking at everything in the round. Yes. Um, you, obviously, you're, you're bound to be at a different point with some of the arguments that are made in the room, but we're looking at everything um, levelly, as you were, if, if that's even a word. Um, even, even afresh, I mean, you're looking at things for yourselves, aren't you? Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so as we disagree along this side of the table, um, who knows where you'll land on these points. We'll find out in due course. Quite. So anyway, I w if there's nothing else then, I will draw. To Sorry, Can yes, one. Just make one statement Please. on behalf of the beloved Muslims. Uh, I think we must all remember that in destroying nature, we finally destroy ourselves. Okay. And I feel as though the green belt should be left okay. to help nature recover. Fine. And I, and I, and I, I hate... Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. I understand the point. Um, right. I am now drawing today. I'm going to adjourn today um, and we will return in, um, I think, a week after next, Tuesday, more, Tuesday, the 28th of February, I believe. Uh, we will be talking about sites in Tameside. So Tameside, again, that's, that's me again. Nice. So um, <laughs> thank you all for your contributions <laughs> today and over the last couple of days for those who've been here for the two days. Uh, very much appreciated. And as usual, we always appreciate getting the views of local residents and um, those interested in the site. And we will take them all away with us and uh, give them some very serious thoughts. So thank you for your contributions and uh, have a safe journey home. Thank you.